Hello and welcome live from the Zero Project Conference 2024 at the Vienna International Center. My name is Anna. I'm the Director for Business Partnerships and Operations within the Zero Project team. But today I'm here in a slightly different role. I'm organizing and coordinating our Young Voices at ZeroCon 24. And I'm extremely happy to welcome my two guests. Uh, it's, um, uh, they will present themselves shortly in a minute. I just introduce their um, their um, project. So uh, it's Fear Nathan Production, and I would say it's an extremely unique uh, social enterprise. And uh, they are doing a lot of things from art to films to a lot of traveling. So I think I will, I will let them introduce themselves and um, tell us more about their project. So who would like to start? Perhaps Fear, you would like to start to introduce yourself? Yes. Good. My, my name is Fion. Your name is Fian, yes, and my name is Jonathan. And when you put our two names together, you get Fionathan. Fionathan <coughs> is a father and son team. A son and father team. <laughs> a son and father team planning to change the world. Yes. When did we? Um, well, maybe we should let the interviewer ask the questions. Of course. Yes, because <laughs> I've prepared them very, very thoroughly. Mm, so, you, uh, but Fiona is a very much a more experienced interviewer than I am. And but uh, I will try my best, Fiona. I promised you before. So. Um, to give, um, to give the audience at home, but also in the room, a little bit uh, of context, text and history and how, how your, um, your uh, social enterprise developed. Perhaps you could tell, uh, when, how, did, how did the project start? Did you, more, did you plan to have an impact on a whole group? Or was it more that you were focused to, to on, your, on your own development, on... on um, making an independent living and uh, independent choices uh, possible for you, Fionn. Would you like to start with that uh, sure. answer? Yeah. Um, I, I would say both. Mm -hmm. But but the real, re the, the real reason uh, of health mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't give an individual a, a, a direct payment a person, a person, a personal b b budget. So, so, so we had to to set up a to, to set up a, a company to act like a service provider, but but for one person. Mm -hmm. yes. So it was centered on the really the idea and the, to create a personal budget. Um, for for Fion and, and his own financial uh, resources and, yeah, and yeah. The all that mm -hmm. came about when Fion was looking <coughs> when Fion was looking for his own um, choices in life, yeah. and Fion said, "I don't want to go to a day service. Right. I have other ideas. I do. <coughs> yeah, and I'd like money for to direct my own um, my own program. Yeah, and." The department said, uh, no, we don't do that. Right. And then we said, well, we'll come back and ask you next week. Yeah. And if you say no again, we'll just come back the next week and we'll just keep asking till you come back, till you give yes. us the right answer. Yeah. And um, they did, as you said, they said, well, we won't give money to an individual, mm -hmm. but if you're prepared to set up a company, then you can be the first person in Ireland yes. with an intellectual disability to manage your own funding. Yes. And we said, well, why not use this uh, company that we're creating to do other things, helping yeah. you to have a great life? So yes. So you made a smart hiring choice for your support I person. I did a, 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 a very professional yet clever one, and I decided <laughs> to, to, to hire you, man. And then we realized, well, the company should all... I mean, Fionn's going to work just as hard as I am, so we quickly figured out through a government grant that pays companies who hire people with disability. Yeah. We said, can we avail of this? And they said, you're a company, you're hiring someone with disability, yes. yes. Even though you're not being hired to stock shelves right. or, or the typical jobs. Um, we said, we're going to create a person-centered job yeah. around your skills and interests. Yes. And so we got half of, the, half of your wages back yeah. through a grant. And then it was a matter of, well, what are we going to do? Yeah. Now, that, now that you have these, this opportunity, you have the support, yeah. support for what? 
And so I asked you, what, what do you want to be when you grow up? Right. Do you remember the first answer you gave? Yes. I, I said, I want to be... I want to be the next David. Uh, to be the next David Attenborough. Traveling the world and learning about nice nature, school. sharing yes, all of that. Yes, yes. And um, and I thought, well, teenagers often change their minds, so I better <laughs> ask him <laughs> again. And yes. the second time I asked you a week later, do you remember the answer you gave me then? Um, that I w wanted to be a. Musician. Yeah, playing your violin. Right? Yes, as yes. A, as a profession. Yes. A and I thought, oh, well, that's a good idea, but um, that's very different. Okay. I better ask a third time. Right. And you said, I want to be a member of One Direction. <laughs> and so <laughs> every time I asked, it was something different. I thought, we can explore all of this. Yes. And that's where we, when we started the Happiness Project. Yes. Which was a, and, and con continues to be, a series of interviews asking people, some of whom are in the careers that you're considering, yes. the same question. Yes. What is that question? What do you love about your life? And Fionn has, has interviewed over 700 people. It's a YouTube channel. And um, because some of those people are quite famous, it's, it's had a lot of uh, views online. And yeah. if I may add, there is another interview coming up here at the conference. So the founder of the Essel Foundation is extremely happy to also take part in this interview yeah. uh, wow. series. Uh, we are thrilled. Yes, we and, are. And just to finish up on this question, yes. of was it just for you or were you thinking of helping others? Thinking of helping others too, as well as myself, yeah. And the company has three aims in our, yes. in our articles and memoranda. Yes. And do you want to say what they are? Yes, the, the first one is to help me, Fionn Crombie Angus, to have a great life. D the second goal is to share our story far and and wide with other c c with other communities to help others to have their own version of a great life. Exactly. Yes, a and and then the third goal is to simply. Remove barriers and and obstacles, preventing people f from having great lives. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, I see that you have many talents. You know how to hire good good people for your social enterprise, but you're also a musician, so that that yes. seems very exciting. So um, you've told me in the in the preparation um, discussions that uh, two. 2023 actually uh, you saw a big leap forward in your in your production and your project and um, so you started to design a course together yes. and I will try to pronounce the topic I, okay. I, I did a lot of um, a lot of training for that but it's still difficult so you will help me out okay. I will start with a, it's called Kapka so tell us more about the creative approaches to practical community advocacy okay yes um so, so yes, it is a course um, called called Creative Approaches to Practical Community Advocacy, and I guess well, it's about Down syndrome leadership all around Ireland. Actually, mm -hmm. the Irish government has funded it, and we were quite thrilled and surprised to receive such a large grant, be, um, given the fact that we are. Our company is pretty much the two of us. Yeah. We do have a board of seven yes. people who help to guide us, and we have others who help. But yeah. really, it's just a, a two-man team. Yeah. And yet, when they, um, the government put out a call for um, projects to help people with Down syndrome in Ireland to be more engaged in their communities, yeah. they thought, this was written for us. Why don't we aim big and see what happens? Yeah. And they granted us the money. and. There's three parts to the Creative Approaches to Practical Community Advocacy yes. Project. Yes. What is the first phase that will be starting immediately after your internship in Brussels is finished at the end of March? Um, well, the first phase is online. Mm -hmm. is, is online work uh, with the curriculum. 20 to 30 people. Yeah. Uh, an eight-week curriculum that we have devised um, partly based on our own experiences, yeah. based on 
the program we created for Disability Federation of Ireland some yes. years back, yeah. and our more recent work helping to pass the, a piece of legislation in the United Kingdom yes. called the... Called the Down Kingdom Act. The second phase is all going to be in person, an artistic retreat where each participant having chosen what community project they'd like to do, each yeah. individually, will represent that project in what kind of an art form? Um, a, a, a human library. A human library, yeah. so people will engage in conversation at the big event, which is the third phase, yes. but also as a, what is it called? The box? Um, diorama. A, a diorama, a, a box within which is a world that the individual imagines their community could look like. And the third phase is when they do, it's like a pitching event yes. where they will propose the idea to potential mentors yes. and also uh, look, w we plan to give scholarships so that the project is done, but it continues into yeah. these community projects. This is extremely interesting, all, all your work. And perhaps we have still a little bit of time would you also like to, um, to talk a little bit about your future plans? I think you have set your goals for 2025 already to bring in partners across Europe to go to, to share this journey with you. Uh, what exactly would you like our partners to achieve with you together? Yes, so this is where things get really exciting for the both, for the both of us actually. It's called, it's called Abundance uh, and it's going to be a worker-owned cooperative, actually. A worker-owned cooperative called Abundance. Yeah. Um, because we feel like one of, the, one of the big things that's missing in the lives of people with Down syndrome and other intellectual disabilities is participation in the economic life. And we really feel that when you think about what your life's purpose is, if, if you all ask yourselves, it may well be connected to your career. And unfortunately, the vast majority of people with Down syndrome never have a career. And why is that? I don't know, but right. we think we can help to fix that. Yeah. So rather than just finding people jobs, which is a, is, is a good thing, yeah. we are saying, let's do what we've done, yes. bring a group of people together and have them create their own vision yep. of what work can be. Yes. And really, we're not, our goal is not to help people with Down syndrome have jobs, but to help people with Down syndrome gain wealth. Yeah. So we're looking much higher. And yes. we have partners in Helsinki and Madrid yeah. who are ready to start with us. So we yes. think this idea <coughs> of abundance, it's so simple, but it's quite profound. Yeah. And we think it could really grow around the world. Yes. So thanks a lot. I think you're at the best place to, to make new connections and to find new partners here at the Zero Project Conference 2024. And I think it's extremely interesting uh, what, what you're doing and uh, congratulations for everything that you have achieved together already and all the best for all your future plans. It was a pleasure to have you here today uh, as oh an interview thank partner. You. Here and you're very you're really a, a very experienced uh, interviewer and speaker already, so I think I was a lot more nervous than you were. Oh. So thanks <laughs> a lot for being here. Enjoy the conference. There are still one and a half days coming yes. up with a lot of interesting sessions. And you, Jonathan, thank you to you as well. And yeah, I hope you have a wonderful, a wonderful rest of the week. To all, to everyone who is uh, joining us from home, uh, thanks for thanks for joining this conversation. Keep um, keep tuned in for the other fireside chats. There's a lot of interesting conversation coming up the whole day, and we say thank you and goodbye from the Zero Project Conference 2024 at the Vienna International Center. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Uh -huh.
to us today about AT on Demand. But before you jump into that, Greg, just a very quick question. How did you get pulled into the AT field? How did you start off? Uh, I was tricked. It was uh, 52 years ago now. And uh, <clears throat> I was tricked into going out to a school to meet a young boy who uh, couldn't speak or write or type or do any kind of communication. And uh, <clears throat> it was actually the first time I had met somebody with a disability. It was very different in those days. Uh, and I was taken by the spirit of the young, young lad and um, gave up my job and got a bunch of other students together and we began working and it all grew from there. All right, well, so I'll invite everybody to check it out and to come find Greg afterwards. I won't go into his biography because otherwise we would eat up all the time we have. And what we really want to focus on is the AT on demand. So assistive technology on demand, what is it? What can we picture ourselves under this expression? <clears throat> Imagine that you are, um, you need assistive technologies, but you don't have your own computer. Um, you don't own one, is given to you, you can't afford one. You can't use the AT. Um, you need it to use the computer. You can't use the computer. You don't have one, and nobody will let you install your AT on their computer. You can go to the library, and you can't install it there. You go to school, and all your classmates have all these computers provided in the labs or whatever, and you can't use them. You go to the community center. Wherever it is that your other peers can go, you can't. Now, imagine the ability to be able to go to any of those computers that your peers can, any computer in the classroom, any computer in any classroom, in any school, and you sit down and your AT shows up on that computer and configured exactly the way you needed to have it configured. And then when you get up, it all disappears. And that's what AT on demand is. What kind of AT are we talking about here? Uh, any AT that runs on a computer, if it's uh, something that requires something physical, you know, like a, if you had to have a special camera or a special sensor, um, you could bring it along, plug it into the computer, and then AT on demand can bring all the software and drivers and everything down. Uh, we haven't figured out how to transport physical objects over the internet, or else we wouldn't have to worry about funding anymore. <coughs> the, uh, but. Um, the, the way it works is you sit down at a computer, um, and it can be a computer at school or at a clinician or a teacher. Someone sets up a computer the way it needs to be set up for you. And then um, you have what's called Morphic. It's a little free utility. And AT on demand is also free. Um, the AT can be either free or not, depending upon if you're using free AT. But the AT on demand and the Morphic are all free. So you can put it on all the computers. Um, you sit down to a computer that has that. You set it up the way you need to have it, or if somebody sets it up for you. And then you save it, and it goes to the cloud into a secure, encrypted place where only you use it. Um, and then anytime you sit down to a computer and sign in, it brings that down, sees what you need, gets the AT, puts it on there, sets it up for you, and then when you leave, it disappears. So how is it different from the accessibility features that are already built into the device? Well, <coughs> Morphic, the free program I talked to, first of all, if there's AT in the, in the computer, Morphic makes it a lot easier to find them and use them. So it already does that, and you don't have to have any AT on demand for that. But if what you need isn't, what's in the computer isn't good enough for what you need, you need more than what's in the computer, then the AT on demand comes in. So Morphic, a, makes all the stuff built in really easy to get and use. And then uh, it, if what you need isn't there, it brings it in and puts it on the machine for you. So what would be one of the examples that is an AT that is not included in the accessibility features <coughs> that um, Morphic would then provide for me? Well, there's, uh, I'll do two. Uh, one is a very common one, um, like a screen reader. Like somebody wants to have JAWS and they need the power of JAWS and so the built-in uh, software isn't, isn't good enough for them. Or that's the one they were trained on, someone they know. And saying, well, there's another screen reader on there is kind of like saying, um, well, if you're a, a Mac user, uh, or that, uh, oh, that's okay, you don't need your Mac. I have a Windows computer. It does the same thing. And you go, yeah, but I don't know how to use it. Or better yet, I have a Linux computer. You can do everything on Linux that you can do on your computer. And you go, I have no idea how to use Linux. So. Um, the person sits down, and of course, they can't use the computer until they get the AT, so it, it, it would bring it down for them. Uh, 
<clears throat> somebody with a cognitive language and learning disability who needs prompts, and that's a huge population. And there's a few features built in, but nothing like what the individuals need. And without it, they're not gonna be able to get an education, they're not gonna be able to compete. They can, quote, go to school for 12 years, but that's not what they need. They need to get the education as good as everybody else. They've gotta go compete. And so they need to have a computer that's set up, if you will, with the glasses. It would be like, not having their AT is like telling somebody with really low vision, they don't need their glasses. Um, just go through school, just, you know, if you're a little slower doing things, that's okay. Um, you have low vision, we expect that. You know, it's like, not good enough. You need to give them the tools so they can compete. Okay, so now I understood how it works. Yeah. And you mentioned Morphic is free, AT on demand is free. So why isn't it everywhere? Um, <clears throat> two things. One is that uh, no one has done it before. And uh, another one is that for it to work, it's got to be on all the computers. And um, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. It's really hard. Not very many people can pull off. They sell, you know, a little bit and sell a lot. Later, when they're really big, they sell a site license, and it'll be on all the computers in one place. But we're talking about it, trying to get it, you know, everywhere. The other thing is that uh, we, when you're trying to make it work with 50, 60, 100 different AT, um, that's a lot of work. And most companies do not want to get involved in trying to work with all those AT. It's, it's, it can be complicated and difficult. Um, we've been doing this for a lot of years, and, and so we know how to do it, and the, it's a, a benefit to them, so it, it uh, really is a, a two-way street to try and do it. But it's, it, it is a tremendous amount of work. So if I'm the director of a school or a teacher, and I hear about the solution, and I want to have that for my, for my children, for my students, what do I do? How do I get it? Um, a good thing to do is to uh, just contact us. Uh, you can just go to morphic.org um, and uh, M-O-R-P-H-I-C.org. And um, you can download it and try it. Um, you can get in contact with us. Uh, we can do a, a, a Zoom call and explain it and show it. Um, um, uh, one of the other reasons why no one does it is that the only way it can really be everywhere especially in rural and, and uh, tribal and, and um, even urban under-resourced schools, is if it's free, because you're talking about putting something on every computer everywhere, a lot of places they don't have resources. We're working with schools where there's 69 kids from kindergarten through high school, that's 12th grade, K to 12, and there's only 69 kids in all of the grades combined. Okay, so they don't have, you know, resource people and AT specialists and things like this. Um, so um, it's, it's free and so there's no good commercial except to sell user data. And this is entirely secure and private. So that's part of the, the deals, making sure that it, we uh, have something that uh, can be used everywhere safely. Okay, so I understand from the user perspective why I would use it. But then you said, okay, as a user, if I have specialized software like Chores or any other where I have a payable license, that you can pull that down into your Morphic profile. Um, why do the AT vendors agree to this? How does it work? Well, that's a good point. <clears throat> it's really nice that it helps people, but uh, what does it do for the schools? What does it do for the AT vendors? Um, uh, for schools, for the first part, for the IT department, because they're the ones who end up taking the front of having to get all the AT installed. Um, you now can have any AT on any computer in your school without you having to install it on any computer because it's all automatic. So it's actually less work than even having just a few AT. For the AT companies, it's the first time that, uh, that a lot of these companies can even reach some of these different communities. The school with 69 students, they're never gonna reach those places. So if we can get this, we can make it so that the AT that they're getting out is they can sell it to a customer and that customer now can use it anywhere. And they can sell it to customers who don't have a computer. Mm -hmm. Or they can sell it to the state who can give it to the customer who doesn't have a computer. And before that would not be a, custom, a student. And finally we're doing an evaluation tool where uh, somebody who works with kids would be able to have free copies of all the AT that they could try with the kids so that now instead of you know trying the two or three they have access to, they would have access to the full range of assistive technologies to try with the students. And that's another vendor benefit because a lot of vendors, the hardest part is getting people to even see uh, your, your software. 
so how much is it used right now? Uh, is it only in the US? Is it, is it worldwide? How, much, how many schools or institutions have already implemented Morphic? And what is your general experience with having it rolled out? Well, we've just started this last year. It's on 10,000 computers in 50 universities and schools and community colleges and uh, libraries. Um, uh, St. Louis Library uh, went from having no AT on any light computer on any of its uh, uh, branches to now having Morphic on all the computers and all of its branches and it's going into all of them in San Francisco and, and you know lots of other places. Um, the goal is to have it on every computer, every public or shared use computer, a computer like at school where different people use the same computer uh, in the world. Um, um, it was based off of European and uh, Commission funding and United States funding and Canadian funding uh, over the years. Um, we are, have started the rollout in the United States, but one of the reasons that I'm here uh, is to try to form partnerships with other places. Um, in one respect, it's free, so it's easy to move out, but in another respect, it's free, so um, it, nobody wants to be a distributor and get 20% of zero. Uh, so <laughs> the, um, uh, but uh, there's uh, lots and lots of, this particular place gathers people who are in it for the people and their programs um, that are already in the uh, field working with the uh, people. And so that's probably what we're here for is to, to connect and to um, help learn how this can best work in their communities and then to make it available to them. So what can the project, the Zero Project community do to help? Well, uh, two things. Well, one, um, the... Uh, Oh, if you know somebody who's got a lot of money and wants to, uh, you know, fund the base operation, that's great. Um, but the um, uh, mostly what we're looking for is is people who are interested and who um, are uh, recognize that that uh, and again everybody does the need for our young and old all ages to be able to access and use technology even if they have a disability and need assistive technologies. There are a lot of assistive technologies that are free, so if you have free technology and a free way to get it, then it's very affordable in, in all countries and places. Uh, we're also translating in all different countries, and so uh, we're looking for people in different countries who are interested in translating it into their language. Um, we can do an auto translation, but uh, unless we have somebody who speaks the native language, you know, uh, we need to do that. So these are all things that can help. Well, I think given the, the very good international presentation here, you will definitely find partners in many different languages, I'm sure. Uh, if I want to try it right away, can I actually do that? Yes. Um, well, you can do the, uh, the Morphic part uh, is uh, available. You just go to morphic.org and it's right there. Click download free. Uh, the AT on demand, the way that works is we typically put all the AT packages together and then we'll put it on the server at the school or at the library because you can't download stuff from the internet onto secure computers. Um, and so that has an additional step to it. But if you're interested in that, you're an organization, contact us and we can work with you to, to um, explore that for your location. Okay, wonderful. So you're looking for, well, funding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then we're looking for people just testing and using it and rolling it out. We're looking for partners in different languages. Anything else as call to action for the, for the Zero Project community? Yeah, it's uh, languages and cultures. Um, the, um, the, and understanding the, the, the technologies. And, and again, right now it works on Mac and PC, and so we're also looking at how to address the same kinds of problems in, in Android and other kinds of, of places where uh, they don't use uh, Macs and PCs. Um, so we're actually trying to solve the problem, not sell a product. Well, yeah, we're selling it for free, so <laughs> no, the, the goal is to, to, to solve the problem. Okay. Well then, Greg, wonderful. Thank you for this teaser, I would say, because Greg has a wonderful session tomorrow where he will go into more detail. He will have also another, um, another chance on really presenting how it works. I all invite you to come tomorrow. It's 
I don't have the time it's in just, mind, but it's, it's tomorrow. It's the session just before the closing ah, session. Ah, just before the closing. So Friday afternoon, come and listen to, uh, to Greg and ask all the difficult questions in the session. Thank you very much. A session called Free Web Resources or something like that. AG Software, I think, something like that. Uh, Anyways, it's before the closing session and you can ask all the difficult questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Welcome to this fireside chat. Uh, it's a very special one uh, with an online guest of ours. It's not only an online guest, it's also one of this year's Zero Project AWDs. Uh, welcome Mr. Mani Raza Visa Day, representing Ravan Technologies and the award uh, is for uh, a uh, spectacular project from our point of view, otherwise you wouldn't have received the reward uh, for making uh, Tehran more accessible. Uh, Mr. Raza Wizade, let's start with uh, you introducing your, your great model, maybe in a, in a few sentences, what this is about, and then we'll go into more details. Hello, thank you. I'm glad to be here today. Uh, my name is Mani. Uh, I'm an uh, urban planner and uh, accessibility consultant. Thank you for inviting me and providing this opportunity for our team. Uh, it is, was a great honor for our project to be selected in the Zero Project this year. Yeah, we were really glad and uh, um, it was, uh, uh, you know, we have a quite an extensive selection process uh, and uh, you made it until the very end. So out of 523 nominations, you made it among the, the top list of ever these and the jurors were obviously really impressed by the by the size but also of the um, of the way the project is is uh, planned and implemented so uh, uh Mani, i would suggest give us more details about how wh what is actually done uh, and uh, how it is yeah. done and then we try to explain our audience more uh, the details of it yes of course uh, our project uh, the accessibility comprehensive plan for urban spaces in tehran uh, was started in 2019. Uh, we are focusing on identifying, categorizing, and prioritizing accessible routes. Uh, and uh, we are assessing uh, sidewalks, uh, accessibility, and developing an action plan to enhance sidewalks and public spaces. Uh, we use uh, multiple uh, criteria and technologies uh, because uh, we are struggling uh, some challenge in our city, for example, economic challenge and uh, social challenge and uh, very various uh, organization that implement uh, that implement the accessibility in uh, Tehran as a developing uh, city. Uh, so, uh, we divided the main routes, main roads in, uh, into three uh, priorities and each section is split into three phases. And uh, we decided to uh, implement in three phases in 10 years uh, plan. Uh, this is the first platform in Iran. We dedicated the accessible routes uh, with uh, an online surveying uh, application. And uh, we developed this project uh, to an uh, innovative step in Iran. And um, all evaluation data stored on a cloud server and uh, was uh, analyzed um, perfectly and uh, incorporated into the uh, GIS map. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, we can, um, the, uh, and, and, and uh, then our project output is available through an online map provided by uh, Tehran municipality that people can explore it to see the accessible routes uh, we identifying. Mm -hmm. um, Mani, the, um, I think the most uh, spectacular part of your work is the technology and the method you developed how to map and how to find out uh, the conditions of the sidewalks and where there are issues. So maybe give us a little more background on how you map this out, which technologies you used uh, and how uh, this is presented to the decision makers and also to the users. So focus on the, on the technology you're using and try to explain what you, how you, what you're, what you're uh, implemented. Yes, uh, we introduced a web-based application uh, to uh, data collection and analysis. Uh, it uses a method called MCDM, 
multi-criteria decision analysis to determine determine the best routes and uh, to vi visualize this data we uh, put uh, the data on a gis based platform that displays and analyzes information on maps uh, on time mm -hmm. uh, another aspect of this project is uh, adopting a model to uh, faces uh, complex issues and conflicts uh, involving various uh, organizations and individuals to enhancing the accessibility in Tehran city. Uh, this model uh, can um, uh, be updated with new data and expanded to cover other cities and countries, uh, for example, with similar economic and social condition. Mm -hmm. uh, the map uh, allows person uh, with uh, disability or elderly people to view pedestrian routes. Uh, they can plan uh, their um, travel more confident confidently. And uh, the, the result data can help to um, government and um, uh, municipality in Tehran uh, to plan and implementation, uh, the next steps uh, and the next phases uh, to improve accessibility in Tehran. Mm. Uh, Mani, one more question uh, towards uh, the data that you're having. What kind of data this actually is? Is it data that is related, let's say, to the condition of the sideways so that you're scanning and analyzing in which condition this is and if it's accessible or not, uh, where there are, are obstacles. Uh, do you also use data and analyze the users, what they are doing, the behavior of the users, if they experience uh, obstacles or not? Is it one or the other or is it both? Is it the condition, uh, is it the behavior or is it both? I think it's both because uh, uh, we use uh, the current situation of obstacles and uh, we plan uh, the uh, the action plan, uh, for example, to um, planning uh, in next years for implementation of accessibility. Uh, we use uh, pictures, uh, image, and uh, checklists for uh, the current uh, situation of uh, roads and sidewalks and uh, also uh, we use uh, data layers for example locations um, public station uh, for transportation uh, schools hospitals and other uh, public spaces that I that is important uh, to users mm -hmm. uh, so uh, all of these data uh, can um, analyze us in a uh, GIS model and uh, the results is based on these layers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you one more question uh, with regards to the, uh, to the connectivity of what you're doing. Uh, what can other uh, city planners, other municipalities, urban development planners learn from your model and um, how much can they directly connect with you or other organizations that work with you? Uh, it is honor uh, honor to us to uh, can uh, communicate communicate with uh, other cities and municipality. Uh, this model, as I mentioned before, uh, because uh, the, the 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 project uses uh, MCDM multi criteria decision maker decision analyzers uh, can uh, can use uh, by. Uh, every city uh, that uh, faces with challenges like us in a developing country for example uh, we have a lack of uh, money and investment uh, in uh, um, accessibility uh, and we have uh, struggling with uh, big uh, mistakes for uh, moderation and uh, implementation uh, uh, because uh, we have a lot of uh, economical uh, problems. And uh, um, cities like us uh, can use this model and prioritizing uh, 
uh, the broad uh, based on uh, public uh, usage, walkability uh, usage, and uh, uh, based on traffic, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, they can, uh, with this uh, prioritizing model, uh, they can uh, decide to what uh, road, for example, is important uh, to be accessible more this year and what is uh, important to other year. Yeah. Um, Rani, one more question. Um, you mentioned uh, this is a 10 years plan uh, and uh, you're in the middle yeah. somehow of this 10 years plan. So where are you in the implementation? What has been achieved and what comes next? Yes. Uh, we um, assessing uh, all of uh, sidewalks uh, and uh, a street with more than 12 meters in Tehran. And based on that, uh, we are uh, starting to uh, implement uh, implementation uh, accessibility. Uh, now uh, we approximate, uh, we, uh, we are, we are um, about uh, 200 kilometers uh, if you count uh, both sides of uh, road, uh, th that is uh, 400 kilometer sidewalks uh, that may, that uh, have been made accessible. And uh, we, uh, we uh, approximately 10% of uh, implementation of the whole program. Uh, this is a uh, continuous uh, plan and uh, we started to implementation uh, we, uh, in uh, Tehran municipality from uh, 2021 uh, 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 and in two years uh, I think uh, this is a good progress mm -hmm. yeah sounds 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 excellent we're coming to the to the closing of this fireside is there anything uh, uh, money you want to mention that we have not touched upon and you which you want to say uh, in your closing statement? Uh, yes, uh, I, ha I, I uh, um, my uh, email and uh, our website is uh, open to uh, you and uh, we, uh, we are happy to uh, collaborating and uh, connect with other uh, uh, presenta presenting in this conference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. We're also proud and honored to have you with you, hopefully also in person at, at some time. Thank you also for sharing all of this and for your willingness to connect with the Global Zero Budget community. Thank you for this time and uh, it was, I think, a, a good time and uh, a lot of good insights. So with this, I'm closing this fireside chat. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Thank you.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, very warm welcome to the fireside chat uh, where we will discuss the issue of expanding your business to Austria. Uh, just a short introduction. My name is Jan. I'm working for the Vienna Business Agency and my job for the last 12 years have been helping international businesses and uh, experts and their families to settle in Vienna. Um, today we will be hearing from uh, real people and their real businesses, uh, what it's like uh, bringing their business to Austria. And I will start with a little introduction round, and I will start with Brian uh, from Hope Tech. Maybe just introduce yourself, what is your company doing, and actually what have you brought to Austria? All right. uh, thank you very much, uh, Jan. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone, uh, who's here in person and everyone online. Uh, my name is Brian Mwenda from Hope Tech, uh, originally from Kenya. Uh, we build mobility assistive devices for blind and visually impaired people. And uh, we have a wearable device that works together with the white cane to help blind and visually impaired people to walk and navigate unaided. And this is what we've brought to Austria. And um, I think since uh, I came here for the Zero, Zero Project conference uh, two years ago, uh, I fell in love with the city one of the most accessible cities that I've been to. And this is what really motivated me to come and set up in Austria because our product, uh, just as a soft landing spot uh, for our product really, uh, a place where the product can uh, fit into the normal society uh, easily. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And maybe just passing on the microphone to Kelvin from MeCare. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kelvin. Uh, the company is called MyCare. We are based in London in the UK and around a year ago we opened an office uh, in, uh, in Vienna, in Austria. So MyCare has a special mission and that is to make healthcare accessible and affordable. Our area of focus is very much with uh, the older adults. We built a generative AI model. Her name is Monica. And Monica is a personal coach to an older adult, helping them to maintain their independence uh, within uh, the home. And she does this through conversations, and uh, she supports them to take their medication, to hydrate and exercise. But also from time to time when they are feeling a bit lonely, she becomes like a companion to entertain them, and uh, she can also connect them with uh, somebody else who might also be alone so they can have a uh, conversation between them. And it's a pleasure to be here uh, today to meet all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Kelvin. And passing on to Nia from Planet Abled. So what are you actually doing and what brought you to Austria? So well, um, it all started actually six years ago when I first came to the Zero Project to get the Zero Practice Award. And um, what we do is, uh, I represent Planet Able. We make tourism accessible and inclusive uh, for persons with all types of disabilities. Our core mission to, is to mainstream accessible uh, tourism into um, tourism practices, frameworks, and uh, design and policy by working uh, with uh, uh, businesses who are into the hospitality and tourism industry and working closely with the travelers by providing them services and also uh, integrating their needs into the tourism ecosystems and also to make um, accessibility as part of the sustainable tourism conversation globally and mapping it to the SDGs. Uh, we brought Planetable to India. We are an eight-year-old company and uh, we last year opened a, uh, office in uh, Austria as part of our first global expansion. Oh, fantastic. So all three of you, you have opened a business here in Vienna and you have operations here. Fantastic. Um, see, my job as working for the Vienna Business Agency, of course, is promoting Vienna as a business location. So you might call me a bit biased when it comes to convincing companies of setting something up here. Uh, but we're here to learn from real businesses what the journey, what the journey actually was like to set something up here, and um, you know what happened to you, obstacles, maybe who helped you on the way. So we want to hear the real story. 
And maybe starting again with you, Brian. Oh, wow. Um, oh, yes, and of course, in all honesty. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, main reason I came to Austria is uh, because of the wine. So, I s there's really good wine in Austria. <laughs> but besides that, um, really, uh, I think there's you get a lot of support to set up the business in Austria, from especially from the Vienna Business Agency, from the Austrian Business Agency. Thanks. I have to mention them as well. And yeah. also contacts to go into market, which was the main reason we came to Austria. We got in touch with uh, the Austrian Association for Blind and Visually Impaired People. Maybe you can help me to say the German name. <laughs> 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 and uh, they gave us uh, the Hilfsgemeinschaft. Yes, uh, and they gave us access to users, and we are at a stage where we are testing our product to make sure we have the right uh, product for the, pro the for the problem that we're trying to solve. So that was a really big thing for us to test our product in a new market with new cultures, and we have the actual support to go uh, to the actual users to test this. So I think that uh, was it for us, and that's why we set up in Austria. In terms of the challenges, I'd say. One of the biggest challenges coming to Austria is uh, the bureaucracy that you experience with public institutions. I but hear some laughter from the audience. <laughs> maybe a few people share the same. <laughs> uh, but um, if you're patient enough, and then everything will work out. So I, I'd say if you're planning to come and set up, just be prepared for a lot of paperwork and uh, carry uh, all, the patient that's all the patients that you have. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Maybe Kelvin, um, what was your journey like? Yeah, I just follow the same structure. Why we are here, I would say there's a woman behind it. And I'm talking about my wife here, by the way, uh, just in case she hears it afterwards. But my wife is half Austrian, half Slovak. And uh, we, we were looking for a base in, uh, in Europe, especially after the UK came out of uh, EU. And then uh, we look on, on a map and we say, what's the center where we can reach entire Europe? And there was there, Austria, right there. And we thought, that's a good start. And also, if we move to Austria, we get the mother-in-law to look after the children as well. So it's very convenient for, for us. But then uh, there's more to that. We, we, we were keen to enter the DAC region. And um, so there's Switzerland, there's Germany, and then there is uh, Austria. And uh, we look at Austria, the ecosystem, and it's small enough for you to be able to start something and uh, not worry about the size and scale or how quick you need uh, to grow. But uh, in that process, we also learn uh, a lot. I mean, Brian already talked about the uh, bureaucracy, so I'm not going to cover this, but I've summarized before we, uh, I came to this session into kind of six points that everybody who is uh, thinking of opening a business here in Austria, uh, these are the homework that they need uh, to do. So number one is be very clear of the reason why you're coming to Austria and make sure it aligns with your company mission. Go back to your business canvas or your strategy document and make sure there is alignment because it's not going to be an easy ride. If you're doing it as a side project, you'll stumble and you'll stop and you'll go back to square one. So very important. Once you've done this, you do your own market due diligence. This is something you have to do, not pay somebody to do it. You have to do yourself and make sure you are happy with the result. Once you've done this, then get somebody local to whether it's Vienna, whether it's anywhere else in Austria, to help you with your due diligence because this is where you start to understand a bit more how it aligns with your progression, your, your financials within your company. Number three, put into context of your wider mission and the priorities. Because as a founder, when you start to do a soft lending in a new country, it takes a lot of your time and you need to make sure that uh, you have that time and it's part of uh, that priority. And, uh, and remember, it takes the founder attention away from other priority tasks. Don't think you can run the business in the UK, in the US, and also start one in Austria all at the same time. It doesn't work. You think you can. I thought I could, but it doesn't work. And then number four, go there. Understand. Leave the culture. Make sure you go to events. You go to pitch uh, your business. Get to know the agencies. And for us... When uh, we started, we, uh, 
we spoke to Abba uh, to start with and explained to us how easy, I mean, Jan said, that's his job, how easy it is. But then uh, you also need to uh, witness it and, uh, and also uh, uh, get to know personally what uh, uh, it's like uh, for you. So these are, for me, the, the top tips I'd like to offer. I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to pass my mic. Thank you, Kelman. I need this list afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nia. So, well, um, so we have been looking, like pre-COVID in 2019, I've been looking at Europe and uh, travel around Europe to explore which country suits uh, our business model the best and where uh, we have the biggest opportunity uh, to enter into Europe. Thanks to COVID, it got delayed and it took uh, by a few years. <laughs> Uh, but I think uh, Vienna we chose because, one, it is a tourism destination of Europe, like it's central, so it perfectly aligns with uh, us from a tourism perspective, and it gives us access to a northeast Europe, like northwest Europe, and eastern Europe as well, because it's central. Plus the connectivity, I mean, for us being into travel and tourism, uh, it involves a lot of uh, travel and also a lot of uh, from a business perspective, not just uh, the team travel, but also uh, like uh, in terms of connectivity, partners and stuff. So that way is Vienna uh, plays a very great uh, geographical role from tourism perspective. Uh, and also, of course, uh, I, ha I love the city. I've been coming here for six years uh, since I came uh, first. So yeah, I mean, it's just the vibe of the city and uh, the tourism perspective that helped choose Vienna. And also a lot of people kind of talked me into it, the friends I have here. Um, uh, like uh, uh, friends from the Vienna Business Agency, of course, and also I have fr friends uh, from the disability community and um, uh, the tourism community who said, like, it, it's all about discussion, like, you know, w by evaluating all the aspects which are specific to our business, that why it makes perfect sense to choose Vienna. In terms of challenges and some tips, I think um, the, the biggest challenge is the language, which I find, like, even more than uh, bureaucracy, which my friend said, because uh, uh, all the official work and communication is in... Uh, uh, German, and I don't speak German even till now, so I'm learning, but then it will take a bit of time. So language is the bigger barrier, and uh, lack of resources to study and access in English is one thing that you need to be aware of, even if, or, or you have someone in your team who knows German. So like, I have a lot of people who help me out, like um, Access Austria helped us out, like, I don't think I would have nav been able to navigate uh, it without uh, help of friends. So uh, always think like what l support you have. Of course, we in a business agency uh, um, and the people provide great support and guidance, but you need people around too outside of that, like who are your friends who can give you the local reality check uh, of uh, how it is to be done. And it's good that uh, if you have, if you are looking at Vienna, like uh, what my friend here mentioned, like do what's best for you. Like the choice has to be very specific for your type of business and why this destination works for you, uh, considering all the aspects. Uh, and it's good to have either uh, a local organization as a partner or, you know, who can help you out um, uh, uh, get over the challenges that you will face. The challenges are many, but then once you're over it, then it's great. And from a social impact perspective, I think uh, uh, Vienna has offers great support. Thank you very much, Nia. So I heard a lot of pros and cons, and we have just one minute left. And of course, the final question I would ask you is, would you do it again, yes or no? <laughs> Brian. <laughs> oh. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, I pressured you into this answer now. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, yeah, so I think, I think the, the community in Vienna is really amazing. The mm -hmm. people are amazing. The, the organizations are well-meaning. Mm -hmm. Despite the bureaucracy, I think everyone is really well-meaning. 
Oh, it's thanks. just maybe remnants of an old system. <laughs> so uh, yes, I'll do it again, probably differently. So I'd mm -hmm. encourage anyone who is planning to move to Vienna to just plan it out and expect delays. So I think as a startup, you always plan to do everything tomorrow. So, uh, but just allow enough time for, for the paperwork, for the bureaucracy. Uh, but yes, I will do it again and I would encourage anyone to come <laughs> to Vienna. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> Kellen, be honest. Yeah, I, I will echo this. So uh, I plan to do everything in one year, but if you're planning one year, times two, because uh, I allow for two years. So for me, it's the same. I will uh, do it, definitely do it again. And knowing what I know right now, I would do it uh, very differently. And uh, I will seek out more help as opposed to rely on myself to navigate, because that is what will accelerate the, the process for you as well. Thank you, Kelvin. Uh, yes, I'll do that again, but I'll learn German first. <laughs> <laughs> I can help you with that, but it's Austrian German, so yeah, mm, no, no, I'll here. do that again. I love the people here. I love the city, and uh, I have a lot of friends here. So uh, I mean, for me, that matters. That you have because being an entrepreneur, you have a l many days where you you are navigating a lot of things alone, and then you need people who are in the system and outside the system, like like more entrepreneur friends as well, who uh, are living a similar life to you, and also friends outside of the entrepreneurial ecosystem who have nothing to do with it, and just you can just hang out. So yeah, I'll do that again. Fantastic, thank you very much for your honesty and uh, for doing it again, maybe in, in, in the future. Um, well then, thank you very much for your time and for being part uh, of this fireside chat. And thank you very much to the audience as well, wherever you are. Thank you.
Hello everyone, this is Margaret Grobelna from Zero Project and we're here at the Zero Project Conference 2024 at another fireside chat session. And this time I'm very happy to introduce my colleague who is a fellow, a special fellow, I would say, Scanning Solution Fellow Raul from the Foundation Saraki. Can you introduce yourself and your foundation? Yes. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Saraki Foundation starts like 30 years ago in Paraguay, South America, as a theater group of persons with intellectual disabilities to protest against, against their parents because they, di they didn't have the same rights than their sisters and brothers without disabilities. So Saraki always like the the, the, to work through the rights of persons with disabilities. And right now we are here with a project that I will explain you soon. Thank you so much. But you are teasing me. What project are you selecting to present here? Tell me more about it. What is it? Okay. Uh, we are here because of the in dashboard, which is a platform for any international human rights treaty body to receive and collect information from governments and from civil society in a disaggregated manner. Because now, all the human rights treaties are receiving all the reports in 200, 300, 400 pages documents in Word or PDF. So that's make the information, the information not really available. So what we made was a software and we already are using it with the Convention on Disabilities of the Organization of American States. They are already using since the last year as the only way to receive information from governments. And they are really receiving a lot of value from it. So now with everything we learned from them last year, we want to take to other human rights conventions because it's, it makes a huge difference, huge difference to have the information available uh, that anyone, anyone from civil society, from the press, from government can access that little piece of information that you need with a little clicks and a few, a few clicks and, and, and a, using filters because what happened now is that the information is not really available. So civil society cannot influence in, uh, with, with evidence. So, and if you, don't have influ if you don't have evidence, you cannot influence anything. And even the treaty bodies, they cannot do very good recommendations to the governments because they don't really access the information. Yeah. If you could explain that a little bit to me and the other viewers. When you are saying that the information is not available, is it like not in the open source or is it data that only the governments have or how does that work? I will put you an example of one of the uh, organization of American state uh, treaty, which is the ec ec economic and social rights. They have 714 indicators, se over 700 indicators. There are over 25 countries reporting. And there are only seven experts that they need to analyze how the over 25 plus countries are performing in 700 plus indicators. And the countries report the information in a PDF document. So how can anyone will be able to analyze 700 indicators in a PDF document? So that's made on purpose, so the information is not available. So our software, what our software does is we create with the treaty body the questions and the uh, data, the, the, the uh, the indicators and the metadata information. And then the, the treaty body sends to each government a password to act, have access to the platform. So they start 
uh, uploading the information piece by piece. So the information, once that the government upload the whole thing, is all available in real time for, for everybody. Because right now, uh, much in the most of the cases, the information, that those PDF reports are not available for civil society until two to three years after the report. So now, it's not only that you can access in real time, but also ex exactly what the piece of information that anyone needs using filters. That's, that's the huge difference. And I will tell you one huge value add that this software is doing in the Amer Organization of American States for the quality of the public policies that are going to be happening in the next years. Before this software, and because they have PDF reports, they, they will send one country report to three experts, the PDF, and they will say, please analyze this country report and make your recommendations. So every country will receive recommendations only from three experts because they didn't have other way to do it because the information was in PDF reports. Now, because of the information is all disaggregated in a database, they are, going, they are asking their 50 experts to analyze all the information in every country related to the expertise of each expert. So the experts, they don't need to go over information that is not related to their expertise issue, but they will be able to go over more countries because they won't need to read a 300 pages report. They will only read a few indicators related to their expertise and they will be able to make great recommendations because they are going to be recommending in their expertise issue. And also, the, every government is going to be receiving recommendations from 50 experts and not for three. So that will bring that will bring us after this year much more quality and quantitative recommendations and because the countries tend to follow up the recommendations that will mean better public policies for people with disabilities so what you are really presenting here is an efficient tool for evidence based advocacy is that right yes is is that's right and also not only for advocacy, but even for the committees, they will be much easier for them to analyze and to propose uh, and to even to fo for following up recommendations from the before periods. And so, and where are we going now? Now we want to go, we are searching for partners because we want to go now. We are often offering this software for free to, for any treaty body from other rights because we want to go for the intersectional information. We want to see how are treating the other conventions to the persons with disabilities because it's, everything is intersectional. I mean, a person with disability in any country is receiving pressure in an intersectional way. They don't receive like, pre today I, I'm going to receive a problem from, for in, in my woman case. Or, I mean, the problems are intersectional, so the solutions must to be intersectional. So, but right now, without this information disaggregated, it's impossible to think in an intersectional uh, study of every report. Uh, that's why we want to go there. We want to have an interconnected database with all the reports so the committees from each, uh, or from each treaty can work together in doing intersectional recommendations to the government. Okay, but clear that up with me. I think that there are already institutions or NGOs who are doing such reports with the limited data that they have. So what difference to those uh, kind of institutions your tool makes? Will it be free or open source? H how can they use it? 
the, the the software is open source and free. We want everyone to use it because we know that if the information is available and is the information is interconnected in a in in a, in a database, it will it will be transparent and the transparency will bring better things to everybody because when I when I say intersectionality that's good for people with disabilities but that's good for all the groups because once that the disability uh, uh, treaty body finds what's going on with the disability how, how the other conventions are treating the disability issue if they are really aborting like a transversal issue that's reciprocal every one of the other rights are going to also be able to collect or to analyze information from their rights in the other convention. So this is a win-win-win situation that we are offering. And when, when you have transparency of information, everything starts to move because the countries, they, they don't want to be in, 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 like in the spotlight knowing that they are doing bad things. Uh, but now, with this, with the way things are working, they are, they are, no one really seen much of what's going on or, or of what, what they are doing or what they are not doing because all the information they are reporting, but they are reporting in a way that the information is not really accessible. So it's not accessible. Sometimes it's out of date. Uh, if you, can think about rev can in a way reaching to those institutions, to those partners. What is your final word to them to make them feel that they want to partner with you, want to use the platform? How would you approach them? It's a free platform. It really adds value. Whoever wants to know more about it, just contact me and I, I will make you talk to the people from the OAS and they will tell you how this is adding value. And let's work together because we, we, all of us want a better world and this platform is a very cost effective, a very cost effective way to make change happen. Thank you so much, Raul. Just a shout out to everyone, because Raul is not only here at the fireside, but he will also be at the session that will introduce all of the Scaling Solutions fellows, and he will be also making a presentation with his colleague about this exact tool. Am I right? Yes, yes, we are very happy. Uh, this is the fourth time that Saraki is collecting a Zero Project uh, uh, award because w everything we do, we do it with a lot of passion. And so I think that's, uh, that's the way to do things, with a lot of passion, because uh, you want to move things, you want to make changes, and the, the change won't happen by their own. You, you need to be part, and we really want to partner with other people that can be interested in transparency of information, in accessible information, because together we can work in a more syn synergic way. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Only together we can really build a world without barriers. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fireside session at the Zero Project Conference 2024. I'm joined here by two wonderful people that I cannot wait to learn more about, Matthias and Yasmin. One of you is from Enable Me, and one of you is from a Morocco foundation called Al Nor Marrakesh. Please, if my pronunciation is really wrong, please correct me. So, Matthias, can you introduce yourself? And Jasmine, can you introduce yourself a little bit more? Yeah, I'm working for the Enable Me Foundation as an incubation manager. So I'm responsible for guiding the partner organizations to set up the online platforms, which I will talk about later more. Uh, so I'm um, Yasmin Shakir from Morocco. Uh, I represent Anor Association for uh, uh, for women with physical disabilities. Thank you. And also we have a uh, an uh, social enterprise. Okay. So tell me, what is Enable Me, and why did you choose Morocco for the platform? So Enable Me is. Uh, empowering people with disabilities through an online platform with content on all, ty on all different thematic areas related to disability and an online community for peer support. Um, so we, are, we can make an impact in countries where people have access to internet and where there's a high need. So the both sides, and that's what we saw in Morocco. There are many people with smartphones and access to, in, to uh, internet. At the same time, we saw that people with disabilities still have a, a high need. There are many gaps. Um, so we were there kind of at the right spot. And with that, we have a financing partner that was able to support Enable Me, and they had a particular interest in Morocco. So one plus one was two. So if I'm understanding this, you are uh, using a rather centered human approach with, with the platform. Is that correct? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so when we decided for Morocco, we did not start with the implementation right away, but we took a phase for uh, a human-centered design. We started with a needs assessment uh, through interviews and surveys to really understand the local situation, the needs of persons with disabilities, their, their environment, uh, the, caps, the gaps that they are facing. Then we took an, a second step. We invited persons, representatives from 12 organizations working for people with disabilities from different, representing different regions from Morocco and different types of disabilities, and they validated the needs assessment. And then, together with them, we created personas and user journeys. Uh, and then the next step was the, the, the initial design of the platform. So there was a full workshop of, of uh, co-creation with local partner organizations because we wanted the, the, the local ownership and the platform to be rooted in the Moroccan society. Okay, so can you tell me a little bit more about the needs you identified and what is the final aim of the platform? Yeah. So the, the, there's a high need for relevant and reliable information, especially on topics like uh, accessibility, independent living, also government regulations, government services, and how to access it. So information in an easy to read, easy to understand format. Also information about access to education, access to training, uh, access to the labor market. And so that's the part of the content. And we saw that um, there were the partners validated individuals with a disability could highly benefit from such a peer support platform where, where people can meet each other, uh, help each other, inspire each other. So that's the aim of the platform. We are bringing different stakeholders together, so not only individuals with disabilities, 
but also uh, their caregivers, uh, the family members, experts, uh, representatives of advocacy organiza organizations, also uh, govern government officials, uh, man managers of companies, everyone who's interested in, uh, in disability inclusion. We bring together uh, on the platform for uh, sharing of knowledge, uh, inspiration, sharing of, um, of stories and, and collaborating to promote uh, inclusion in society. Okay, and now I'm wondering, how does the Moroccan partner come into this? How do you help with this platform? Okay, so to answer these this questions, I would say that we have uh, formed an alliance of 24 partner organizations uh, of from Morocco with uh, different expertise. So together we are covering all types of disabilities and origins in Morocco. So uh, this alliance is taking care of the quality of the content and we even have scientific community of for uh, quality insurance. Okay, so we are also taking the responsibility uh, for encasing with users, empowering them with the, in the platform uh, by for doing the public uh, relationships. And we also um, have steering committee for the governance of the platform. Uh, we can say that uh, through this alliance, uh, we have collaboration with Enable Me, but uh, through this alliance, um, uh, we ensure that is rooted in the Moroccan society, uh, that uh, and we have a long per perspective of sustainability, and uh, we already developing uh, relationships with Ministry of Solidarity and uh, uh, and other government entities, which is uh, important for us. Yes, that sounds really fantastic. It seems like you have so many people that are collaborating on that. And I think that in the beginning you mentioned a donor or a sponsor that is also helping you develop this platform. Can you tell me more about them or about the collaboration? Yeah, so what was very important that this donor understands the need of um, the local ownership and the human-centered design. So they did not ask us to submit a proposal with um, impact indicators in the beginning, but they were willing to support the process of the design. And now after this phase, uh, we are better able to understand the needs and also uh, understand what potential impact we can make. And one of the unexpected results was that we we're thinking about selecting one of the local organizations as, as a lead partner, but the unexpected result was that we had 12 organizations in the room and they w raised uh, their interest in developing this platform together. So they gave their commitment and now, so we formed the alliance and that grew to uh, from tw 12 to 24 organizations. So we have now a, s a strong um, partner alliance in Morocco uh, and through them we are able to strengthen the disability movement with, with the online Enable Me Morocco platform. That really sounds amazing. Do you know how many users we have on that platform roughly? Zero, because we are going to launch in March. Ah. That will be a soft launch. Then we will onboard the, the super users, the first users from those 24 partners. And then we grow. And then in September, we will have a public launch, hopefully also with uh, government uh, involvement, but at least with, with a lot of uh, PR. Of course. And are you still looking for other collaborators, for partners? Do you want to make a shout out to them? Yes, very much. <laughs> so what I mentioned, uh, corporations, uh, because we, we are providing services to help um, corporations to make their products and services accessible for people with disabilities. Um, also other organizations working in the field of disability or in the field of lobby, uh, lobby and advocacy, um, rights for marginalized groups in a broader perspective. So yes, uh, welcome to, to join us. 
Uh, Yasmin, is there anything else that you would like to tell other organizations in Morocco why this initiative is worth joining? Uh, so I would say that um, uh, first of all, this is an interesting project that we we participate in because in Morocco, as uh, this uh, as he said, that we have uh, many people using uh, phones and technologies, but they, we didn't have in Morocco uh, a platform to help these people. Uh, for example, to looking for uh, for spaces accessible or so. I think this platform is very useful and. It's going to help people uh, in Morocco and also their mothers and, uh, uh, for example, for their children with, with disabilities. So I would like to invite other organizations to participate and to join us and to... Uh, uh, so it's very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> I think that we can all here share the sentiment that really partnerships, networking, finding the right people at the right place is the most important for any project to really work. I mean, Zero Project has to be one of the great examples on how partnerships and collaborations can work on the global scale. And probably this is my last question, but what is ahead of you when you start, when you launch the platform? What are you expecting? First, we will onboard the, the, the users and activate them uh, so that they not only uh, uh, come to the platform, read articles and then go, but actually contribute. So uh, either raising questions and, uh, or uh, answering questions of other users. And then we also have plans for um, using artificial intelligence for more personalized content and a m more personalized user experience. Uh, so that will <laughs> also be an uh, important aspect of the work. So you are not only collaborating with donors, with partner organizations, you want to also reach out to the users and Absolutely. take their experience and just yeah. go forward. I think that's an excellent test that you are embarking on. And I wish both of you a lot of luck. Please, everyone, tune in in March and in September, please correct me, in September to join the Enable Me Morocco platform. And hopefully, we will all see each other there. Do you have any final words that you want to part with the participants right now? Uh, you can already have a preview on uh, enable me Ukraine to get, get an example or the Swiss or uh, German websites or the Kenyan uh, website. So there you can get a preview of what we are building in Morocco. That's fantastic. I will make sure that we find a way to redistribute all of those links so everyone can have the taste of the platform that is coming to Morocco. Thank you both so much, and thank you to all who was listening and looking at us. Yeah, thank you for having us.
All right. Um, welcome, everybody, um, and thank you again to the Zero Project for hosting this, uh, this incredible fireside chat. Uh, my name is Stéphane Leblois. I am the Chief Community and Programs Officer for the Valuable 500. Um, as an audio description, I'm a white male with uh, graying hair and a silly mustache wearing a gray vest. Um, and I'm joined today by the incomparable uh, Donna Bungard uh, from, um, uh, from Indeed, who will be, uh, I guess, introducing herself. Thank you so much. Hi, all. My name is Donna Bungard. I am the Senior Accessibility Program Manager over at Indeed. I am a 40-something woman with dark hair, dark glasses, and wearing a bright red shirt today. And really excited to be here with you. Yeah. I'm excited, too. And, and this is a uh, topic that is uh, near and dear to my heart and certainly something that's, that's, uh, that's on the mind of the, dis the disability community and, and companies alike. And I want to jump right in. So um, could you tell me first a little bit about your role at Indeed um, and uh, kind of where, where you sit in the business and how you support Indeed in their disability inclusion and accessibility efforts? Absolutely. Fantastic question. Well, if anyone looks at my Slack message, you will easily see that I always say that I am sprinkling accessibility glitter wherever I go. And that's because if anyone has had glitter in their home, they know that once it's there, it's never going away. And it spreads. So that is my unofficial role. But more officially, um, I'm housed in the marketing department, which means I get to work with the most incredible creatives and logistical individuals I've ever gotten the opportunity to work with. And finding ways to infuse disability inclusion and accessibility more and more into our everyday, into our norms, into our, just our DNA. And then I have the privilege of working with partners throughout the organization. Um, partners in our ESG teams, partners in our um, customer service teams in our employee resource groups. Um, I even got to consult on a real estate bit. I've gotten to speak with our VP plus crowd on, on disability and accessibility and all of these wonderful things. So I've gotten to, I've gotten really privileged to get to play in all, all sorts of sandboxes while living in a, a, as I said, a glorious marketing department full of these wonderful energetic people who were just genuinely inclusive, um, the whole company. It's just, I'm really lucky. Amazing. I, you know, and, and that sets the stage for a little bit later when we talk about what, uh, what specifically um, Indeed is, is, is doing and, and uh, to advance the ball both internally and also um, in, in your service offerings. But um, one of the topics of this uh, talk is really about, um, really focuses on skills-based employment. And so in your words, I'd love for you to define that and then talk about like why skills-based employment is the way forward. Um, and we'll start there and riff. That sounds perfect. Well, skills-first hiring basically talks a lot about what people do bring with them to the table. Um, it's a matter of breaking down a lot of barriers across the board by let's not worry about what, how you're getting the job done. Do you have the skills to do the role? Are you capable of doing this? And that's great. So by doing this, we're taking away some of the education gap because people with disabilities around the world have huge education gaps of what they're able to, to do. And I know that's one of the main wor things we're talking about here at, at Zero Project this week is education and how to close that gap. But right now, there are millions of people who have experienced that gap but who have acquired those skills through alternative routes. And they are talented, energetic, incredible professionals in a variety of industries and fields. And they just need the opportunity. It's one of those things we talk about a lot throughout Indeed is that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. And by looking strictly at the skills that people bring with them, we're able to transcend a lot of the bias and barriers. So skills first is, is something we're really, we're seeing adoption of because more and more employers are recognizing that there it doesn't have to be X, Y, Z behind somebody's name. They have to be able to do a role. 
So um, it's really exciting work. It is exciting. And, and um, at the same time, what I'm, what I'm hearing from you is companies are starting to adopt this uh, model of framing job requirements that, you know, again, to your point, takes away um, the emphasis on, you know, what university you went to or uh, any other certifications you might have and places more emphasis, yeah, on actual capability, right? And that's, that's huge. Um, and it's, quite frankly, it's a disruptor. And so we heard that, like, some, some, some companies are adopting it, but some are not. And so could you tell us, like, you know, anecdotally maybe, what some of the barriers you've heard companies facing in, 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 in adopting this? Because, again, like, it can completely revolutionize the way that you tap into the disability employment market. Absolutely. And one of the key things to do for any company out there is to really focus on what have you always done? Because a lot of companies, and I know in my past lives, I was guilty of this too. Oh, we, we have a job description. We'll use this old one as a template. We'll just put it out there quickly and busy and multitasking. Go, go, go. Nobody needed to lift 25 pounds, except maybe if you are having a bad day and had a very large mug of coffee. Um, I, I have a beer sign that I've been put in, I used to put it, my coffee into. I mean, it wasn't quite 25 pounds, but it got there. Close. My point is, though, look at the processes. Is there a phone screening that is a standard operating procedure? Well, that's cutting out a lot of the deaf and hard of hearing community. That might be screening out individuals um, with the various uh, cognitive disorders or disabilities, we have a various number of comorbidities out there that might impact this. So what we want to talk about and look at is what are we doing? What has always been done? What feels normal? Because are we screening out incredible talent because of it's an older template, it's an older process, it didn't occur to me that, oh, maybe I needed to, to rethink what does a strong communicator mean? I mean, we're up here, we're being strong communicators, but, eh, well, okay. No, <laughs> no but earlier today, I was in a conversation with uh, people who were speaking in ASL. I was not a strong communicator. I was very weak in that discussion. It's something I'm personally working on, but I'm not there yet. So what does a strong communicator mean? Think about the words you're using, thinking about the skills you're asking for, and analyzing that. And I think the more and more companies are taking that, that pause, that breath, the more change we're seeing. And so um, knowing that you are, this is a point of emphasis for you, this is a point of emphasis for Indeed, how does that manifest in the way that you work with your corporate clients, right? Like how do you, how do you kind of, sound this idea with folks and get them to cross or, or, or break down the barriers that prevent them from um, using this practice? It's a lot of conversation. Um, last year at FutureWorks, we had a remarkable panel where um, we had our SVP of ESG, we had Hab and Girma, and we had a gentleman named Vince Bregg, I hope I'm saying his name right, um, from ConCreates, and they were talking about disability, they're talking about justice impacted, they're talking about education, and they're talking about the barriers, and they're just having conversations about the barriers, what they are, and all the successful, talented, incredible humans out there who are being screened out daily, and some of the ways that we can, you know, re rewrite the script. And that's one of my, my personal, Donna, not necessarily, you know, this is Donna's goal, is to rewrite the script about disability inclusion. That it's not about breaking down barriers for people, it's about breaking down the barriers for employers. Employers are missing out on talent. So it just comes down to having these conversations and creating a vocabulary for people to continue to have these conversations outside of moments like this or moments like future works or mo moments like a, a specific article. It's about just keeping the conversation going. And so uh, up until now, we've really been talking about Indeed's role as kind of uh, in working with your corporate clients in uh, your kind of the, the external commitments and external actions that you're making to advance this agenda. 
let's look a little bit internally. Um, we at the Valuable 500, we often talk about you know which which companies um, uh, walk walk the talk, as it were, um, not to use an ableist term, but which companies actually abide by their commitments, which companies are, are, are doing the work internally as well. And um, what, I want, what I just want to know from you, Donna, we heard a little bit about what your role is, but how do you see disability inclusion and accessibility rolling out internally at, at Indeed? It is the most advanced organization I've had the, the privilege of working with. It is at multiple levels. We, of course, I mentioned, had that training last week where all senior leadership are engaged and involved in having these conversations. But we also have um, employee resource groups that have recently been uh, repositioned, I suppose, as business resource groups because these groups of employees are not just influencing each other. They're influencing how the business looks at being inclusive. And then we also have satellite groups off of that. There's a, a fantastic channel I'm a part of about neurodivergence. And there's a lot of discussion about what works, what hasn't worked, what challenges, what's funny, um, what's entertaining and engaging for us. Um, there's satellite groups all over. And then there's just in general a, a community sense of let's, again, have that conversation. Let's make it safe to talk about it. And whether or not someone wants to disclose in a larger or formal setting, or if somebody wants to disclose, hey, I need some help. Can someone DM me or direct message me about something? Can we chat? And we do it. And of course, there's also the HR is incredible. The legal side of the accommodations are, are that's there too. But the fact that we have these multiple layers of engagement and multiple layers of support is where we, we live up to our values. And self-ID, um, disclosure, and generally more than anything, building cultures of trust um, internally at companies is something that the Valuable 500 pays close attention to. The roles that ERGs um, uh, play in that is, is also huge. So it's very much, what you're saying is very much resonating with me. I think that um, let's put the business to business um, um, hat on. Uh, obviously, as you just mentioned, Indeed is doing so many things well, um, but in order to do those things well, there need to be careful plans laid out, there needs to be the right governance, there needs to be the right resourcing allocated towards these certain activities. So for leaders who may be in the starting blocks, uh, or companies who are in the starting blocks who um, still, who, who have a ways to go to get to where you're at, what do you what can you offer as sage words of, of wisdom uh, uh, to help them along, at least to, to get started or to get the machine rolling, as it were? Uh, employers, people with disabilities are already working at all of these organizations. I mean, I'll just use a US statistic for, for an example. 27% of the United States population identifies with the disability, and most companies have a 4 to 7% disclosure rate. We're already here. The disability community is already there, and whether or not they're comfortable disclosing or they're, they're sharing this with you doesn't change the fact that we're already there. So what we need to do is create cultures where, you know, sharing our own stories, sharing that, you know, I, I jokingly tell people how I'm mysteriously neurodivergent because in the late 80s, early 90s, they had no idea what to do with me. They're like, uh, yeah, she's, she's different. Let's just say learning disabled. And, but the truth of the matter is we have to get up and we have to share our stories and share that and then not be afraid of when we're wrong because we're going to be wrong. We were actually, before the camera started rolling, chatting about individuals who have to stand up and say, oh, wow, I don't know that answer yet. And that's okay. It's okay not to know the answers right away. It's okay that even if you've come very far from where you were, tomorrow you might not have the answer. And that's okay as long as we're continually learning. It's that iterative approach. It's the understanding as much as we can today and then going ahead and trying to learn more tomorrow. There is um, uh, a, a, dear, a colleague and uh, someone I consider a friend and certainly somebody I learn a lot from, Andy Garrett at GSK, uh, use this phrase to kind of encapsulate what you said, which is, don't chase data, chase culture. And what he meant by that is, 
people, companies who get hung up on using self-ID as the sole measure for success lose out because you're, what you're not focusing on is the most important bit, which is creating cultures of trust, creating that internal capacity to actually you know, work towards people feeling comfortable enough to disclose. Um, and so I think you said that really beautifully. And, and so as we close out, I think we have close to right around 15 seconds. Um, any last parting words and, and you know, maybe uh, where, where do we find you? Where do we learn more about uh, uh, skills-based skills uh, employment? Um, well, you can always go to Indeed. We have a lot of resources there for employers or job seekers. Um, and they can just look at our content. Look, look me up, Donna Bungard. I'm all over random socials. And, um, <laughs> and I am happy to, again, keep the conversation going. I think as long as we're talking and learning, we're, we're on the right path. And certainly everyone here at this conference is, you know, emulating all of that. So thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you to the Zero Project, the folks in the audience. Hi. Um, well, um, that's it.
I'm Sambhavi Chandrasekhar, Global Accessibility Lead at D2L Corporation. We are a learning technology innovation company based in Canada and uh, global, with global operations. Um, our mission is to transform the way the world learns by reaching every learner, regardless of their age, abilities, or location. And Zero Project is very close to our hearts because we focus on the human and we look at technology as just a connector between the teacher and the learner. I'm also proud to be here as a part of the IAAP team. Uh, as the Vice Chair of the Global Leadership Council, we have a little booth out there, a shameless plug, please visit that. And I'm honored to share stage with Philip Riscala, Chief Executive Officer of Accessibility Standards Canada. Philip. Thank you, Sam. So I'll just tell you a little bit about myself before, before we get into the, uh, the session. Um, so as you indicated, I'm the first uh, Chief Executive Officer for um, Accessibility Standards Canada. Um, Accessibility Standards Canada is a brand new organization within Canada, and our responsibility is primarily to develop standards uh, in the area of accessibility, removing barriers to accessibility. We're the first of its kind in Canada, and I believe also in the world. Um, and our goal is to create standards that will remove barriers to accessibility in a number of areas, including ICT, transportation, employment, built environment, communications, um, you name it, we're going to be developing standards in those areas. So I'm very, very proud to be here today with you, Sam. Thank you. Thanks. So, Sam, I think I'm going to lead off the questions, if you don't mind. Absolutely. So um, I've had the privilege of working with you for, for a while and, and knowing you for a while. And I know that uh, in your role with D2L, you have experience with ICT accessibility um, and inclusive learning. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Okay. Um, if there's one message that I'd like to give the world about making a learning systems accessible and uh, completely effective, that would be holistic accessibility management. So at D2L, we have evolved a seven-point framework for that. And it starts with an inclusive mindset. Like across the organization, we need to develop an inclusive mindset, followed by compatible technology. Like if you're using learning technologies, you need to make sure that those technologies are compatible with the assistive technologies that might be used by teachers and learners. Next comes accessible content. The content needs to be made accessible so that all students with disabilities can access the content. And then comes inclusive delivery, which means um, the way it, in which teaching is done, teaching and learning is done, must be done inclusively probably by using UDL and other mechanisms. Then comes regulatory compliance. You know, we are all involved in creating standards and the standards go and sit inside regulations and uh, it's very important that leaders take these regulations and the associated standards seriously and align them, align their, with the processes that they are doing. And um, sixth, I would say, is governance. This is not very much spoken about. Leaders need to be aware that accessibility needs governance in the sense of creating systems, creating processes that will measure and also monitor how accessibility is taking place. And last but not the least is to create collaborative communities not just within the institutions, but across the institutions, across the country. And from that perspective, I would say that accessibility of anything, regardless of whether it's learning or anything, is a countrywide responsibility. And I'm so glad that Canada is leading it so well. As the CEO of Accessibility Standards Canada, I'm back at you. How do you think you're leading it, and what are you doing about unifying the country with standards? Yeah, so I think, I think we have a very unique uh, approach in Canada. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about maybe four elements uh, of, of what Canada is doing, which makes us very unique. First is we have legislation. We have an Accessible Canada Act, and that act is very, very specific. It says Canada will be barrier-free by 2040. And in doing so, they've installed three pillars within that act, or three primary pillars. One of them would be my department, which is Accessible Standards Canada, where we develop standards to remove accessibility, barriers to accessibility. 
The other one is the commissioner, and the commissioner is basically your compliance officer. Um, if, or you know, somebody who may actually Im impose penalties if you're not meeting the requirements that, that um, the government uh, puts into the legislation. And then we have a, uh, a chief accessibility officer who monitors and reports back to our minister. You know, how are things going in the country? Are we, are we meeting our objectives? Are we getting to the point that we need to get to to get to a barrier-free Canada? So I think the fact that we have those three elements in law means that we, we're going to stand a much better chance than just, just creating a standard, leaving it there, and you know, hoping somebody's going to take it up, and then there's no penalties if you don't do it. So I think the government got it right, because this is, this is going to be really a catalyst to, to get things moving, moving forward. I think the second element that's, that's really unique about our organization and, and what we're doing that's quite different, everybody's heard of standards, and everybody knows what a standard is. You sit on a committee, you develop a standard, and you hope that somebody takes up the standard. Where we're slightly different in the development of our standards is that once we've developed a standard, and I'll talk a little bit about how we develop these standards, but once we've, once we've actually developed the standard, we can go to the minister and say, put this into legislation. So that gives us a lot of power. The act gives us that power. It gives me as a CEO and my board of directors that power to go forward and say, we want to put this into legislation. So it, it could become law. Um, but when we develop our standards, what makes us very unique is that we develop our standards on the principle of equity. And what I mean by equity is that most standards that are developed in the world, most codes that are developed in the world are based on minimum acceptable. So minimum acceptable is fine, but generally that uses a streamlined approach where you're just looking at the masses. You're not looking at the outliers. And when we talk about accessibility, it's really the outliers that we're trying to capture within our, within our equity-based standards is what we like to call them. And we, we, we assume that if we capture the, the, the outliers, Everybody in the middle gets to benefit from that. And so that's the principle that we use when we're developing our standards. And we've gone even a bit further. Our committees are made up of about 50 plus percent of our members, experts that have lived experience or persons with disabilities. Um, so this, this makes it very key. It makes what we develop very, very pertinent um, because it's the community that uses it that are actually helping develop the, the regulations that will eventually come into force. And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our standards development process as well. Our standards process um, is, we're an accredited standards development organization, first of all. Um, when we develop our standards, we bring input from experts from across the country, from across the world in some cases. So I think that when, once these standards are developed, there will be global uptake. Or there's a possibility for global uptake, which is very, very key for us. Um, and then I'll, I'll maybe just lead, uh, I'll finish it off with two small points. We wanted to be different than most organizations. And one way that we became very different than most organizations is that we instilled the walk within our office. We built the most accessible office in the country. We have provided all the accommodations that we can possibly provide for our staff. We have a large percentage of our staff being persons with disabilities and experts with disabilities. So we believe that really feeds into what we end up developing. And just to my very last point, and very quickly, we also fund a lot of research, working with the community of persons with disabilities that help support and feed into the development of our standards and our policies. So um, I'm gonna maybe lob a question over to you if I can, Sam. So um, I've had the fortunate, I've been fortunate enough to actually work with you and, and know you now for a number of years. And I know that you're working on a couple of the technical committees with us, one on artificial intelligence, one on information communication technology. In your view, where do you think we're heading w with those two standards? First off, I want to um, congratulate you uh, and, and Canada as such for the, uh, the research-based uh, focus on developing standards and for including that many people with disabilities. And as the vice chairperson of the Arti Accessible and Equitable Artificial Intelligence Systems Technical Committee, and the ICT Products and Services Technical Committee, I can share uh, some views about like what's happening right now. So we recently adopted the um, EU's EN301-509 ICT standards uh, to harmonize with EU. And then we also hope to, along with EU, uh, move it, uh, rather move the functional accessibility requirements part of it from a deficit model to a functional model. And what I mean by that is that um, instead of saying, oh, you have so-and-so disability, so we need to give you this such and such access method for you to be able to access, we say here are a range of access methods. 
And anybody can choose any of those based on your context. Um, and um, we hope to move that after it's passed into uh, the regulatory process, like Philip was saying. And the second one is uh, about the AI. And what we are doing primarily here is to protect the rights of people with disabilities. Because we know they can benefit maximum from AI as well they are harmed to the maximum by AI. Because like you rightly mentioned, they are the outliers. Especially when you take decision-making systems using AI, the statistical reasoning just throws the outliers out. And that's one thing we are really uh, very cautious about. And we want to keep that in mind and also keep that in mind that people with disabilities should not just be consumers, but they should be active participants throughout the life cycle of the AI, whatever product it is, as designers, developers, implement implementers, evaluators, all of those roles. And um, we do hope to come up with uh, one set of standards by one year and then again move it into the regulatory process. As a parting thought, what I want to share is what our accessibility leaders um, have often said, like Carla Qualtro and Stephanie Caddo, nothing without us because everything is about us. There is no us in them, we are doing it for us. Is there anything you want to share? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll share something. I'll give you a personal thought. Developing standards is not rocket science. The technology is there, everybody knows what they need. Um, you know, in some cases, we, the technology has to reach that point, but you know, we've been, the community of persons with disabilities have, have been asking for things for years. And, and so really trying to determine exactly what it is we need to put in a standard, that can be done, that's a process, and, and we can do that. I think the real challenge lies in mindset change and attitudinal change. And I think once we get over that hurdle, we're gonna have the success we're looking for. So I think we need to have a lot more, a lot more effort put into changing the mindset of leaders, of, of decision makers, policy makers. Um, and once we've done that, I think the tools that we're creating here was just kind of an afterthought. This is the way we're gonna develop our standards going forward. It's not gonna be a separate standard for accessibility. It'll just be a standard dealing with ICT and accessibility is just embedded in there because leadership has bought into that. So I, I'll leave you with the, the, with, with the word of um, work as hard as you can on your leadership and keep reinforcing the need to include accessibility in every decision, whether it's employment, whether it's ICT, whether it's communication, whether it's buildings, whatever it is, make sure that if they're not looking at it holistically, um, they should be looking at it holistically. And I'll probably leave it at that. Wonderful, Thank you. Philip. And with your leadership, I'm sure Canada will continue to pioneer. And thank you very much. Thank you, Sam.
Good afternoon. I'm Tom Butcher of the Zero Project, and I'm here this afternoon with Alvin Tan, who is the Head of Technology Catalyst at SG Enable, and SG Enable is in Singapore. So, what we're going to discuss is building a robust ecosystem of support for persons with disabilities. So I'm going to fire away with my first question to Alvin, which is, Alvin, please could you provide us with a brief overview of SG Enable and whom you serve? Thank you, Tom. So hi, everyone. Alvin here. So just a very brief description of myself. I'm a Chinese in my 40s with graying hair, unfortunately, and I'm wearing specs and a coat. So just a very quick overview about SG Enable. For SG Enable, we are the focal agency for disability and inclusion in Singapore. So what that means is that we will look into the different aspects of a person with disabilities life and do our best to actually support them. Um, we are set up in 2013 by the Ministry of Social and Family Development and we are a non-profit with a charity status. Right, so the work that we do, I would say, is very much encompassed in our vision. So we envision a, a, a society where there are equitable opportunities for persons with disabilities and we hope to achieve this through a few approaches, namely through our sustainable social innovation, thought leadership and impactful partnerships. And the last point is particularly more important because I think that for SG Enable, we are just mm. one single organization. In order to deliver impact, really we need to rely on partners out there who are aligned with us and to achieve the same outcome that we do, hope Great. to achieve. Thank you for that introduction. So we're going to get into the meat now. Um, as a sector enabler, how do you actually build your ecosystem of support? So before that, maybe I just highlight a few pillars of work that SG Enable does. So for us, we have our roots in employment. So naturally, in terms of hiring and employment for persons with disabilities, that's one of the key focus of ours. In addition to that, we also do uh, information referral for persons with disabilities, training and consultancy, assistive technology and accessibility, caregiver support and community integration. So for each of these pillars that we have, our approach is to work with partners who can actually help to deliver the impact. So, Probably I'll talk about employment first, right? Yeah. So in terms of employment, we work with uh, schools, right? Because we hope to expose persons with disabilities, or rather in this case, students with disabilities, early on to the possible op opportunities out there for open employment. So we put them through internships. We do job shadowing days yeah. where actually the students have a chance to experience what it feels like to be in the open employment. And on the other end, we also work with the employers. We bring in employers we hope to, you know, uh, expose them to the possibility of hiring persons with disabilities, acclimatize them, and once they are uh, on board, we try to do the matching. So, that, so in terms of ecosystem play, we really try to build up both the demand and supply of things, mm. and then we try to do the matching, and yep, hopefully there's a positive outcome on yeah. that. I'm sure it's immensely successful. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'll go on to the um, third point, which is pretty close to home for you. Um, I should love you to tell us a little bit about Enabling Village and Tech Able which I know you started off. And I'd like you to discuss them or tell us about them as a living proof of everything you've just told us. So maybe I'll just start off with a brief description of what the Enabling Village is about. So the Enabling Village is, uh, is meant to be an inclusive community space. It's meant to uh, break down the barriers between persons with and without disabilities coming together working together, learning from each other, so as to bring about a more inclusive society. So in the space itself, right, I mean, we, it's also meant to be an innovation test of sorts, and we have many firsts in the Enabling Village. We have the first inclusive gym, we have first inclusive preschools, where preschoolers with and without disabilities come together. We have the first inclusive clinic, and we have the, and many more, right? So, and for the Enabling Village to come together, that's where we actually rely on the public, the people, and the private sector coming together. We leverage our resources, we synergize our resources to bring about this place. And one of these uh, good example, thanks for bringing it up, <laughs> is TechAble, which is very close to heart. Right? TechAble is a center for assistive technologies, and we have co managed it with another non-profit called SPD. So the, with the support from the three Ps, that's where we actually set up the place itself. It become a one-stop station mm. for persons with disabilities to get assessment and training in terms of assistive technology. And I mean, we, we see technology as a strong enabler to allow the independence of uh, persons with disabilities. And I think this center itself, I think we have actually delivered our impact to ensure that the person with disabilities who needs assistive technology gets the assistive technology right. and apply it to their daily lives, and hence enhancing the independence. Wonderful. Right. And I'm just going to come um, take a 
a little riff on the fact you mentioned the, the three Ps, but I think one of the really important things that you must tell our viewers as well is the fact that you don't just focus on persons with disabilities, you also focus on caregivers. So whilst the three Ps is holistic on one side, the disability community, including people with, um, including caregivers, is really important. Can you talk to that subject a little bit? So I think uh, on the caregiver part, I think probably many will agree with me that no, the caregivers are sometimes the neglected segment of things. While we focus on persons with disabilities, we tend to you know, forget that actually the caregivers also need support. Hence, we look at the person with disability and the caregiver as a single family unit, and we see what we can do to support. So in terms of caregiver support, again, going back to my earlier point about partnerships, yeah. that's where actually we work with partners to see to deliver the support services for caregivers. So it could be in the form of uh, education, yeah. with the resources available to them to learn. Peer support, we get caregivers to support fellow caregivers so as to you know, make the, the journey easier for them. And of course, I mean, through the partners that we support, that's where the sector capability building comes in. We mm. try to uh, res we find resources to support them so that they can better deliver their work and thereby impacting more caregivers out there. So yeah, so I think, I think it's important mm. that we see them as a single family unit and support them on that note. Great, yeah. thank you so much. And um, I, I know a little bit about um, SG, but you're not just an enabler. There are two other pillars or foundations. Um, could you explain and tell people about those two other, two other areas? So just to recap, I think uh, for SG Enable, we see three roles for ourselves. I mean, we are the advocates. So in that sense, we are actually advocating for, for personal disabilities to be integral members of the society. We are the catalysts. I mean, we bring people together, we yeah. connect people, we connect ideas, and we try to bring the ideas to fruition so we have to yeah. deliver a certain impact. And building on the ideas, of course, there comes the resourcing. As an enabler, we hope to be able to bring the resources to allow the ideas to, you know, to bloom and eventually to become something more tangible and sustainable to deliver the impact to persons with disabilities. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. And then I, I think what's really important as well is I from what I understand to be one of the kind of founding principles um, when you were set up in 2013 is the fact that you are not only a focal agency, but you're also the first stop for disability and inclusion. Can you um, give me a little of the history of that and the genesis of that and why back in 1913 uh, that was felt to be so important. Um, was there nothing there before? How did it work? And did you fill a great gap? So to be honest, the, the point about the first stop actually was uh, started only a couple of years back where we did some sort of a realignment in terms of our uh, functionality. So as I mentioned earlier, actually we started with our employment routes, right? But well, I mean, going forward, I would say that, you know, um, the first stop idea is that anyone with uh, any queries about disabilities. Yeah. We don't want them to you know, knock on the wrong doors you know, and having, you know, having much difficulty in getting what they need. So we hope that we, as a first stop, they come to us first. Yeah. Right? And if we can support them, we support. If not, we would actually direct them to the relevant organizations. Yeah. They can better support. So it's, a, it's more of a no wrong door policy mm. and making, making sure to make the whole journey easier for them. Right. Right? So that's really, really the principle at which I mean, we do our work. Great. And um, I'm right in believing that it runs the whole gamut of age from um, tinies through to oldies like me. So, uh, okay. so in terms of the, the, if you're talking about the age group, we do support uh, personal with disabilities from young all the way yeah. to old, but of course, at certain stages of their life, there could be other agencies that would be more better suited to support them. Mm. And, we work, and we work very closely with these agencies. Again, going back to the point about partnerships, yeah. that's where we, together with our partners, we hope to provide the most uh, holistic right. kind of support yeah. for personal with disabilities. Excellent. And um, can we, going back to the kind of ecosystem support, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about three, I think, are three important elements. Uh, you mentioned one of them earlier on, but the other two as well. So there's assisti assistive technology, there's info communications, and there's universal design. So if you could talk a bit about all of them, that would be great, and, and in particular about the uni universal design aspect. So 
why not we talk about the universe is designed first? So going this this point goes back to the point about uh, enabling village. So the the village in in a concept is meant to bring person with and without disabilities together. But architecturally, yep. I mean, is the whole place is designed with universal design. In other words, I can safely say that you can actually go to any inch of the place if you need to, with, even if you are a wheelchair user. Mm. Right. So the idea is that we want to show people that it's possible to apply universal design in your infrastructure mm. to make it accessible to person with disabilities. And that's only on the physical part of things. I think. As, as, as extension, yeah. even down to digital assets, even down to um, you know, processors and you know, engagement with personal disabilities, there's much that can be applied into, to ensure that your product and services, your premise yeah. is actually accessible to person with disabilities. So I think the, the, the concept about the universe design is very important. So going back and going on to the point about assistive technology, yeah. we see that as, um, I, mean, I mean, I always see it as two sets of a coin. So on one side, you have accessibility. Yeah. On the other side, you have assistive technology. The whole idea is that how can we use technology as an enabler to allow persons with disabilities to be able to access mm. be it product services, contents, you know, even, the, even interaction with the uh, uh, immediate environment. Mm. The technology itself is a very strong enabler. And if we have these two well sorted out, yeah. I think we're looking at a really inclusive and accessible environment yes. for persons with disabilities. Right. Great. Thank you very much indeed. And we're coming to the end. I saw the five-minute sign, but we've probably got four now. Um, are you going to um, set up another enabling village? Is the one you've got now really just the kind of pilot scheme? And have you got elsewhere kind of mapped out? So to be honest, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean over the past years, we have been receiving requests about, you know, can you help me build an enabling village in my, in my country? Yeah. So, I mean, I think we are definitely very open to share our, 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 our learnings and our takeaways from setting up an enabling yeah. village. And we do, uh, I mean, maybe at this point of time, I'll probably extend an invitation. Anyone who's keen to learn about enabling village, do come by Singapore, contact us. I think we'll be more than happy to show you the place. And then from there, yeah. it's probably where we can do the exchange of uh, knowledge and knowledge transfer to see whether can we work together on that. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, and I'm just going to ask you, Two more questions because a three-minute sign came up. Um, well, first is, what do you, one thing that you find absolutely great about being the head of technology catalyst? Wow. Okay. Just one. Just one. I think it is the opportunity to try anything. To be honest, yeah. yeah. Uh, if I may elaborate further on that, yeah. yeah it was, I mean, we see technology in all aspects of our life. I mean, we have all our smartphones in our pockets right now. Yeah. So. Technology actually touch different aspects of the life of a person with disabilities. Yes. We always want the person with disability to be able to work, learn, live and play independently. And I, th yeah. I see technology as playing a very crucial part in that. Yeah. So I'm very glad that I'm in this role where I can actually try out many things. <laughs> and hopefully I know I can create a really inclusive environment for yes. a person with disabilities. Great. And um, as I always end my, th um, my chats with people, not chats at people, but I hope chats with people, which is, Alvin, what do you want viewers to take away with them from yours and my conversation. So, so I guess this is very much encapsulated in our our tagline for SG Enable. So we still, we look at inclusive society enabled lives. So I think the outcome I really hope to see is really mm. in the future is that we are a truly inclusive society. There's no stereotyping, there are no barriers. Yep. Everyone appreciates you know, and accepts person with disability as an integral member of the society. So I think that is the end outcome that I hope to achieve. And probably the one takeaway is that it, doesn't, it's, it isn't as complicated as this thing. You, know, you can always take small steps, yeah. right? First, by understanding of our disabilities, and then from then on, expanding to you know, putting in processes, uh, mm. having better understanding, doing awareness, etc. Start with small, start small. I mean, you just need to take a small step towards uh, inclusion, and trust me, it is not as difficult as you thought. Right. <laughs> Great. Alvin, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I think probably you've learned a lot, viewers, um, from Alvin. Um, there was so much more to talk about, but um, at that point, I shall sign off. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this afternoon. And Alvin, thanks so much. That was thanks, great. Tom. Thanks for this. Thank you.
Uh, Christopher here. We're going to be talking about creativity and uh, the, the role of technology in, and humans and the combination of the two in terms of creating uh, valuable creative uh, resources. Carolyn, can you introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to this chat. Uh, Carolyn DeRosier, founder and CEO of Scribly. And we focus on uh, writing alt text for images primarily. Uh, but we also have um, services related to video and audio. Um, but basically, what Scribly is is a team of human writers that specializes in composing exceptional descriptions. And uh, in this age of AI, uh, we absolutely need to make sure humans are still in the loop. So. That is our focus, um, and yeah, happy to uh, dig into this topic. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. And Christopher? Hello. My name is Christopher Patnow. I'm the head of accessibility and disability inclusion for Google for EMEA. My responsibility is to try to understand the needs of the community from Africa to the Middle East to Europe and bring it inside so we can create an understanding of how to make our pro platforms and products and services more inclusive. Cool. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. Um, so, Carolyn, let's start with you because you, you immediately brought up that crossover between the humans and the machines, where a machine can write alt text, but a human can write better alt text. It's sort of broadly where we're starting. So, what do you see as the combination and the balance between what the machine's capable and what the human's capable on, and the creativity that, that comes from the human? Right. Well, alt text is seemingly simple. Right, just write a description for an image, but um, even though it's it's quite simple um, in terms of the requirement, it's not happening on the web. So we have a lot of missing alt text out there. We have a lot of inaccurate alt text. Um, there's a lot of formula-based descriptions that are primarily geared towards SEO. Um, so a lot of errors, uh, frankly, all over the place, and it ends up creating. Um, very challenging barriers to overcome uh, because images do play this important role on the web. So we have this question, with this, with this uh, powerful technology that we now have at our disposal, could this be the answer? Um, and I think it takes uh, careful consideration and, and the design of good systems around this that keep humans in the loop uh, because what we're seeing right now is um, it's leaving a lot to be desired. It's good in some cases, but not in others. There's a, a lot of anecdotal information flying around um, about what it can do, um, but uh, frankly, I'm quite concerned um, about the level of quality, and I think that um, we can use it as a tool, potentially, uh, to speed up the work of writing good alt text, but we still absolutely need um, humans as part of that process. What we're talking about is accessibility. Uh, images and their descriptions need to be 100% true and accurate um, because they are an accessibility requirement. So we can't be establishing barriers where we have misinformation out there. Um, you can't trust the descriptions that you're hearing. Um, so for accessibility purposes, we absolutely need to get this right. And I guess the human element of that is the creative bit of it. So the, p the person writing that tiny piece of text, which is really difficult to, to condense into that description, is thinking hard about who's getting the information and what they want to know. That's the human element of it, I guess. Absolutely, yeah. And it's difficult to replicate that because as, as part of our writing process, uh, we're analyzing not only just the image and the content of the image, but also the context, everything surrounding that image. And it's not just the text that appears around the image. We're also thinking about the audience. We're thinking about the brand. Um, we're thinking about the tone, the style. Um, what information, what approach do we need to take here? Um, there are any number of details that we could choose to describe, any number of words we could choose to select. Um, what are the best words um, and descriptive elements that we can include to properly convey that information in that particular case? Um, so there's a lot of um, subjectivity that comes along with that, and I think that's one of the challenges. Um, people feel continuously quite intimidated by writing alt text, and it's because you do have to make these critical decisions that feel subjective. I'm sorry, so just a question about what the human skill or talents are in your writers. I'm thinking about what's the essence of the human. So they're able to write good words, they're practiced at writing good words, because AI can obviously dish up words. What's the human difference? What's a good writer for you of alt text? Um, yeah, I think that a good writer of alt text um, is an empathetic writer, um, someone who can take another person's perspective and look at this image on this page and think, what, how would I describe this to a friend um, in the most efficient way possible that's going to get them to immediately understand um, exactly what is here? Um, 
not spending any time on irrelevant details, just getting right to the point. So I think it starts with empathy and also an understanding of accessibility as well. So the fact that these, these descriptions likely will be used by assistive technologies. Um, so they need to translate into that format and it needs to be a good experience. Cool, thank you. And, and Christopher, where, where are you coming from on this one around the, the balance between the human and the, and the, and the technology? Well, I, I see the technology as the, the next, it's the next chisel, it's the next piece of charcoal, the, the, the assistive technology, the, the artificial intelligence is the tool that makes something easier to do. Say, for example, if you want to compose music for a game, if you have one composer and yet you have 30 hours of music you need to do, let them do the interesting stuff. You don't, you don't need to have a human create world music that no one's paying attention to unless you want to pay someone to, to do that. But you really want them to come up with an excellent theme that works well with the drama. So when you, when you have a battle, when you have a fight, you want to have the song be great, that's when you need the human. Let the, the, so when, when you do it well, the AI becomes a part of the toolkit that someone has. It doesn't, it doesn't become the art, it becomes the artist's tool. Yeah. But so there's something that you said about translate. What's really interesting to me about this international world that we are, I'm looking at the United Nations words here, there's also an international context to AI and, and, and to descriptions. Something that makes sense in English may not make sense in Hindi. Well, yesterday, I, I cracked a joke about, about Annie, get your gun. Um, <laughs> And no one laughed. Like, oh yeah, I forgot. This isn't. This isn't. I'm not in Kansas anymore, literally. <laughs> and, but it's going to be true when it comes to d these automatic descriptions. If you have a solution that is generic, it's only going to be generic. You can't do the the empathetic translation. You need to have the human aspect to make it real, as opposed to efficient. Hmm. And um, so, and I was thinking about the music. So leave the AI to the lift music, and get the humans in on the. On the real art, the, the you know, the, uh, similarly with the alt text, is make it more engaging and more interesting. That's the creative element, the human touch that we're, that we're trying to get to. Is that's what it looks like when it's happening. Um, and whereabouts in other art forms are you thinking in terms of the impact it can have? You mentioned music. We've talked about writing. There's video. There's dance. Um, opera. I know you're. I know you know a lot about opera. Uh, where where are we going to see those interfaces starting to come through? And what are our cons what concerns should we have about that? I guess. The moment you hear that this is an AI-written opera, don't buy the ticket. <laughs> it's, it's not worth it. Um, I, I, there, there's, there is so much that needs to go into the complicated art forms. Again, if, if people treat the AI as, as, as a part of the development process as opposed to the end result itself, it, what it might do, it might help people understand the libretto. It could be useful for the translation of a libretto into different languages because it's poetic interpretation anyway. So if it, it doesn't have to be as empathetic and thoughtful. So there, there are uses of AI that, that, that's profound and meaningful when it comes to art and, and, create, and creation, but when we, when we were talking before, I would never want to have an AI description of when I'm going through a gallery and have a description of art in the gallery. I would never want to see that because you have no context of the things that are around you. If you attach a piece of, of alt text to the metadata, thanks to you, if you, take the, if you, you lose the context, if it's someplace else, or it has no context at all. So when you want to go into an experience like a gallery, you want to have why these paintings are, are there together. Why are these two paintings next to each other? That matters. Mm. And AI providing a description of an image won't give you that. Mm. And so and we're, we're particularly talking about uh, creativity and, and looking ahead. Do you think that uh, creators, whatever form of creativity we're talking about, what, how would they be changing in the next five to ten years in terms of their learning and knowledge? They're shifting away from, uh, in the sense of doing the, the drudge, into the more creative stuff. Is that a good move? Is it a positive thing? Are there things we should be concerned about? Your writers, how scared should they be about the emerging AI removing, taking away their jobs? What, that's, I guess, the rub of the question as well, isn't it? Yeah, I think that um, the prospects here are that we are giving people the tools that they need um, to potentially involve description work much earlier in the process as part of the creative process, where there was this kind of intimidating aspect of composing a description. If you're not naturally finding yourself to be a writer, you can't, can't find the words um, because you're working in a creative or a visual medium, and that's where you excel. Um, I think that these tools can help people kind of push that forward um, and get there and, and remove the level of intimidation. Um, 
we need to make sure that we're still accountable to the content that we're publishing on the web. Um, that needs to be accessible and we need to be owning our descriptions and our accessibility requirements that we're delivering for the content that we're creating. So uh, however an organization does that, by hiring experts or by incorporating it into their process, we're all trying to get to the same place with the content we're uh, publishing on the web. Mm. I think Hector, Hector Minto yesterday at our panel on AI really described this in, in a nice way. It's just an evolution of technology. I mean, calculators used to be humans. Now the things that you have in your pocket or, or better yet, on, in your phone. So the technology is going to evolve constantly. So, and there's always some amount of displacement until people get retrained into how to use the technology for the new applications. Mm. What, we, what we really want to make sure though is that the community that we are trained on how to use these tools to help our art, to help our businesses. Yeah. And, and then we need to make sure that what comes out of it is also based on representative data, thoughtfully gathered and, and, and contextual. I wonder whether that, that is a straight line into AI though. I'm, I'm, so the idea of being a creative accountant that's not a nice phrase. <laughs> so, so if you put in, and so you've got this logical progression of technology, but AI is taking us into another place where it can do things that we can't conceive even now. It, it's making videos on, on text prompts. So we're on the cusp of this change. So I think it's, it, it's comforting to see it as a linear change, but actually I suspect it's gonna be much more than that and it's gonna be doing things that we can't anticipate. Is that how you see it? Uh, we were talking about the genies out of the bottle for, for AI. So I've got another bottle over here with another genie in it who can put that genie back in. Shall I get, put the, the AI genie back in? Is that good for creativity to, to hide the AI again and let the humans back in on the story? How, what's the balance going to be? Well, I think the answer is yes and no. <laughs> um, because I if, if it's used only to save money at lack of, for, for lack of quality, then it's not worth it. If it, if it helps someone in to be inspired to, to make a connection that they hadn't had before, because it brought something to the, to the artistic process, then it's worthwhile. Right. So it really depends on what your goals are. If you're going to be that creative accountant that only cares about ones and zeros, like dollar signs, then it's probably going to be crap for art. Yeah. But if, it, if you, it becomes a thoughtful part of your creative process, using, I mean, I would never want to actually watch a video created by text. I think that the only, only use for that is like ads. Do you know you haven't? How do you know you haven't? Because today they all, they're, they're not <laughs> they're there They're really yet. obvious. Yeah. Because they, they don't look like a human's made them. But, but I guess that's the but point. But they would never be designed to, to meet your need as a human. They're designed to meet the needs of a marketer. Right. So they're being written by those ones and zeros people as opposed to someone who's trying to create art. Right. Art has to have context and a, and a story and you can't get a thoughtful story in a prompt. Hmm. Hmm. Which brings us back to good quality alt text being a creative process and not a simple um, typing out what I can see. It's actually explaining and storytelling. And that's still an element that the AI, you feel, is not up to the quality threshold. I guess that's the other point is it can do it, but it's not very good. Right. I think that uh, we have done some testing with generative AI as part of our writing process and are noticing some interesting outcomes um, where our writers are, they're not focusing so much on the minutia, right? Or, or writing down the text exactly as it appears um, and transcribing it because it's pretty good at actually capturing the text that's part of images. But they are focusing on um, the more human aspects. Um, those are immediately jumping out. Um, you got that emotion wrong, or no, that's not what they're doing, or I know who that person is, I know where they are. Um, there's always something to add, um, and so I think it's interesting to explore this process of how can we go further um, and also help speed up that, that process of writing really great alt text. Um, I think that in some ways it is speeding our process up. So that makes me feel hopeful. Um, in other cases, I think it's, I, I am a yes and a no as well because I think there are potentially outcomes that are quite concerning. Um, where we might go too far, uh, where people might be, uh, you know, just generating uh, AI alt text for thousands of images and, and calling their work done. Um, we need to stay in this position. Everyone at this conference is an accessibility advocate. Um, we need to continue to advocate for accessibility and keeping that as part of the process from the very beginning. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, we, we may see those, those bad outcomes. But I, I think this is true about accessibility in general. Those people who do, who, who do a, the lowest common denominator, just tick box effort, it shows. And that those of us who, who need the tools, it's our responsibility to support those brands and, and companies that are doing a good job. So if you have crap alt text, it means they probably don't care about you, so don't shop there. 
if you have a thoughtful alt text or a funny alt text, this becomes part of the relationship with a brand. Mm -hmm. And that matters. So this becomes, a, a, I see it as an equalizer, but then those people who care, who want to do a good job, will really stand out by having thoughtful, creative uses of accessible products. Right. So we don't see it killing creativity, number one. And we also think it can be an accessory for people who are being creative. And then finally, in terms of the different media that we've been talking about, we can see it being used across everything. We haven't, we, we haven't found something that creative that we don't think AI can help us be even more creative. That's broadly the message, isn't it, I think? Sure. Yeah, so that's the yes and a no. Exactly. <laughs> Marvellous. So thank you very much uh, for joining us, and thank you, Carolyn and Christopher, for that um, wonderful chat. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you will uh, be looking on the internet for more information about Scriptly and... Uh, uh, Google? Uh, is that got a, got a URL? Is it Google they call it? Yeah, we're, we're pretty new. Okay. You'll get it. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.
Hello, I'm Mark Walker from AbilityNet. Uh, I'm pleased, thank you for joining us at the Fireside Chat with Imagada here. We're going to be chatting about her work at UNESCO and uh, inclusive media and communication. So, hi, how are you doing? Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> you're welcome. Could you introduce yourself and say a bit about what your work is at UNESCO? I'm Imagada Kassinskaita Budaberg, so I am advisor for communication information and I'm working on projects related to media development, um, diversity and pluralism. Right. Globally? Yes, that's right. I work at UNESCO headquarters in Paris. Okay. So for anyone who doesn't know what UNESCO is, can you explain a little bit about that broad picture of what UNESCO is trying to, to achieve as a, an agency? UNESCO is one of the UN special agencies for education, science, culture, communication and information. So we work in those areas and I work specifically on communication information issues. And within the context of this conference, of course, I'm here for uh, promotion of uh, inclusive media. Okay, and, and is that, uh, so there's an element of that that's building on the whole picture of trying to make education more accessible more broadly, and then the communication is an element of that that you're focusing on in terms of disability in particular, and when we talk about accessibility it could mean a number of things, but from your point of view, talking particularly about trying to provide information for people who are disabled in, in an appropriate format. And what sort of challenges are you, are you addressing? I mean, what, what, what's the big problems that, that UNESCO is sort of seeing in this area? In the area of media development, that's primarily actually my focus area where I'm working currently. A, one of the challenges that we see, what we cannot deny anymore, that media makes a big impact on our lives, right. on our habits, experience, uh, attitudes. And this is why it is important that media would be accurately reporting, covering disability issues, and at the same time not forgetting that we have plenty of technical standards in place, good okay. practices where media content, audio video con content would be accessible. And that's what is required, but processes in uh, media houses would be adjusted, and the technical staff in particular would make content accessible. But that goes as well together with inclusive management and operation practices, um, uh, particularly uh, providing support and decent working conditions for media professionals with disabilities. So that's what it's the objective what we have, at least in this area, what we are working on, and I think it gives opportunity, Zero Project, um, uh, to discuss about those issues. Yeah, yeah, and, and to, again, just to narrow it down, you're talking, when you say media companies, therefore, like TV companies, public broadcasting companies, private companies, across the whole sort of media landscape, the, all of that is part of your remit in the sense of trying to change, transform that industry. Yes, as a part of promotion of pluralism in media, obviously uh, we want to have a mix of different uh, media stakeholders and uh, primarily we focus um, on work of public service broadcasters, community media, and obviously that comes together in different parts of the world. You have state-owned media and private media. So that's the, uh, basically the scope of our initiatives, really uh, focusing on public broadcasters, and community media in particular. Right. And but so obviously that's relevant to all media. Absolutely, yeah, I guess exception. they're trying to bring the translator across the whole piece. And in terms of where they're at just now, how would you say, what is the picture for, for somebody who's on the other end, of the, the, the person who's consuming the media, how accessible is it? How, are we, have we got a, a long way to go? Are we halfway there? How much of the content is actually accessible and relevant to disabled people in terms of the stuff that you're seeing? I think we are on the right track, uh, and I could see a big improvement last year, especially with uh, technical accessibility, information accessibility picking up. And um, uh, looking from the, let's say, coverage point of view or reporting point of view, there are more and more um, major, I would say, public service broadcasters who pay attention to disability reporting, but the disability reporting would be inclusive, uh, fair, and as well, respecting human rights, first okay. of all. Not only portraiting from medical point of view, not looking only at social aspect, but as well looking at the rights of people with disabilities. So I would say here it is an important emphasis is what we are picking up more and more, and I speak we as different stakeholders, on, on different aspects which are um, being introduced uh, by different stakeholders about convention and uh, human, um, related to dis uh, people with disabilities yeah. rights. And there are specific articles related to accessibility, freedom of expression, access to information for people with disabilities. So this is why media is mandated as well to provide more right. inclusive content. So it means that uh, making changes in editorial policies uh, introducing uh, um, issues of disability um, importance in, for instance, election processes, uh, political debates, uh, social, cultural, let's say, programs. Uh, but it would be not only, let's say, very specific events. For instance, yesterday we had a discussion about sports where 
Again, uh, this is one of the really very popular programs. Uh, and if it is really, let's say, related to Paralympics or other, let's say, games, so we discuss very specifically about, let's say, athletes with disabilities. But what we see um, last years with media is producing more diverse content. So it mm -hmm. means that we're introducing uh, issues related to disability across different programs, and this is what it is promising. But obviously, uh, we still need to, um, to raise awareness among media professionals, what there are different uh, media frames, uh, there are different, let's say, terminology which are being introduced, and it is uh, evolving. So there are certain terms which we've been using in the past, we are maybe now replaced or new are introduced. And obviously, um, moving towards to accessible content and making changes at um, a workplace. Yeah. So in terms of the editorial and the content, what sort of challenges from the public broadcaster point of view, what are they saying to you that they want to know? What are the lessons they need some help with, all the support that they need? Because that's your, you're providing some guidelines to them. What sorts of questions are they asking you? I'm wondering what problems they're trying to solve that, that you're helping them with. Uh, from our research, what we did um, while we were designing the practical manual, which will be released very shortly by UNESCO on um, disability and quality for media, we could see it clearly what there is um, very often uh, media professionals, we simply would like to report, but we are not sure how to do it. Okay. So it's, I would say sometimes it's a question only just raising awareness yeah. and actually uh, stimulating the discussion and, and helping maybe report um, uh, to report, let's say, more inclusive way maybe just giving some very simple tips. Sometimes, of course, there are issues which deserve uh, more attention. We need as well a little bit of more, let's say, investigative practices um, uh, and, and looking at other aspects, let's say, related to uh, climate change, to women's rights and so on, which may be as well overlapping with other yeah. areas and, and, and subjects. But I would say, in general, um, that's one of the first things is how yeah. to do this. What to do. Yeah. And, and I guess a fear as well. I mean, often with disability yeah. people are afraid of saying the wrong thing and they're in the media being the, the, the worst place to get that wrong I guess and that's one of the objectives is actually to encourage media to report yes to, to begin actually talking yeah. about yeah. it because they're not yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and you mentioned your guidelines so what's the plan with the with the actual uh, stuff you're publishing shortly Yes, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, one of the things that we've been working since one year now uh, to produce the practical guidelines, there are a number of re resources already available uh, specifically targeting, let's say, how to portrait a person with disabilities, mm -hmm. what the terminology to use, but we observe that, um, that over time those things are changing, especially terminology. And um, this is why uh, one of the objectives of practical manual is uh, the target audience is media professionals. Uh, so that's where the, the language, the structure, the issues, what we want to cover, really primarily target um, media professionals. And that means uh, we aim to address the issues that are discussed by editorial teams, for instance, right. editors, um, reporters, uh, cameramen, um, uh, let's say uh, uh, editors who work together, and obviously providing guidelines to technical teams, designers, how to produce co um, accessible content, and targeting um, human resource managers, uh, you know, senior managers who make, um, let's say, decisions whether workplace and workforce are more inclusive wow. and diverse. Uh, so this is why the practical manual, I believe it's going to be a um, um, useful resource for everyone. And I would say as well, I would probably emphasize what this practical manual will be released um, as open educational resource. Right. So it means that anybody who would like to use it and revise it will be able to do it. And um, later this year, there will be a few field offices around the world our field offices, which work on, on uh, media development issues, we will be piloting the guidelines and, um, and introducing um, to the capacity building workshops, uh, presenting this to media professionals. Okay. Um, maybe another thing that I would like to add as well, what we um, decided with practical manual, of course, it is, it's kind of a lot of text, many references, yeah. um, references to good practices, but we produce as well a master classes, a series okay. of master nice. classes. For, for, and who will be leading those? Um, we collaborated with uh, Miss Sophie Morgan. So okay, she's yes. a very famous yeah, yeah. journalist from yeah, UK, yeah. and uh, she's actually herself with disabilities, yeah. and one of the, I would say, very influential um, journalists in the world. So she agreed to host, so she's actually addressing uh, her colleagues 
um, in a way, what it would be appealing for media professionals. So we, uh, so uh, we will be released together um, uh, with practical manual uh, the master classes. Oh, fantastic! And uh, you're describing a big ecosystem there, though, with your, you know, from the what's what's being presented on the screen, and then the whole back office, all of the talent and everything like that. Is there a uh, is there a particular focus that you're starting with, where you think you'll have the first? sort of real push through to make the change happen? Is it the journalists or is it the, the backroom staff? What do you think is going to sort of tip it over in terms of the change? Um, it's very much depends uh, what is the stakeholder. Right. Uh, of course, a media organization is a big organization usually, unless we really speak about small community, um, let's say a radio station, which would, may have only a few staff members. Right. But I would say the practical manual is useful whether it is a big size um, organization or small one, because it, it's, those processes exist across different, right. um, let's say, regardless of size, but obviously probably the scope of, of implementation, how it could be addressed, what are the, let's say, resources will be used and, and timeline that could vary between organizations. So I would say, yes, there is a one part which is really relevant to editorial teams, making editorial policies more inclusive, programming more inclusive yeah. and equitable, and then of course addressing the issues of accessibility with have really technical teams, and, um, and that depends as well whether you know, we already been doing certain things on yeah. accessibility, yeah, yeah. is it just a question of making few adjustments? Or really starting from scratch and introducing and building, from the building yes. Or um, as well addressing the you know the needs of managers. Right. You know why yeah, your yeah. workplace is not inclusive and diverse, and what needs to be done. So it depends. Well, we often talk about um, carrots and sticks, trying to get change made. So is this? There's no stick, I guess. Is there something legally that they were going to be to be compliant? Is there is there an element of that within the whole picture, or are you really taking them something and saying they want to do this as a carrot for them? Is they're going to be more inclusive, they're going to get bigger viewership, they're going to have um, more, more diverse workplaces, those sorts of things. How do they view that? Are they, do they have regulatory responsibilities which this links to? As we work at global level, obviously every country has different uh, uh, regulatory process and, uh, and of course legislation and law in place, so we can see it, but it's very between countries. But um, one of the emphasis is, of course, we do have in almost every single country public service broadcaster, right. national broadcaster, and usually that's the first organization, media organization, which would be basically broadcasting or reflecting the views of public interest. Yeah. And we usually do have in the regulations in a code of entity. Um, uh, you know, the reflection, let's say, certain um, aspects which needs to be covered, including uh, disability. Yep. So that's probably one of the first starting points. Uh, there are other countries uh, which, of course, have technical um, standards in place and may have to comply. So the uh, media organizations will be definitely those which may be already introducing certain things or have already since some time. Uh, so it very much depends. But... Um, uh, let's not forget what um, United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities yeah. is one of the most ratified in the world. It was yeah, actually yeah. one of the fastest ratified conventions. And that means that um, majority of world countries have ratified already and uh, not only let's say ratified, but as well even adopted a number of the operational, let's say, initiative standards in yeah. place. So that means that um, we do have uh, already certain normative elements in place, yeah. segments in place for media to move and become more accessible and inclusive. So this is a positive step for them because they're learning more as they go deeper into that journey. Brilliant. And not only that, yeah. uh, it's as well discovering a new audience. Yeah, yeah of People course. People with disabilities yeah, in yeah. the audience. Maybe it's not a new for some, but obviously maybe not enough um, uh, opportunities, let's say, exploit yet. Yeah. And uh, so that's one of the, as well, probably um, opportunities to generate new revenues yeah. for media organizations, addressing better the needs of audience with disabilities. Yeah. So um, you're saying they're going to be published. When are they? When, when will people be able to see them and, and begin to consume them? And I have got another question, which is how often they're going to be updated? Because presumably there'll be a there'll be an organic process here. As you start to do your master classes, you'll be feeding back into the resources. Is that the picture that you have for I don't know how, however long, a, a couple of years ahead, potentially this program, I guess, to roll it out? 
Um, I hope it be good be, uh, would be released in May. Okay. Uh, so that's the objective is. And as I mentioned, it is an open education resource. Yeah. So we'll be releasing openly um, uh, the resource, uh, the practical manual. So it means that basically uh, the first thing what we would expect during the pilot um, uh, phase during this year, uh, what will be some adjustments made. Um, and uh, I would believe that those institutions will be uh, using the practical manual. We will introduce certain changes that so will be possible to adapt to localize. And, um, and um, the next step would be able to make translations from English to other languages and to use them around the world. Uh, so um, there is no immediate objective to revise them, but I think it will be a natural process. It because continue growing. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Thank you. Well, it's uh, fantastic. I mean, it's a, it's a mind-boggling scale of what you're doing acro you know, across all of those different media ecosystems, all those different organizations you're trying to engage, engage with, and then the work in actually putting that in front of them and getting them to, to engage with it you know, through things like the masterclasses, I think sounds fantastic. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of people will want to see those resources and be sharing them within their communities and networks as well. So it's wonderful. And I you know, look forward to seeing the success of it as well and seeing um, more inclusive reporting. Um, what, what are you seeing from your own point of view? Do you see as a particular success thing that you want to see from the point of view of this program? How will you know that it's beginning to work? How will you be saying, oh, yeah, that's beginning to, to, to bite now? What, what's the next step for you? I would like to see content which is more diverse, yeah. and more inclusive, what we cover, um, let's say, more aspects of disability around the world. I would like to see as well what content would be more accessible, uh, and obviously would lead to the changes in management structures, in processes, um, to see more media professionals with disabilities. Uh, not only those who just uh, news figures, uh, but seeing more, discovering more views from uh, information sources. Right. So it means that we would see more people with disabilities giving interviews, sharing their views, their opinion, but as well in managers' positions yeah. in media institutions. So that's what we would that expect, visibility. that it would lead to certain changes in, in internal policies, uh, introduction of new guidelines, um, and obviously more content and, uh, and uh, better, better coverage. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Emigal. It's fantastic. I really look forward to seeing the documentation. Thank you very much for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed that uh, 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 chat that we've just had. Thank you. Great. So we're just waiting for the...
Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to this fireside chat on To the Moon and Beyond, Innovations and Inclusive Space Education and Outreach. My name is Xin Yi, and I'm from the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. I am an Asian woman with shoulder-length hair. I'm wearing glasses, I'm a black blazer, black pants, white shirt, and a scarf. So today I'm very happy to be joined by two distinguished guests today. So they're going to tell us more about the special projects that they're doing to make space sciences more accessible to everyone. So when people think about space, the first things that come to their minds are perhaps astronauts, rockets, and maybe some awe-inspiring pictures of stars, galaxies, and faraway planets. But to assume that sight is the only way to appreciate science, we are missing our entire bunch of people who are blind or visually impaired. So you may ask me then, what should we do about it? Well, that's why I'm going to reach out to the two experts over here to tell us more. First, we have Professor Cassandra Ruyon from the College of Charleston. She's also the director of the um, NASA Space Grant Consortium, and she works with NASA on a series of Braille books. Next, we have Dr. James Trafford from the University of Portsmouth, who will tell us more about the audio universe and sonification. So welcome, both of you. Thank so you. Um, Great. So if I may, I'll start with Professor over here. So please, tell us more about how you got into what you are doing. And I see that you have a very interesting book on your lap. So please, take us from here. Oh, thank you. Hi, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am a 60-plus-year-old female, and I have reddish hair and matching freckles and courtesy of KLM I'm wearing a new shirt and some very dirty pants so I apologize for that but um, how did I get into this I my father was an artist and he constantly challenged my brother and I to think of things differently and to describe whatever we're seeing with our eyes closed or think of the textures and the colors of things and as I started teaching more and more students and audiences that had um, different abilities, shall we say, and I learned that students um, learn better when they're actually actively engaged, whether it's through color or touch or acting things out. And that one thing led to another, and realizing that the stars and space are inaccessible to some folks, the, um, the books became a, a fun project. And I'm, for the class, but also for me and my co-authors. So I see that you brought a couple of books. Would you yes. like to take us through some of them? What are, they, what are they about? And how did you create these really beautiful surfaces? Well, uh, OK, this, um, the one I'm holding up right now is about the small worlds in the solar system, which are comets and asteroids. The cover is just an image of um, the Halley's Comet going by. But I'm going to just flip to the back because the most exciting thing about this is Pluto, the small world that we saw when New Horizons mission went through. And I think one of the most fascinating parts of it is the heart. And I don't know if you can see or touch the heart here. Uh, this tactile is made with a lot of sand and some finer grains and the, with a very, the flat area representing the heart. The, the books, Sorry. each of the books has a QR code on the front that will lead you to the NASA website for these. And through the, playing Vanna here, <laughs> pointing to the QR code, um, they, they will lead you to our home site with the NASA survey group. And it has the content and the description of each of the graphics. And it will tell the reader or the user to flip the page when necessary. Or for scale, we give different um, information. So I can see that it comes with different texture, right? Correct. So for someone who is visually impaired, what can he learn from touching the different texture? Can we tell like the mineral composition of the planet? Or what, what, what can we learn from this? That's a really good question. Um, Typically, we use the different textures to represent the different elevation or the topography of the features. For example, in this Pluto image, these are mountains or higher peaks versus the flat-lying areas. So we can see craters? Is that a crater here, a mountain? There are a few craters. That's a bad example. Um, the next book, real quick, will show the moon, for example. This is the far side of the moon. And on the bottom, it has a, a cross-section, and the reader will be guided to go across the crater. And then to 
sorry, this is hard to show, but there's a cross section there and it shows you the changes in elevation as we go from one side of the crater to another. And then there's more of a description about what the composition of this particular area of the moon is. This is amazing. So you can actually look at a cross section of the moon. You can see the elevation. This part is higher. That's perhaps a mountain over here. And then we have flat surfaces and then maybe a crater over here. Correct. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. Could you tell us more about how do you involve people with disabilities in your project? How do you integrate their feedback into your creativity and your development process? Can we have the first slide? I think I was supposed to... Um, I think it's on. Um, so this shows the, comp the procedure where we're looking at, the, on the upper left, is an image of the master that we use for the sun, for example. The texture is very rough based on the images and the data we get back. So we're using um, actually Spanish moss that we pulled out of a tree <laughs> and to give the different uh, roughness and texture. And then that becomes one of these tactile graphics like we show. And then we em engage students and educators of people with disabilities whether they're sighted or mobility impaired, we have everyone try this out to see if they're gaining the kind of information that we want to share. We get their descriptions, et cetera. So when you released your first book, I guess it was at a time when disability inclusion was not so well received, or at least among people who are not in the circle, they may not necessarily understand the importance of your work. So how do you go about motivating yourself and the people around you to support your project? Lots of trial and error, <laughs> lots of having folks describe what they're seeing and not doing a real good job of it, so having them create their own models, um, going into the classrooms, working with the students, working with the educators, working with the professionals to help make things better, and just trying to share how important it is. Yeah, I guess all of us were just going through trials and errors, iterative process to finally come to a successful model. Thank you so much. And if you can have just one last word of advice for any of our educators out there who would like to bring the books to their schools and their communities, how do you think they can reach out to you? Um, these are um, paid for by NASA, so they are free to the public. And please email me. There is... Um, oh. That's a really cool slide. I don't have time. Um, we'll come back for it. But the next slide shows you the website of the survey.nasa.gov, and there's a QR code that will take you to the site that um, provides an email and so forth that you can request the books. Unfortunately, I cannot pay for shipping to Europe or out of the United States, but if you can cover shipping and we have copies, we're ha more than happy to share. All right, thank you. So to all, to all our, our audience, you can see on the screen here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six very exciting yes. books from NASA about space sciences or Braille books. So if any one of you are interested, do reach out to Cassandra over here. And, and just really quick, because we're using QR codes on this slide, it's the image of the sun and the tactile. That QR code here will take you to the sounds of the sun. That is the beauty of using QR codes now, the digital aspect. It's not just in print or in tactile. We can actually add sound, et cetera. Yeah, this is an excellent point because we are trying to move towards a multi-sensory approach so that people with different sensory abilities will be able to appreciate science using the senses that they feel most comfortable with. So with Cassandra, we talk about using the sense of touch to feel the real books. Now let's move on to Dr. James Trafford. He's going to tell us more about sonification, which is essentially the use of sound to listen to data. That is amazing. No one has thought that we could actually listen to data beyond just looking at charts and graphs. So please tell us more about sonification and what Audio Universe is about. Yeah, so this Audio Universe project, it's um, basically a collective of uh, mainly astronomers who are interested in yeah, going beyond the visuals that we rely on so much um, and thinking about ways of using sound to communicate data and also scientific concepts and um, this sort of approach is uh, something that, that we're, we're all kind of interested in exploring. Um, this is something that, you know, particularly, yeah, can appeal to people with um, blindness or visual impairment. So um, this gives an accessible channel, perhaps, to those, um, to those people for them to sort of experience 
the data to, to kind of hear the data. You know, and in, in astronomy, we rely so much on, on visuals. We can take these beautiful images of stars, galaxies, planets with telescopes, and um, that works really well to draw people into the field. But um, what we uh, want to do is make sure that people are... Um, so once people have been drawn into the field like this, um, if we're just saying, you know, look at these pretty pictures, then you're not necessarily appealing to people who, who can't perceive those images, right? So um, one of the, th the things that we wanted to do, as well as people with blindness and visual impairment, was also thinking about people with different sensory preferences or different learning styles. There's this idea that you can use a multimodal approach to appeal to people with um, different sensory preferences, and actually they can work together to improve people's learning. And um, just everybody as well, right? It's like it gives us a new perspective on the data. It gives us a new way of thinking about data. And in science, we're always looking for new perspectives on data because that's how we can make new discoveries or, or, or discover new things, get new insights. So yeah, um, one of the main things that we've been put together so far is this tour of the solar system planetarium show which is basically uh, focused on using a, uh, trying to create the first of its kind pl planetarium show that's fully understandable without the visuals. We have visuals, but even if you can't perceive those visuals, you should be able to understand the show. And that's by using a combination of narration, describing what you're hearing, and then sounds where the sounds are representative of different aspects of data, things like stars and planets. Um, so um, we put a lot of work into producing this show, and um, we particularly um, wanted to make sure that we were in contact with people with visual impairments. So um, in this kind of loop of like getting feedback and working out, you know, is this working to communicate the things that we want to? So, so that's a really important uh, process: is communicating to people, different people with different levels of understanding of science different levels of visual acuity, and then also uh, people who work with people with visual impairments and understand their learning needs. So um, altogether, this, um, it, it went into making the show, and it's a really fun process. Um, and we got incredible feedback. You know, There's lots of things that we might do differently or we learned from doing it. But um, just the fact that we provided something that was fully accessible to them in this way, we got some really great feedback. And trying to sort of scientifically analyze that feedback and make sure that we, we can keep improving and prove to the scientific community that this is really worthwhile to do. So I think we had one example, and I'm just going to set that up. So this is a, um, an example of the stars appearing at night. For people who are sighted, you might be familiar with this um, idea of going out on a dark night and seeing bright stars. And then over time, you see dimmer and dimmer stars as your vision adjusts to the darkness. Um, we wanted to make an analog to this in sound. So in this case, you are hearing the stars. So you hear the brightest stars first, and then over time, you're hearing dimmer and dimmer stars as they appear to us. Um, and we model the, um, the stars as chime sounds, and we can also tell something about the color of the stars. Bluer stars have a higher pitch, and redder stars have a lower pitch. So you can also get color information, which is very important for us as astronomers. Um, and one of the cool things about this is we can use full surround sound to actually map where these appear in the sky. So if you're in a planetarium with surround sound, you can actually hear where in the sky these are. So I think we've got a clip that we can play.
Yeah, so so that was this example, and um, this is this way of communicating this the stars at night, something as simple as that for those with visual impairments. And you know, this works well in a planetarium, but we can even um, we can actually use technology like virtual reality to work as a sort of personal planetarium. So you can repurpose this technology, which is mainly based based on visuals, to use their sort of head tracking so that it knows which way you're looking, so it can um, make the sound sound like everything's coming from the right place in the sky. And we're, we're trying to work on these different ways of accessing this, this kind of um, outreach material for, for people with visual impairments. You know, there's something really interesting about using sound as a, as a way to analyze data, because compared to other forms of visual representations, sound is multidimensional. With just one sound, you can use the volume, the frequency, the intensity, the timbre, and other parameters. To, to describe a certain characteristic of the data they're looking at, rather than just having, let's say, X and Y axis, which is just two-dimensional. So having sonification is extremely exciting. But yet we know that sonification itself is not really mainstream yet in the scientific research community. So could you perhaps tell us a little bit more about why is that the case? Yeah, so I think I think it's it's like a lot of people just haven't considered sound, right? It's like your mind, that we're so... Um, um, embedded in this idea of this visual approach and looking through telescopes, even though most of our telescopes are like digital cameras now, you don't actually look through them. Um, uh, but yeah, I think I think this idea of using sound, and everyone I've talked to about this kind of approach has been like, wow, yeah, this seems like a good approach, right? And it, it seems like just a new way, you know, it's it can only sort of add value, right? If, if we do it well, you, you're, you're adding sound on top of what you can already show visually. So I think um, really it's just a case of like demonstrating this working in a few different contexts and hopefully getting the community to really pick up on this and experiment with sonification themselves. That's why we developed this tool called Strauss, which is the sort of Python code that we're trying to make available to all um, uh, scientists as a free and open source thing. So they can sonify their own data and use it to present um, their data to the public. If you can get um, sonification to sort of catch in the field in this way, we can sort of integrate it in such a way that it outlives, you know, a project that's aimed specifically at, uh, at certain audiences. Like it can, it can go long into the future. That's that's the hope. So I understand that you you, you lead the project called Eyes in the Sky. So what are the outreach projects do you have in the pipeline? What can we look forward to? Yeah, so um, this project, we've been quite ambitious in trying to sort of appeal to very uh, broad audiences. It, down from sort of the educational level, like this stars appearing example that I showed, um, up to really like technical tools that people could use if they want to become astronomers. So if you are visually impaired and you wanted to become an astronomer, there, there are ways that we can use sound to explore data, particularly um, what we call spectral data. And sound can even potentially be more effective at this because you can hear about 10 octaves, so 10 doublings of the frequency it gives, it's a big range. Compared to color, you can only see one octave between about four, uh, 400 nanometers and 800 nanometers, if you want to get technical, <laughs> which I always do. But um, so, so, you know, you can actually use sound to, to perhaps give you more insight into the data. Yeah, but just talk about this point. You're, you're signaling that we need a lot of training. It seems like mm. we need to be trained both in science and in listening, in active listening, in order to be able to use sonification. So where can someone go to to get training in these areas? Yeah, so we, so we really need to sort of build these resources up. And I think just sort of playing around with the tools and playing around with the examples is a good way to build up this experience. You know, uh, um, we have our website, audiouniverse.org, where you can find out more about the project. And um, we hope that, yeah, through work, through presenting our own examples and getting more scientists and analysts to create these examples, we can sort of build up the best ways of doing it and build up an understanding to sort of catch up with our visual approaches. Right, great. So for the, for the last 10 minutes, I'm just going to go through some questions addressing to both of you. So if you have uh, any you know, comments, please feel free to just jump in. So you guys have been involved with education in space science for you know, students with disabilities for quite some time. So what do you notice are some of the main barriers to them getting access to a good science education? Gosh, that's a good question. Um, number one, confidence in themselves. 
their lack of uh, believing in themselves and that they, they can actually learn something. Um, their teachers also, there may be barriers. And in some cases, unfortunately, parents don't think that these children can learn in different ways. So by trying to make it exciting and engaging and hands-on and explore through different means, we can bring them in and show them what's possible for them. Yeah, I totally agree. I think I think this multi-sensory approach can really help to hopefully break those stereotypes, right? This idea that, you know, you can only use visual methods. Well, maybe if you can use tactile methods or you can use sound, then suddenly people will think, "Oh, this is for me. Maybe I can I can I can work with this. Maybe I can understand this field better." But it often seems that it is easy. The entry point when it comes to primary and ed secondary school education seems to be much easier than for students trying to gain higher education into space science. So what do you think scientific and academic institutions can do to make it more accessible for students who want to do space science at a higher level? We are talking about graduate, bachelor, graduate, postgrad. I think the professors, um, like me, have to say heck with the old ways and um, it was overcoming a lot of barriers. In fact, at one point I brought a hula hoop into my class to demonstrate tides and I almost got fired because I was doing something beneath my college level. Yes, it was. But the students loved it and it made a difference. And so we did more and more kinesthetic and multi-sensory examples and projects in the classroom. Yeah, and I think I think you know, just just working on the sort of resources for people to just deal with the data. You know, like a lot of this kind of stuff doesn't exist. Like, how do you how do you kind of take a big data set and start exploring it um, if you don't have access to visual methods? Everything's set up to do things in that way. So, you know, hopefully, if we can incorporate things like sound and touch as as new ways of accessing the data, then it becomes a feasible route for you to go and and study and even professionally work with data, especially uh, astronomical data in this way, I think. And the cool thing about science and exploration is it's wide open, right? There is no um, boundary per se. And so we need to use our imagination and be creative. And why not use that when we're teaching as well? Well, that's a very good advice. And so just catching on on this thread. So what can educators do to make their curricula more inclusive? You know, based on your experience, have you seen some pitfalls that educators make? Have you made some of this yourself? What have you learned in the process? Could you share with us some of your lessons? Yeah, I, I mean, I suppose um, for me, like, one of the things is, yeah, like, the importance of this kind of, like, consultation, just, just keep trying things and testing things. It's funny, for example, you know, with something like sound, how you can sort of in some way like hack into people's intuition, you know, like like a massive thing should make a deep sound, right? Like, or or like, uh, you know, maybe a metallic, if, if something's made of metal, maybe it should sound like or something like it should sound more metallic. And all these kind of things you learn about by talking to people and, and understanding experiences. And obviously, you know, um, it, people with visual impairments have unique um, perspectives on these things. Maybe they don't make those same associations that people, um, uh, sighted people do. So it's really important to understand what associations m they make and use those to the best of our ability. You know, I would like to put on a very interesting example talking about this sound association. I actually hear this example from one scientist who's working on sonification. So if I can just pose a question to all of you. So just imagine, um, when I, s just imagine there are uh, a, a heavy, I have a lot of coins in a bag. So would you, um, do you think that the, the sound that you hear, should it be louder or softer? If you're jingling the coins in a bag or if we drop the coins in a bag, um, I think you're gonna hear them tinkle against each other. Some may fall away from the rest of it, so it might be softer. I think it might be very like a bomb going off. <laughs> it depends on how it falls. You know, I think this is a question that I'm going to review the answer at the end of the day so that other people have more time to think about it because it's the opposite. I'm just going to give you a clue. It's the opposite. A lot of people like us who are sighted, we think of XY graph and we think of the chart going up. So we would think that the heavier the coins, we should expect a higher volume, you know? But I'm telling you that the answer is the opposite. So please, think, think about it. At the end of the day, then one of you is interested, come to me and I'll tell you the answer. It's really interesting. Okay, now, um, 
Would you like to carry on? Or do you have anything to add? No, I, well, one thing to add, I was just asked, um, be creative, don't give up, believe in yourself. Challenge your teachers, challenge your parents, challenge your friends to um, let you go out there and explore. And if something doesn't work, try it a different way. Yeah, I, I, I can echo that. That's that's great. And I think um, I think trying to, you know, something like working with sonification, it's great to um, realize that, you, you know, it's it's something very kind of new to a lot of people so you can really kind of regain that idea of like asking questions there's no bad questions you know don't be afraid to ask questions and try and understand things better like it's it's always a, a really useful um thing to do and, and 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 to be able to feel like you can ask questions is is, is really important yeah, and coming from the technology side, what trends do you see in terms of the use of ICT, you know, technology aspects, incorporating that into education in space science? Yeah, so I, I suppose um, we've been able to use a lot of this um, immersive technology, things like virtual reality or augmented reality. And that's worked really well um, for us in certain ways because you can actually start to um, use, you know, this kind of like, you can sort of add sensory inputs on top of the ones you already have. And things like sonification works well in that way. Um, and I think, you know, these things can have like haptic feedback as well. So like you can, you can combine touch and vision and sound all together and really try and make something multimodal you know something where all the senses are involved in, in giving you as much um, information about your surroundings as, as possible I don't want to forget about the sense of smell as well incorporating smell for some projects or some aspects of things is very beneficial and helps you recall it later on right there are five senses right so I know that there are some scientists who on haptics so the use of vibration to represent certain um, data parameters. So that is very interesting as well. So we can look forward to having a future where, can we, where we can use all five senses to really understand and appreciate science. So well, for the parting shot, just three words to describe what you think the future of space science education would look like. Exciting, intriguing, and beneficial. <laughs> Three different words. Um, so I think multimodal, um, expressive, and uh, intriguing. Let's go. <laughs> Wonderful. In fact, I would like to make a trip to your planetarium to have a look at <laughs> the outer universe. So um, at this point in time, I just want to say a big thank you to two of my distinguished guests over here, Cassandra and James. It's been a wonderful time talking to both of you. I learned so much about the wonderful work that you're doing, and I hope that you will continue to bring benefits to the people in your community. And to all our audience, thank you so much for your participation. I hope you have learned as much as I do. And if you're interested to learn more about our projects, please go to the web pages that they talked about just now, and also to the UN Space for Persons with Disabilities Project. So thank you so much, and I hope all of you will have a good day at the Zero Conference. Thank you. Thank you.
recognized and valued, regardless of formal education. This is exactly the competence of the profil pass, the unique vision of this transformative tool developed by the German Institute for Adult Education. Welcome to our chat. We will share insights from unique experiences with this transformative tool that helps to identify competencies and skills acquired through lived experiences, formal education and work experiences. I'm Renate Bauer-Richter, Director of the Institute for Inclusion and Accessibility in the United Arab Emirates, and I'm speaking with Manuela Scheurecker, a Profil Pass user and a, um, a catering professional. Just a short word about Profil Pass. You are a huge fan. That's true. Um, that's true. I'm a, a huge fan of the Profil Pass because it's just a unique tool to, um, to in a holistic and strength-oriented way to identify um, the personal strengths and skills to uh, for for the whole life, not only the job. That's wonderful. Um, you summarized already the vision of the Profil Pass and to describe the concepts, I like to use the acronym ACME. So this stands for Awareness, Consulting, Mapping and Empowerment. And when we look at those um, process steps, awareness and counseling is combined and pr um, really supported by qualified consultants with a background in social science or social work. But the beauty of Profil Pass, as you mentioned, is a very self-guided process. So the participant is always in the driver's seat and this is already a huge part and key success factor of the empowering that is really happening through the process. So we have the awareness and the counseling and then we have the aspect of mapping mm -hmm. where you will talk about it in a very systematic approach about uh, most pro um, in most cases between 6 to 12 weeks participants in small group settings are working to identify often skills that are hidden in plain sight because they were never asked mm -hmm. and appreciated for those um, skills. And then we have empowerment. And it's all about empowerment mm -hmm. and you have a very, very impressive um, experience with this empowerment. So in just in to explain this profil pass a little bit more, it's more than a tool. It's really validating lived experiences mm. of people with a broad range of abilities. Mm. And the Profil Pass initially wasn't really developed for people with um, disabilities. Okay. It was a tool to identify skills from youth, mm -hmm. those who are just embarking on their first career decisions mm -hmm. towards seniors who are identifying opportunities for the phase of the retirement. And then there's mm -hmm. this very special tool pass we are talking about, designed particularly for users with cognitive and psychosocial abilities. Meanwhile, this tool has been rolled out in six European countries okay. and now even expanding to the Middle East. So, talking about mapping and the empowerment element yeah. of Profil Pass is really important and yeah. to sh uh, look at your experiences. So the profile pass equips participants with a journey, mm -hmm. self-awareness, but mm -hmm. at the very end also with a certificate acknowledging their skills and competencies signed by a qualified consultant. So now to the practice and your very own experiences, okay. Frau Schaurecker. You're a true citizen of the world, born in Germany, fluent in multiple languages, 
dealing with psychosocial fears, you worked across continents as a volunteer. And mm -hmm. since 2017, you've been an integral part of the inclusive catering company, an award-winning and profit-making social enterprise, mm -hmm. which is a division of one of the um, most innovative training and work providers in Germany, the mm -hmm. EVL Werkstätten based in Bavaria. So that's, that's about you and your background. Thank you. We're really interested to hear about your very own experiences. When and how long did you work with the Profil Pass and their consultants? Okay, it was, um, uh, as you said, in a group setting. It lasted, the whole process lasted for eight weeks. We met every two weeks and uh, we were six participants, fe male, female, young, old, um, of various uh, work uh, experiences. Mm, when you look back at this group setting and you mentioned it's individual work within a group, mm -hmm. Um, what was your the moments you cherished the most through this process? The moments I cherished uh, the most was um, how that that it f that it started from the small to the large, starting at the personal interest, what gives one joy, that is never looked at elsewhere. <laughs> it is so beautiful and, and that is just in itself beautiful and that it is strength oriented to, to think about that. And uh, it's just that I mentioned that is usually forgotten. And then I cherished also, um, is, uh, um, especially looking back, that it is in the form of a booklet, that I can always look at it again and again uh, for um, to, to draw um, inspiration and uh, also support. And uh, yeah, th and the process, uh, the process of writing down mm. that is uh, so um, important. Um, if you're dealing, uh, if you are uh, a little bit uh, um, unsure of yourself l l that I was, it's just very helpful uh, to have it, um, to look at it again and again. It's very, very good. You described very vividly the, um, the advantages and the, the joy really of the having this hands-on experience yeah. um, working on uh, the booklet. Um, looking back and it's a very um, self-guided um, interaction that you have because you can decide at, wi at which part of your very own journey you fill in those specific questions. Um, there's a lot of self-reflection that is happening there, right? That's true. <laughs> and um, were you able to identify skills or competences you acquired through your lifetime you weren't aware of, that were basically hidden in plain sight, always there, but you weren't aware of? Um, um, the, important, the important thing for me is um, uh, to, to um, that that um, there is space uh, for those skills and that it is uh, um, uh, so the f um, that it is space that we because I I I, I knew I, I did that well but I never uh, I d it, it is it was very supportive and and uh, what was actually a very good experience and uh, uh, I think very important for me was uh, the, um, uh, the thing of the two lists uh, uh, of the home of the homework yeah I do remember <laughs> in um, you you told me about it so there's this element of self-evaluation mm -hmm. right of your strength yeah and abilities that you fill in, 
Mm -hmm. And there's then always also the element of inviting a trusted source from yeah. your very own network yeah. to do the same and evaluate the same skills. So and then you have basically a dialogue between your self-evaluation and the feedback of a trusted um, partner or um, supporter. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think this was what you were referring to, right? Yeah. As part of the uh, assignments and homeworks. Exactly. So and were there any surprising insights? So you have your own evaluation and then the evaluation of um, your um, supporter? Mm -hmm. Very much so, very much so. I, I have and I had much more of a, a strong tendency to be way too hard on myself. And, uh, and um, the, 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 the homework was the list fill in um, the the um, uh, the personal um, uh, qu um, let's say qualities of strengths in in a, a wide range of uh, of the of the personality. But were you surprised oh about the yes. differences <laughs> between your own self evaluation <laughs> and that of your um, supporter? Yes, um, uh, it's, it's very surprising because uh, uh, my supporter uh, um, uh, evaluated me um, much more capable and uh, uh, excelling in, in many, many fields. And uh, this just is a very important insight mm. for me personally, very important insight. It's very impressive, right? And a very yeah. hands-on experience that mm. weren't that wasn't possible without the profil pass because you yeah. had this very deep uh, diving journey um, towards your own experiences. And um, just in one word, uh, Ms. Schreurecker, what was the most impressive takeaway, the lesson learned from your, from this um, eight weeks um, program? The most impressive was um uh um well is was and is the s the basis is the personal strengths and it 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 goes a long way <laughs> pretty much all in life so it's uh for um for um th the process of writing down of course is essential is essential but uh the this 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 way of looking at a, a person, of looking at myself, uh, uh, also in the job, uh, and, and it's just um, incredible and very, very important, I think. Yeah. And you told me as well that the profile pass folder is still part of your bookshelf. So it's there, you can relate to it and you can really look back. That's 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 the other the other part, and that is uh, that is uh, one of the gifts from the profile pass, because it's uh, uh, mm, uh, sometimes I think uh, I myself um, too too um, mm, easily go over mm. and, and think what you know what is expected, but to have it to look at it again and again and to to draw um, strength, inspiration, and uh, support, and and uh, a tool uh, 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 to 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 draw from it uh, uh, at several times in life. I find it Wonderful. Very, very beautiful. It's really a powerful testament to the transformative um, tool that the profile pass really provides for broad range of yeah. people. Ms. Schreurecke, on behalf of our audience, a huge thank you Come for on. sharing your personal experiences and insights with us okay. here in Vienna and reflecting on those discussions we had at the Zero Conference on the future of work. It's obvious that we need new tools responding to those requirements that we are facing artificial intelligence, a new way of um, collaborating. So the profile pass offers such a pathway. Mm. It's a robust and evidence-based empowerment for the new world of work. And I think you are really an incredible ambassador of the profile pass. Thank you, Farsha You're welcome. Thank you.
I'm very happy that I could share my appreciation of the Fulfill Pass and my experience and my thoughts. So welcome, welcome to the next fireside chat. And I promise you, this one is full of fire. 
and it's full of chat. <laughs> um, we are here in Austria, in Vienna, at the UN building, talking about a subject that needs to be spoken about more and more across the world, but particularly in the UN, and that is fashion. With me, I have Jasmine from the We Dress Collective, and we're going to delve straight in. I, I want to do less talking, um, because I've been doing quite a lot of talking. I want to hear from you. Like, want to hear what about your journey, how you, how you created this startup, what motivated you? Because when I saw the We Dress Collective, I was really surprised that no one had done this before. Like, it's one of those ideas that's so simply brilliant. Why didn't anyone do it before? So please tell us your journey. Thank you, Rama, and thank you, uh, all of you, for being here. So, um, yeah, what is WeDress Collective? Uh, it might make sense to start here. We're actually a peer-to-peer -peer platform for fashion rental. Um, just to give you a little bit of more context, um, like the Airbnb of fashion, with the vision to make uh, the fashion world more inclusive, more sustainable, and more circular. And um, actually we started because, as you might know, the fashion world is one of, or fashion as, a, as, a, as an industry, is one of the most polluting ones in the world. So uh, actually fashion is accountable for 10% uh, of global CO2 emissions and actually for 92 uh, million tons uh, per year being disposed to landfill of textile waste and so on and so forth. So I can talk about this for an hour. But what <laughs> fashion does as well is fashion is one of the most discriminatory uh, industries that we have on this planet. And um, I think peer-to-peer -peer fashion rental is not the innovation here. Um, I think what is that makes this so special, what we do at WeDress, is because very early in the days, I understood that fashion has this problem with diversity and inclusion. And of course, you can see it from more on vogue topics, like we talk about skin color, we talk about sizing, we talk about lots of things, but we don't talk about disabled people. And so I was like, okay, we're a startup, we're very young, we want to talk about diversity and inclusion, so we need to address people with disabilities as well. And this is what we did from the start. So why is it, you've touched on a really important point here. Like we talk about age, we talk about gender, we talk about race. Why is disability left behind? Good question. Um, I do believe um, disability inclusion does not have the best lobby, at least yet. And I think it has not been perceived as a cool and a sexy topic. Um, and I think this is something that we want to change, right? Yeah. So, um, of course, we could talk about uh, a lot of barriers when it comes to scalability in a, in a fashion label. And I think the two of you, Sorama and Samantha, who is in the audience, um, talked about this yesterday on your panel. Um, what are the financial barriers, maybe the business barriers? Um, but again, we are a startup, we're very young, and what we want to do is we want to include it right from the start, so it doesn't get to the point that we need to talk about budgets, because we're just doing it naturally. Absolutely, because I, I think, um, you know, yesterday you mentioned, Samantha, um, we were being interviewed by the wonderful Caroline Casey, um, and, you know, Samantha's work is very much around bringing the visibility of disability um, into fashion. And I always feel fashion design is lagging behind product design, service design. Um, we were talking about education yesterday. Like, when you create a fashion startup, are there tools, is there information that's out there that can support you in how to address, uh, pe include people with a range of abilities? Or was it very much a case of going out and finding out and doing it yourself? I think it's the latter, to be honest. Um, so you need to dig very deeply to actually find the answers. Um, but let's get back in time. So it was 2021. I understood, OK, we have a, we have a topic here, and I want to make it the center of attention of WeDress. 
So what I did is I uh, actually found out, okay, we need to make our website accessible, but because we're a web platform, so right, so this is where we need to start. So we, need, we made our first steps here. Then I started to reach out to fashion brands that are already doing important work in that field and are not too visible, in my opinion. So started to actually list these brands on our platform. And then um, I was like, okay, um, what else can we do? So this was what I could do by myself. And then I was trying to find information about, okay, how could we get the website to being more accessible? Really difficult topic. So not that, um, you know, there is so much information around. So I think this is the first. And the second, um, I think, is also talking about investment. You know, so um, we are a startup. So we're in this typical journey of raising funds and raising money. And so it was really interesting when I was talking to our uh, investors or interested investors, um, explaining that now we are actually very much uh, focusing on, on inclusion and accessibility. And we're like, no, Yasmin, please focus on one topic and not on many. I was like, I'm not focusing on many topics. I'm just <laughs> making a website and a platform accessible because this should be the bare minimum. I mean, what are we talking about, right? And this is, in my opinion, what we need. This is the spirit that we need um, because then um, something like what I did could happen that I went to our public funding agency, the Vienna Business Agency, who has a stand here as well. And I was like, hey, guys, um, please, whenever a startup comes to you and um, wants funding, please make them understand that when they, for example, when they want to build an app, make the topic of accessibility a topic. Make them understand that this is the bare minimum that they need to deliver. So we need to start where the money comes from, right? And you touch on a really important point there. I mean, your, your enthusiasm just Sorry. comes through the screen. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's why I said there's a lot of fire here. Um, there's a lot of entrepreneurs there. There are a lot of people who will have ideas. Um, do you have any tips or tricks or advice for them on how to pitch the business? Because looking at your website, there's some amazing names there. You know, you can, you can, you can get... Um, a branded bag or jacket for the hire, the, you know, the, the hire of seven euros a day, nine euros a day. I don't know what my jacket would be worth, probably minus seven euros. <laughs> I, I got it in a very funny place. But um, what are the sort of tips and tricks? Because you're, you're, you're a very persuasive person because it feels like your passion comes through. But what would you say to other entrepreneurs who have that inkling of an idea and want to go out and talk to the fashion houses or talk to uh, venture capitalists or funders? Irritate them, <laughs> inspire them, take them on your journey. Um, I have an anecdote here. So last year I was invited to LVMH, Station F, that's the innovation incubator of LVMH in Paris. And uh, I was invited to pitch and I pitched WeDress and of course I explained we we're making the fashion world more inclusive, more circular and so on and so forth, what you just heard. Um, and then we dived a little more deeply into the topic of what is actually diversity and inclusion and they were of course thinking about age and, and gender and, and skin color. And I was like, no, can we please talk about disability inclusion? And they were like, what? <laughs> Excuse me? So what is it that you're doing? So I irritated them. And irritation is the start of change. You need to irritate people, but don't leave them alone. So what I would suggest or what I would advise is irritate people, inspire them with your solution and show them how it can work for the fashion world, in my case, of course. So I was trying to make them understand we, have, we had some fashion shows in the past and we got very cool media coverage and I showed them our fashion shows and how aesthetically appealing they were. So they were inspired by that. And this is what you need to do in my opinion. And I know that not every person can be inspiring, you know, it's not, not, not everyone has it in there. But just find that one person that can do that for you and let them do their job. I, I love that because one of the things I found is you find that lone wolf who wants to make a difference who wants to change fashion or their business. And um, I've just got to ask you this. Can you give us an example of how you irritated um, someone? <laughs> I'm really curious to know. 
I, I think the irritation, uh, just to going back to that, um, to that example that I just gave, was, was really, so I was explaining what we do, and it was very intuitive for, for people, right? So, okay, renting and, and lending and making fashion more, more circular. But then this, like, topic of accessibility and inclusion was the irritation here, because typically when we talk about circularity, we don't talk about accessibility. And the irritation was to bring that in, and to combine it with sustainability. So we're not talking in, in silos. Um, we're, try we're trying to actually break these silos and to make um, the fashion world circular and accessible for everyone. And so this was the irritation. So you, you see, you don't need to do much to irritate people, you know, especially in the fashion world, let's be honest. Um, so <laughs> you might know that. Um, so, so this, this information, this piece of information was enough to, to irritate them. Um, but again, what I think is important to not leave them alone with this kind of irritation and let them wonder, okay, what is it that this woman is doing? But to really take them on the journey um, and, and your understanding of, of change. That, that, uh, that, I think, is such a powerful piece there because um, the journey of change, part of it is storytelling, but it doesn't have to live there. And the thing that really stood out for me there is the linking to sustainability. Quite often we talk about environmental sustainability, but linking it to social sustainability, linking it to in, in inclusivity to some of those ideas can be hugely powerful. And it is one of the three pillars after, after all. So I think I um, want to switch a little bit, you know, the closing minutes, to how has We Dress been received? What do people say about it? I mean, generally speaking, um, I think we need to look at different geographies. In general, people are open to renting and lending. I think it depends on the geography of your market. Um, I mean, you live in the UK, so you might know that renting is really uh, a thing over there. And we're trying to bring the same spirit to the rest of the European Union. Um, but again, here we're building a market. So unfortunately, consumerism uh, out there has been nourished with a lot of overconsumption and, and so on and so forth in the past years by fast fashion companies. So we're basically competing against fast fashion companies. Um, and, and that's not an easy task to do. So you need a lot of patience and perseverance in order to do that. Um, but yeah, we're doing it. And are we seeing a sort of generational change um, you know, so people, less and less people are getting their driving license, less and less people are looking at owning a car or owning a house, for example. And those sort of things that we were taught maybe in the 70s, 80s, 90s of, you know, I think the British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, once famously said, if you're still riding the bus when you're 30, you failed. You know, you should, be, you should have a car um, and if you don't own your house. I think there was something along those lines. But... Are, are, are you pushing against some ingrained attitudes here? And how do you address that? Yeah, definitely we do. And I think um, what we learned over the past years is that you need to be on top of people. Sounds a little tacky, but that's what you need to do. So you, you need to be everywhere and to really you know, follow up on people. So they might hear that there is a rental uh, opportunity or you can rent, but then you need to follow up and follow up and follow up again. And so this typically costs money, right? And this is where uh, also a problem comes in that there is not enough money in the market um, to actually invest into startups that are trying to create a better world um, by offering solutions like ours. So what I learned is if you want to establish a new routine, and this is what we're basically trying to do, we're trying to change consumer behavior, and that's a hard task right? Um, again, competing against uh, established brands. But um, yeah, establishing a routine uh, and, and doing the same things over and over again. I know that sounds a little, uh, I don't know, not too entertaining, but that's in the end what changes consumer behavior. Yeah, I think it in ingrains patterns and patterns are what people default to. So would you say we dress is, is you know, I, c I can call it many, many different things, but I think, you know, uh, sorry, not, an not any rude names or anything like that, but um, it's, what really interests me is that little bit of human behavior 
And was there a particular moment when you had an insight? I always love asking entrepreneurs of, was there a single moment of, of insight or was it a group of things that f uh, sort of bled into the idea that flooded you, your system, your being, and made you want to do the idea? How did it sort of come about? I mean, the idea came up because I'm, uh I think our perfect customer, I love fashion, I have a big fashion appetite, but uh, my sustainability values are very strong. So I always struggle to combine these, these two worlds and I thought that rental would be a perfect opportunity or, or option to do it because secondhand actually did never solve my problem. So um, because you buy secondhand and it's better than firsthand, right? But in the end you're left with that piece of garment. So who solves your problem now? Um, and, and that is, is a problem in my opinion, and I made it a business. So we are nearly out of time. I'm going to give the last word to you in a moment, but something that you said there really um, uh, triggered in a positive way, which is um, you, you built this for, you know, for yourself. And one piece of advice I always talk to people about is when you create an idea, whether you're a, an entrepreneur or especially a large business, use your own product, the amount of executives that create an accessibility format but haven't actually used it. And when you challenge them to use it, they can't use it. That's also a good pitching tool because that shows them the gap that they may need you to fulfill. So final few words. Um, you know, I know irritation is something, positive irritation is something I'm taking away. What would be a final message to the entrepreneurs out there? Go out of your bubble. Uh, I think that's super important, and I think if I, if, if I had stayed in my sustainability bubble, um, I would never be here, first of all, and I would not push and, um, you know, enable the change that is happening, because, again, we're trying to change fashion, and so you need to take, to, to, to actually talk to the people that are totally into fashion and fashion crazy. So I, I love to do that, I love to create overlaps and change by that. And you need to have a lot of guts for that. You need to be a little crazy and you need to love what you do. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us here. Do check out We Dress Collective. Absolutely fantastic. And you heard it here at the UN first. Thank you so much.
Hi, and thank you for joining us um, for this excellent talk with, uh, with um, I guess, two valuable 500 uh, panelists. This is kind of, we're, we're owning, we're cornering this market, cornering if you will. It. Yeah, cornering. Um, but uh, this, is, this is a conversation uh, during which we're really going to talk about something that we're both deeply passionate about, which is synchronized collective action and its power to change the world. Uh, before we do that, uh, my name is Stefan Leblois. I'm the chief uh, community and Programs Officer at The Valuable 500. As an audio description, uh, I'm an aging white male with a silly mustache wearing a gray vest uh, and, uh, and brown shoes and jeans. Um, and to my right, uh, she's known by many names. Uh, Dancing Queen is one, Rider of Elephants is another, Disability Rights Champion, and uh, my friend, founder of The Valuable 500, Caroline Casey. And, and Troublemaker, and that and mustache is truly something. <laughs> Um, so for, for me, an audio description, um, I am a white woman with blonde hair. I'm 52, you can see the lines on my face. I've got big black rimmed glasses, and today I'm wearing an electric lemon velvet suit with a purple turtleneck. Yeah. And it is truly as loud <laughs> as it sounds. Um, so uh, without further ado, we'll just uh, get right into it. So Caroline, obviously we've heard in a, in a number of different uh, points throughout the conference and, and um, in other points throughout the year, this term synchronized collective action. And what I would want for you to do is, in your own words, talk about synchronized collective action and generally why the Valuable 500 has chosen this as our catalyst for change. Uh, well, synchronized collective action, I always feel I have to explain it away saying it's not synchronized swimming, but it kind of is based on it. The concept uh, behind it is getting 500 companies that we have created in this unique community to work on the same thing at the same time in the same way. So it's a harmonized collective action which is multiplying the impact because we're doing the same thing at the same moment. Um, and we chose this as a particular way to behave or to, to catalyze change because Creating the Valuable 500 was an extraordinary feat in itself, right? And, and we're very proud of it. But then what do you do with that huge opportunity that befits what we've done, right? And I personally, Caroline, had promised that we would never be a consultant in the space because we've got the best consultants in the space. Like, they're our friends. And I don't think adding consultancy to help business to become better. But what could we do? Well, we could convene business and to excite business and to mobilize business together to use their collective force. And so what we've identified, business helped us identify what are the top three system barriers that if we were to tackle them with the might of the 500, could we really punch a hole in this system? And they chose three. We wanted to see disabled talent into the C-suite of tomorrow. We had to, had to get underneath the lack of performance, our data on disability performance. So we've identified five metrics on disability performance that we want to see in annual reports. That's annual reports with 500 companies. And then lastly, representation. We really need to look at accurate, accessible, and authentic representation of people with disabilities in media, advertising, internal communications, external communications, and corporate affairs. So you can hear that, right? Can you imagine? But the big mic drop for us is, that's all lovely, but we need a deadline. And we need to be accountable to each other and to the community to which we are here to serve and to the business community which we're here to help. So we have created this idea called SYNC25, which is on the 3rd of December 2025 in Tokyo, where all of our valuable 500 companies have to turn up and be accountable for what they've done. And so uh, thinking about Sync 25 and the road to get there. You and I obviously know that the answer to this, but I, I would love for you to use your own words to describe, like, where do you see the disability community? Um, wh how, what, what role do they have to play in this? Well, you know, one, when I said I promised our community that we would not, you know, take money off the table and become consultants. And I was just saying to Marcy Roth how proud I am that I was able to to stand by my word, particularly when people were pushing us to, to become another consultant. The reason I didn't want to do that is because the disability community 
are out there already. These are incredible organizations. Some have been going for decades, some are newer. And that's the community of organizations that we want to help us. So we're, we're engaging and, and exciting the business community, but who are the people to help them become better? It's the community itself and it's those organizations. It's actually why it took us so long to identify what we were gonna do because of this absolute commitment to do it in partnership with the community. But another one, for example, when we're looking at the synchronized collective action, the very specific thing that we want our 500 companies to do in representation. The companies don't decide. The value of a 500 team doesn't decide. The disability community decides. I mean, the people that we're talking about authentic representation need to tell us what they want the companies to do to represent them better. So that's the kind of ways we do things. It takes a lot longer and it can be harder, but that's more honest and I hope more authentic. Um, but everything that we've done, every paper we've written, every initiative we've tried or failed with always has the community. And I mean, honestly, we have mentors around us all the time. I mean, you know that. Um, and every person in our, in our company has either direct lived experience or by one. Um, our advisory group similarly, our foundation board. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm really proud. Actually, that's the thing I think I'm proud of the most. Can, I, can we do more? Of course we can but I still believe we're doing it the right way. And so um, kind of moving towards SYNC 25, um, you know, obviously this is gonna be a, a big moment for us, a big moment for our companies, a big moment for the, the uh, disability community, many of whom will hopefully be in attendance, right, um, in Tokyo. Um, I guess, Tell us a little bit more about this this journey there, right? So we have the um, th these three pillars: inclusive leadership, reporting, representation, and within that, you've t you've touched a little bit on the white paper. You've touched a little bit on uh, our five KPIs. Um, what are some of the other things that the Valuable Five Hundred is doing uh, to advance our companies towards uh, Tokyo? Well, the first most important thing is, in the same way, in creating the Valuable Five Hundred, is actually to create a vision that's exciting and scary enough <laughs> to get people to want to try and be part of. Look, we already engaged 500 companies, we've got to do that again and it's really hard, okay? It is really hard. So we were very clear, I'm an ex-management consultant for my sins. So first we were very clear on the three problems. So they told us the three problem areas. We have, have either written or finishing off white papers which really discuss the problems that are underlying it and then we have the solution. And those solutions have been developed with the disability community. So that's kind of the, the kind of the, the map. But then we have webinars. We're gonna have master classes. At every, I hope, conference, you're gonna see valuable 500 companies grouped together to share, um, whether it's resources on self-ID or whether it's case studies that they do better. It's to get people sharing what they do. But we are here to help bring in from the community some of the greatest experts, like for example, Purple Space, Kate Nash, employee resource groups, of course we will. Um, hi, hi, Kate. Hi, Kate. Um, we're talking to Business Disability Forum. We have people like Global Disability Inclusion with Meg Ryan and Self-ID. I mean, there's so many great voices out there. So what we do is reach out into the community and put them in front of our valuable 500 companies to help them skill up and be confident as they move forward. What is our job? Is to keep beating the drum and say, you've got to come with us. You've got to come with us. You've got to come with us. Um, so we're back on the campaign route in one way, but then we're also on the delivery route, and that's a, that's quite hard to achieve. It's it's not easy, yeah. So uh, going back to this idea of accountability, uh, we'll have this moment where companies can report out on the things that they've done um, over uh, over time, um, but what is the long-term vision in terms of how the Valuable 500 will create systemic change when it comes to measuring accountability? Yeah, um, accountability, I think anybody who knows me, it's something, my voice shakes when I talk about it, it's the thing that I need and want to see most in my friends and my family and myself as an individual. When you get something wrong, you say it, and when you get something right, you celebrate and make sure you share that with everybody else. Um, one of the greatest problems is having great ideas is wonderful, but unless we actually are accountable for what we said we would do. 
So part of SYNC 25, the first day of SYNC 25, is the 500 companies have to report back on what they've done against those synchronized collective actions. And can I just say to you for a second, that will be the biggest piece of data around disability inclusion ever, right? So we will see it and what will we extrapolate from that and what will we learn from that? And even if it's not great, at least it's the truth, right? It's the truth to which we can move from. So the long-term aim with that first accountability moment, the second day of SYNC 25, will be working with the disability community, disability business experts, and the companies to say, from that data, what's the next one, two, or three synchronized collective actions? And every two years, for 10 years, we will have SYNC 27, SYNC 29, go on, go on, go on, using the accountable data to inform how we move forward. And as I said, look, I don't know. Somebody said to me, what happens if only 40 companies turn up in Tokyo? Well, shit, but that's the truth. So why didn't you turn up? So what do we learn from that? And rather than shaming people for it, is let's learn from it and find out, well, why didn't you turn up? What did we do wrong? What can we do better to ensure that SYNC 27 will happen and SYNC 29? 40 companies won't turn up, I promise you, there will be a lot more than that. But that's what I talk about accountability, is not being scared of the truth, even if it may not be what you want to hear. And to that point, I mean, um, you, you know, in the last couple minutes that we have here, we're a growing organization, and we're a relatively new organization in this space. And for any new organization, there are evolutions, challenges that come up, barriers, opportunities, um, and iterations of of what, what you are and what you're going to become. And we, we've, we've spoken about this before, but you know, and you've alluded to it a little bit at the beginning of this conversation, but for any entrepreneurs, any innovators out there who feel down on their luck because something didn't work in the first instance, um, could you tell them a little bit, or do you have a message to share around iterative progress and just change and innovation and, and kind of failing, trying again, failing, trying again? You know, I think people, when they see the valuable 500 or see a blonde woman running around in a yellow suit, think that, that it was easy. It really wasn't easy. You know, I'm 25 years an activist next year when, you know, after I came out of the disability closet and I'd had this dream about the valuable 500 for years. I had four failed attempts. I had to remortgage a home. Um, I had to literally traipse around the streets with nothing for a long time. And then you create the value of 500 and everybody goes, okay, well, that's done. You did a great job. And then this fear of not delivering on what you create. And that's why those two years were so hard because I refused to allow us to give in. When I, we didn't know, we had to fail and try and we worked with our iconic companies to try and work on those solutions. And there were moments, honestly, I mean, you know, you were in, in the team. It was, how are we going to break through? How are we going to birth this breakthrough? And it came eventually, but it came at a cost. It was really hard. And then when, we, when you got it, you knew it. And then you have to go change teams to be able to deliver on that. And that's really hard. That's the hard business. But I do remember one of my mentors saying to me, you have no business running a business if you're going to try and think about keeping everybody happy, who are you here to serve? And we are here to serve the truth, and we are here to be accountable, and we're here to serve the disability community. So we've had to make some tough calls. It's been really hard, but as I say, accountability is right at our core. Um, and I've learned a lot, and I'm still learning. Um, and a work in progress. So any entrepreneur out there, this is a 52-year-old voice wobbling, saying, keep trucking, keep going, don't give in, wear bright colors if you need to, drink some red wine, dance. I promise you, um, every small thing you do adds up eventually along the way. And don't you dare ever give in or give up. Well, in the name of iterative progress and synchronized collective action, um, I'd love to end on that wonderful and very powerful note. Caroline, thank you for this uh, conversation. Um, and um, thank you to the audience for listening.
Good afternoon. I'm Tom Butcher of the Zero Project, and I'm here virtually. Well, actually, no, I'm here in reality, but Fred Mars, founder of Journeyable, is with me virtually, sadly. Um, Fred is going to tell us about the Journeyable inspiration, how it inspires us to journey limit limitlessly. And Fred, I'm going to pass over to you to introduce the introductory video, and then we'll just settle into some questions. Perfect, perfect, Tom. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you and, and with everyone today. And as a co-founder of Journeyable, uh, we're just thrilled to be a part of uh, the conference today. So I'd like to start off with a, with a very short video of just a little bit about me and, and leading into Journeyable. Thanks so much. I'm Fred Mize Jr. Growing up, I always had an adventurous spirit, wanting to do and learn things independently. At the age of 18, I was on vacation with my family, just days before starting my first year of college. I dove into shallow water and broke my neck, instantly paralyzed from the chest down. During the first week after my accident, the doctors focused on what I couldn't do. Well, I thought differently. I got tired of hearing what they were saying, so I told them, Let's throw away the book and focus on what I can do and want to do. I quickly realized the world wasn't built for people like me. I traveled the globe during my corporate career and experienced accessibility in just about every form. I knew then that I had to use my platform to make the world a better, more accessible place for all. At times, life isn't always easy. When I need assistance when traveling or even navigating new terrain, people will show up when you least expect it. I may do things a little bit differently these days, but I'm constantly reminded that I have the power to choose how I experience life. I am empowered by my independence, my desire to explore, and to show others that so many things in life are possible. I hope to show that no matter our circumstances, we all have the power to enjoy any beautiful experience of life, even if we need a little help now and then. Thank you very much indeed. I certainly envy you going up in a helicopter and all those places you seem to be filming at. You know, location filming, one thing I'd love to do. Fred, um, I'd like to start um, with why you believe accessibility is a universal term. Wonderful, wonderful uh, to start, Tom. So um, if you think about it, and, and you know, when we started to uh, build out what we're doing at Journeyable. Uh, you know, we all, in, we, we know the numbers, you know, uh, there are about 1.4 billion people that are reported to have a disability. Uh, we think that number is actually low. Um, if you add in family members and caregivers, suddenly you're probably closer to 4 billion people. Uh, so about 50% of the population. Um, but realistically, at one point or another, all of us have had a little something, whether it's a, a, a mental challenge, depression, anxiety, something. And statistically, as we get older, especially over the age of 55, you start to experience things a little bit differently. Maybe a little trouble getting up or down the stairs, out of bed, maybe you can't hear as well. Maybe you need glasses or something else. Uh, you know, so there are lots of things. So we believe uh, that really disability, accessibility impacts everyone in the world. Great. Um, well, I'm afraid I fall into all those categories, um, being um, 68, and um, I, I don't think it's ever going to get any better, um, but at least it might stabilize a bit. So um, it's interesting you use those figures because I believe that the accessible community is really larger than any one of us understands, and it appears to be the case that you do as well. And I think it's this whole issue that when statistics get too large, they become incomprehensible. Um, would you agree? Totally agree. Um, I, I, uh, and, and we at Journey will believe that too, that, uh, you know, listen, in my travels, uh, as I mentioned in the video, uh, over my you know many 30 plus years in the corporate world and as i continue today um 
you really can't find a universally accepted standard. What does accessibility mean? What does it mean to have a disability? You know, if you travel from one country to another, uh, and, and frankly, even here in the States, you're going to get different answers. So instead of working in silos, we're, we're trying to bring everyone together, Journeyable, uh, and, and really what we've built is a global community uh, of individuals and organizations uh, and more uh, to work together. And, uh, and, and it's, um, it's exciting. Oh, I can imagine it's incredibly exciting and also incredibly challenging. Um, so my, my, my third question before diving really in, 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 in depth, um, how does Journeyable bring accessibility to the forefront? It's, it, it's, the, it's our primary focus, right? right? So um, we bring it to the forefront, uh, frankly, by, you know, th there, there's so many ways. Um, literally everything we do at Journeyable is focused on making the world a better place for everyone. So everyone can enjoy it, uh, no matter what your disability, no matter what your limitation, uh, no matter what your ability, um, no matter what your age, uh, your situation. So um, we focus on uh, making sure that people have the resources, the information uh, that, that they may need uh, on, on our platform. So if you go to our site, you can read uh, stories from uh, our, our contributors, our content contributors, uh, people that we call pioneers uh, that speak about their own experiences uh, from different aspects, different uh, perspectives, different abilities. Um, and, and that in itself is a resource for anyone who comes and reads these to maybe they have a similar situation and they don't understand or uh, maybe they are thinking about travel uh, to um, a place anywhere in the world. And so you can literally search by your, your ability, your disability, your, your situation, your destination uh, with drop down you know, menus and click throughs and, and, and find something, find some place, find someone uh, that you um, recognize or, or you, you know, align with and, and learn from their experience. And, and there's, there's so much more. I mean, um, we work with organizations. Zero Project is, is one of our partners. Thank you. Uh, and, and many of the folks that are uh, in the audience, many of the folks around the world, uh, their organizations, individuals that work with us, really to talk about why, why is it important? Uh, why is it important to really make the world accessible to all and to break down all barriers? Uh, you know, attitudinal, physical, uh, you name it, so that everyone, everyone has the ability to travel physically or even through the experience of others without barriers. Great. Thanks so much. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to go uh, back. So you bring accessibility to the forefront and through that um, you empower and um, each of the, as it were, tools on your website, I would describe as a jigsaw piece of empowerment. Um, if you were going to kind of sum up, which of the most important or are they all important to you? I think they're all important. Um, so we're empowering people uh, by, by helping them, not only to understand, but actually to, to learn from uh, you know, the content that's on our site. Yeah. Uh, they now have the ability to literally look for resources to help them book travel. Yeah. So people that we will refer them to. Um, uh, I, I think all of it's relevant. Um, you know, uh, our episodic series that we have will show people uh, how to do it. We've built a library. Uh, in addition to that, and, and thankfully to uh, one of our, actually our exclusive um, academic partners, St. Cloud State University, yeah. uh, and their Center for International Disability Advocacy and Diplomacy. Their access to all program provides uh, a badging and accreditation program to help train uh, people who are either in the industry or have an interest in the industry uh, to better work, better serve 
people with disabilities. Great. Thank you. I've, I've, someone's just flashed me the five minutes, so I've got a couple of questions. Oh, no, it's the oh, five minutes. Oh, no, don't worry at all. Um, <laughs> and they flashed me the five minutes, so I've got two questions, and then I'm going to ask you something as well. So um, I believe that um, Journeyable is holistic, so it's not just persons with disabilities, but it's caregivers, it's family, it's the whole community. Am I correct? You are correct. We're, we're literally touching... Yep. the world and we're not doing it in a silo we're very collaborative uh, we invite we welcome people organizations to join us yeah. um, and thanks to my co-founder Tony Colantonio who helped me to realize this dream a yep. little more than two years ago he's there with you today uh, and our partner Paul Cohen I hope people seek them out and, and learn even yeah. more about what Journeyable has to offer Excellent, thank you. And then my, my last question, which is, uh, it's something that I've, I've, I've had experience with and it is difficult, which is, uh, it's an intractable question, which is, how do you change the mindset to can from cannot do? Yeah, it, it, it takes education, it takes representation, it takes a lot of things. So. Um, as we all know, people with disabilities are the most underrepresented, underserved population in the world. The more that we are seeing, the more that we're showing what we can do versus what we're focusing on what we can't, we normalize the conversation. And yeah. that's where we want to get to. Uh, we do that through our content on Journeyable. Yeah. We do that through our stories, our videos, you name it. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. We want to show people that um, at the end of the day, we're all people first. We may do things a little bit differently, um, but, you know, we're all in this together. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to ask a question that I always ask um, because we've got about, no, we haven't got 0 0.2 seconds, which is if there's one thing that you want um, the viewers and the people who are sitting in front of me here in the UN to take away with them, what would it be, Fred? Is that let, let's collaborate. Let's work together. Join our community at Journeyable. Go to our website. Contact us. Let's not work in silos. Let's work around the world together to make this happen. Great. Fred, I am only displeased that you're not here and I can't meet you in Next person. Next year, Tom. A absolutely. I mean, it's not even second best seeing you on the screen there, especially as you're amongst about seven panes on the screen. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Where am I speaking to? Where are you? Um, we're here in Wilmington, Delaware in the US. Yep. Uh, and uh, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity. Thank you for having us. And uh, we look forward to working together going, you know, in the future. Great. And we too. Fred, thanks so much. Look after yourself and happy journeying. Thank you so much. Bye. Take care. I will. Bye -bye. Or I'll try. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you.
Hello and welcome live from the Zero Project Conference 2024 at the Vienna International Center. My name is Anna. I'm the Director for Business Partnerships and Operations within the Zero Project team. And I'm very happy to welcome today for this fireside chat uh, two very close partner organizations of the Zero Project, the Vienna Business Agency and Access Austria. So in this fireside chat, we will find out three or more reasons to expand to Vienna. But before we dive into our conversation, I would like to do a first quick introduction round. Perhaps Jan, you could, you would like to start? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Jan. I'm working for the Vienna Business Agency and this for the last 12 years. I'm working in the department called International Business. So my role is supporting international companies and individuals uh, if they set up a business here or if they come here for work. Hi, my name is Silvia. I work in the technology services department of Vienna Business Agency uh, and I'm uh, focusing on assistive technologies and social innovation. Okay, my name is Klaus Hackner. I'm the head of the Austrian Association supporting the blind and visually impaired. Here I'm in my role as Access Austria. Access Austria is the umbrella of our organization and the brand of uh, the Austrian Association supporting the blind and visually impaired. I'm from background, uh, I'm coming out of uh, software industry uh, and all the things that are uh, connected with power interest, interests me <laughs> to help people with disabilities. Okay, message received. <laughs> so thanks a lot for this uh, short introduction. So my first question is uh, for Jan. So what do you think are the main reasons for expanding a business to Vienna? Sorry. Um, no worries. So, um, of course, my job is um, um, telling international companies or individuals why they should expand here. And, of course, there are some, some, some specific um, factors. Um, first of all, it's in the heart of Europe. So it's very central. Um, if you take a map of Europe, Austria is just there. Vienna is just there. And... So the connections are really good. Flying from here uh, to all major uh, European capitals within three hours. And nowadays, going by train is really easy as well. So you can easily go to Bratislava, Munich, uh, to Prague, Berlin. This is all doable. So from a geographical uh, perspective, it's really good some setting something up here because it's easy to reach all the other markets around Austria as well. And Austria is in the lucky position of having eight neighbors. Mm -hmm. And I think this is kind of quite of unique, yeah, uh, and a, uh, not even just in, in Europe, but in mm -hmm. uh, globally seen as well. Mm -hmm. So if you do business in, in Austria and in Vienna, you can easily access other markets as well. Um, you can do easily do business with the Dach region, which includes Germany, which is a huge market. Um, we share the same uh, business tradition as well. Um, what also speaks for Vienna as a hub is it is connecting Eastern European economies and the Western European ones. So, and this is open in both ways, what we can see now. Because Vienna is kind of, m from a tradition, linking the m mentality of both ways. Yeah. So, uh, and you, you, you can see that by just walking the streets, hearing the people speak. So you will hear Hungarian, uh, Czech, Romanian, mm -hmm. but also English, French, Spanish. Yeah. It's a very international city. Mm -hmm. And as a market, it is big, it is mm -hmm. two million now. With the metropolitan area, it's two and a half up to three million. Uh, and it's also easy to access talent here. So there were 200,000 students here, 10% of the population are students. So it's a young city and it's a growing city. Mm -hmm. And it's attracting uh, people from all over the world. Um, how much more time do I have? Because I can go on. <laughs> so perhaps let's give a little bit <laughs> yes, more I think time so. to your colleague, Silvia. So we've heard already quite some reasons <laughs> to why you should expand your business to Vienna. Um, but what about Vienna's ecosystem for social business and also assistive technology, Silvia? 
Yeah, uh, together with uh, startup services in Vienna Business Agency, we offer some uh, very nice welcome programs for international startups to come to Vienna, for example, the Discover Vienna program or the startup package. And within the Discover Vienna program, we uh, invited uh, 10 international startups in cooperation with Zero Project, thankfully. Uh, and uh, we uh, give them the opportunity to learn more about the ecosystem in Vienna and to uh, connect with uh, very important partners also, like Access Austria, for example, uh, and, and other relevant players and stakeholders in the field. Uh, I try to, to find uh, good partners for them in, in social organizations, for example, sometimes also in the health sector. Uh, there are many, many opportunities. And I also brought with me, if you want to have a, a small glimpse, uh, what, uh, what happens in the field of assistive technologies. In Vienna, you could grab one of these technology reports of Vienna Business Agency. And we are focusing also on uh, many different technology fields, which could also be very interesting. Thanks a lot, Silvia. So if I may add uh, so just one or two sentences, we're very thankful for this cooperation with the Vienna Business Agency. So we already had uh, several uh, programs of the Discover Vienna Zero Barriers. And uh, just uh, yesterday, we had a very interesting session with all the innovations that came to Vienna. And it was a really great networking event. And really, thanks uh, thanks a lot for this for this very nice and, and uh, cooperation. And I think uh, we really like working together. And perhaps also, uh, information for those who are here uh, at the Vienna International Center. The Vienna Business Agency has a booth next to the Zero Project reception desk, so visit them there, and I think you can also get this report on assistive technologies there. Thank you. So, Klaus, um, perhaps you could give us one or two, or even more, examples of successful uh, implementation of businesses uh, in Austria. So, uh, businesses who uh, came to Austria to uh, open up a subsidiary or similar. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I have to thank Zero Project and I have to thank the Vienna Business Agency for supporting us. Without the network, it would not be possible to bring uh, companies from abroad here to Vienna uh, because uh, the, the cost of searching all these uh, all these companies is very high normally and they doing the pre-selection and they bring them to Austria to, to give them a little bit of taste of Austria to see how they can settle down here uh, and we have the opportunity to, to fish in the pool uh, of all these companies that come to Austria there or they that come to Zero Project to present themselves because they think they are real, the favorites, uh, they, 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 they not the favorites, they, 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 the front runners in, in ICT. What I'm looking for, what we are looking for at Zero, uh, not at Zero, at uh, <laughs> Access Austria. A very close partner, Access as you Austria can see. <laughs> As access <laughs> Austria, yeah. Uh, we are looking for solutions that want to settle down here in the European region and we want them to open uh, the European uh, market uh, as sellers of products of assistive technologies uh, to earn, really to earn money. Yeah. It's not about social things, it's not about a non-profit, it's if you have a product when you think that this product is really uh, able to be sold on a market and to be bought by a target group mm. uh, which is big enough to make you sustainable, mm. then you can come to us and mm -hmm. we can help you to settle down here, to cope with all the administ administrative talks, uh, tasks. Yeah? There are enough of it, yeah, believe me, yeah. yeah. Even if it's much more easier than 20 years before or mm. 10 years before, yeah. yeah? Uh, and we have in the portfolio some people that help us. Uh, and we have in the portfolio some companies that are settled down uh, successfully. One of them is Planet Abled, for example. Planet Abled is a company from India with Neha Aurora. Uh, they are doing inclusive uh, traveling for persons with and without disabilities. That means they don't they don't separate the people. It's not traveling for blind, traveling for mobility constrained persons, traveling for deaf and hard of hearing. No, all together, Inclu really inclusive travel. Yeah. 
we think this is a target group for the future when we look uh, at the population uh, here in Austria in 10 years we will have 35 percent of the population age uh, the, the, uh, older older than older than 65 uh, and that's one of the real target groups that we have and the other one is from uh, from uh, Kenya Brian Wenda uh, with his census hub and with another uh, with another product that he has for mobility uh, routing for persons, uh, for blind persons, uh, by vibration. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are the test area here in, in, in Vienna. We want to make it uh, profitable for the rest of the market in, in, in the European Union and to help him. Uh, but we also look to, to Africa, we look to India. Are there other countries? Are there other, so are there other companies? Are there other startup centers uh, that concentrate on the, in the field of assistive technologies that can produce new uh, companies that have new invita invitations, uh, not invitations, invasion, in, in, in blah, 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 my yeah. English, innovations. innovations, innovations. It's been a long day already, blah, 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 so we fully day, yeah. understand. Uh, innovations, yeah, that we can bring also to Austria. So if I may add, both of these organizations are present at the conference uh, this year. Planet Able also has been an, a former zero project FOD. Uh, so Jan, you, you didn't have a lot of time at the beginning. Is there anything that you would like to add when it comes to reasons why companies should expand to Vienna? <laughs> um, yes, and this is the support of uh, governmental agencies. <coughs> so. I always advise companies, when they approach me for the very first time, have a look around, shop around, see what agencies are out there. They are normally operating cost-free, and there is no pressure behind them, and they will give you uh, good advice and point you in the right direction. So always have a look around, see what agencies are out there, contact them, and take their advice. Um, here, of course, we have the Vienna Business Agency, and we can point you to wherever. And yeah, we are, we are kind of a neutral partner in there. And of course, now speaking for other countries as well, those agencies <laughs> exist in other countries as well. So shop around, see what is best for you, where you can uh, uh, settle and establish your business. But of course, I would prefer here in Vienna. <coughs> Thanks a lot. Anything you would like to, to add to, this, uh, to these points? Silvia, anything you would uh, like to add? regarding the additional services from the Vienna Business Agency. Yes, I come with every question you have, with every request you have, uh, contact us. Uh, we always try to find very good contacts for you and also funding opportunities uh, uh, for on the federal level and, and also in, in Vienna. And we uh, really like to welcome you here. Thanks a lot. Klaus, anything you would like to add as some closing words? Yeah, the famous last words. Yes. Believe, <laughs> 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 believe in the power of network. Yeah, Speak to the other people, speak to the agencies, speak to the companies, speak to organizations like Zero Project. Uh, you will find the right partner. Yeah? It's, always a, it's always a question of uh, how many contacts uh, do I have uh, and how many of these contacts can help me uh, speak to them. Mm. Network, that's yes. the power. That we know at the Zero Project, definitely. So perhaps we could also uh, already talk about the next conference. It's certainly coming up uh, 2025. And I guess that there will also be a Discover Vienna Zero Barriers program. So watch, watch out for that. And uh, you, you can definitely um, get a lot, of, a lot of interest in contact if you, um, if you apply for this, for this project. And yes, uh, we will definitely continue this, uh, this conversation uh, a little bit longer but unfortunately we need to close this fireside chat now already so thanks a lot for uh, coming to this conference for being our partners since so many years already it was really a pleasure meeting you here and uh, have a lovely uh, day at the conference another day tomorrow and to all the all our viewers at home we say thanks a lot for joining us uh, online stay tuned there are another uh, fireside chats coming up also tomorrow a lot of uh, interesting conversations to follow and uh, I wish you a lovely day and um, goodbye. <laughs> Ciao.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Zero Project Fireside. It's the second day of the of the conference. We are having an, an amazing crowd here, as uh, as usual. And I have the immense pleasure uh, to have an, unfortunately, only an online interview with uh, with Deborah Rue. It's really a pity uh, that you cannot be with us, uh, but uh, we totally understand uh, your reasons. It's good to see you. Hi, Deborah. Hello, and I, I hate that I can't be there in person too. My um, my daughter Sarah, who has Down syndrome, um, she's just dealing with a lot of pain right now. So the doctors are working with me, and um, and actually the good news is she's feeling a little bit better. So um, that's fantastic. But I'm <laughs> sad I can't be there in person. That's good to hear, Deborah. We know each other for for several years, and you are one of the of the leading activists in the in the, in the field uh, maybe let's talk a little bit about uh, about numbers about you know let's say uh, the disability community please elaborate a little bit well, the community, we are a very large community, and a lot of that is because of the legislations and the way it has been defined if you have a disability. And sadly, disability definitions are different. We have a different disability definition under the Americans with Disabilities Act as opposed to looking at the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, but regardless of what definition you look at, we are at least a billion strong. And so I think it's really time that the grass movement's efforts of bringing our billion strong community together to really support each other, um, champion the employers that are trying to include us, getting behind um, efforts like Zero Project. I think that um, it's very obvious there's never been a more important time than taking all of those numbers and bringing us together. But at the same time, something else to consider is we are aging. All of our societies are aging dramatically. And so as we age, I know according to the American Association of Persons with Dis excuse me with for retired persons AARP 67% of their members have disabilities so we have people joining our community every single day Thank you Deborah and just to do a little bit of the of the math the billion uh, is 15% of the of the world population which, which makes up a billion persons with uh, with disabilities uh, around the globe uh, you mentioned legislation. I know you have the, the ADA since more than 30 years. Uh, the European community in introduced the first piece of legislation in the 2000s, and, uh, and next year we're looking forward to the European Accessibility Act, which is basically uh, another extension to it to, uh, to certain products, above all digital uh, products like TVs, like uh, all of the smartphone communications, which is also a very uh, Im Im important step. How do you see and what's the obstacle between, let's say, the law and the real implementation? Well, I think we have a lot of laws, and I think it's great that more legislation is being put in place and that we're seeing a lot of, for example, leadership in countries like the EU, Canada, and others. But the reality is we have a lot of laws in place that are not being followed right now. And so a lot of the technology, the digital, the artificial intelligence, even the built barriers, the built barriers that we're seeing in the environments, um, these laws do not seem to be leading to real change for our community. And there's a lot of efforts being made all over the world to make sure that we are fully included and yet we ha are being excluded like never seen before. We are still not being fully included in the employment realm. We still don't even know who we are as a community. Um, they, there's infighting between the communities. So I think it's really important in that we take almost a step back and say, and first of all, appreciate and applaud the laws that are being created for us to make sure we're included. But I think we got to do a better job of the community actually coming together and really supporting each other. We're over a billion strong. If we could actually employ each other, come out and own our own lived experiences with disabilities, be proud of our lived experiences, be proud of our loved ones that have these amazing skills because they're humans that might have lived experiences with disabilities. But I just don't think that the legislation is going to is going to solve the problems. I don't think actually the corporations are going to solve the problems. I think the community has together has to really come together in a more meaningful way, a more inclusive way. We need to support the groups that are actually supporting us, like Zero Project, which is one reason why I always stand behind what you are doing. But we need to be more discerning about who is including us and who isn't. But we have to include ourselves. 
Deborah, I'm sure uh, as an as an activist for so many years, uh, you you have a roadmap. So how how can we achieve this uh, uh, to overcome this challenge between, let's say, uh, the legislation in theory, uh, but uh, that we really reach the community who needs it most? What's uh, what's your roadmap? What's the strategy? Well, I think the roadmap is once again we need the legislation. We need everything that's happening, but. For us to think that society is going to change because we have laws, uh, I think we can look at a long, long history of how that has not worked. So my strategy has always been, when I, I was very proud to be one of the leaders that helped Dr. Caroline Casey get uh, corporations to the, fi the valuable 500. Why did I do that? Well, I thought, my gosh, if corporations understand the value of truly including us, this is a win for all of us. And it is, but at the same time, I think what we've done with a lot of these business-to-business -business organizations, the Valuable 500, Business Disability Forum, Disability, and there's other amazing ones, we are sort of asking them to make sure the corporations change society. When actually we, as the human beings, as the individuals, we're the ones that need to change society. So what my game plan is that we come together and we convene. I've done it by using a hashtag, we are billion strong. And I'm amazed at the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that are joining us every day because a lot of us in the disability community are not really feeling heard. We're just really not feeling heard. And we don't, we see a lot of activities. We see trillions of dollars are spent on making sure that humans are included. I mean, if you think about our healthcare, our education, and yet it doesn't get to the people that actually need it. We are still seeing record unemployment rates, uh, people with disabilities not in education. Once again, very, very grateful and thankful for Zero Project because you're actually helping us solve these problems. But we're seeing a lot of organizations that are supposed to be supporting people with disabilities not doing that. So um, part of the game plan is making sure that more of us people come together to support each other and to also help other organizations maybe that aren't as being as effective at including us to make sure that they're including us as well. So I think the game, game plan has to be something that I think you are doing a good job at at Zero Project. We have to collaborate. Deborah, this year our topic is education and uh, and ICT, and as you know, we have subtopics in in defining and, and breaking down this this big subject. So it's from early childhood intervention until u university uh, or vocational training uh, and uh, and education. You mentioned before uh, that basically age also implies almost immediately, or at least two thirds. Uh, to a disability, where is basically the the strategy for the for the education? Is is billion strong uh, also active? Let's say in the student sector, uh, in the schools. How does this work? And that is a really really great question. Thank you so much. Education is critical, and it always has been. We have not prioritized education as a world, I believe. Certainly my country, my beautiful country in the United States, I think we could do a much better job of supporting um, education across the board. But I, I know the education that my daughter, born with Down syndrome, experienced in the United States. I know the realities of what's happening in education, as many of us do. And um, I know how talented our educators are, but they are not being given the support they need to really meaningfully educate us. And so, it, and we see that disconnect when we get and try to move into the workforce. And so I think what we need to do is we need to use these times to really change the way the world is working. We need to use the times of artificial intelligence. Now, what I want, we all want, hopefully, artificial intelligence that is not biased, unconsciously or consciously biased. We all want AI for good, AI for all. What I don't want is we don't want to, uh, you know, gamify loneliness or think that you can just give me a piece of technology and I'm magically healed. We don't want that. Or gamifying mental health. But we could use these technologies in a way, a very powerful way that could really support our educators, support the way our ch children learn, appreciate that children are different learners. We know so much data now, and we could use the technology and the artificial intelligence together to support our teachers and support our school systems and our educators. 
Um, we also need to come together more. We need to listen to our OTs, our PTs, our, our speech therapists, our different therapists. We need to allow more of the educators to come into these conversations because often we see large amounts of the stakeholders being left out of the conversations and we're seeing the results of not having the needs met because, met because of that. Deborah, we are basically, we left a, a pandemic uh, behind us, which was really uh, a disruptive force for, for, for many of us, which led you know, to a lot of, of negative uh, things, but a lot of positive things. I think, uh, you know, MS Teams calls or, or Zoom calls are not just now uh, our daily life. What was the impact also on, on people with disabilities during uh, that period and what was the learning after it? Well, I think the thing that was exciting about what we learned during um, COVID, certainly at the beginning and then as we went all the way through it, was that um, this is what we've been talking about. This is what we meant when we said people with disabilities are isolated, we're not being included. Everyone really got to experience what it meant to be isolated and not included. It's a very, can be a very hard experience. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, there was estimates that 65% of the American population would have post-traumatic stress disorder after we had walked this with COVID. Well, I, I think those numbers are pretty accurate. The, some of the data that we see, for example, in 2023, that was the largest number of suicides in the United States, just looking at one country, since we've started keeping track of this. People are really, really in very, very unhealthy, scary places. And so I think what we have to do is we have to learn. We learned a lot, like you said. We know that we can Zoom. People can actually work from anywhere. And so I think we learned a lot, but it feels also like what we're starting to do is unlearn those lessons. I see employers um, demanding that people come back to the office, whether or not it makes any sense for the position. I see employers stretching their, you know, their big muscles and saying, we're going to lay you off now. Okay, okay. But we actually, as a community, we are watching in a way that has never been watched before. So I know that the, you know, a lot of these leaders, these big leaders that think that they can just keep excluding us with no consequences. I think they're gonna be surprised at what happens in society. We're seeing it happen right now, the reveals. They, we're seeing you know, institutions break down. We're seeing it happen right now. But I think, I hope that we can continue to learn the lessons, the valuable lessons we learned during the COVID times. Technology was a blessing during those times. It helped. I, I mentioned on Access Chat the other day that if, it, if we didn't have Amazon in the United States, once again, just looking at my lens, it would have been much more difficult for us to stay away from each other. So, and I'm not saying Amazon's the answer. I'm just saying that technology can really help us make sure that we improve the lives of everybody and keep us safe, especially during times like that. Deborah, you are an ambassador of the of the Zero Project, and uh, and you have excellent contacts also, where, which we benefit from uh, to the corporate world. How do you see? Is there you know is there a, a change in sight, or what's uh, what's the corporate uh, what are corporations uh, thinking about person with disability? Of course, with the background of the employment topic. Well, I um, I think that there's a mix of that. I see some corporations that are really really very committed to us. But I see a troubling amount of people, uh, corporations, backing off of the commitments that they've made to us. Um, so, and we see um, our population being, you know, targeted for more layoffs than others. We see people of a certain age, age being targeted. So, um, I think that it's going to be really tough times. And uh, but I also think what I'm seeing from the corporations that I believe are leading, um, they are looking at this as an also as an opportunity because they're going to have to. Everybody's going to have to do things differently. That's just the realities of our time. But I think more corporations. This is why I'm always in cor encouraging corporations to attend the Zero Project. I want you corporations to understand who our community is. One way you can do that is by going to a conference like Zero Project with all the different projects happening. And so I think that you're going to find that a lot of these employers, at least the ones that I'm watching, the big brands and the engaging with, 
they're getting more discerning about how they're going to spend their money and what they're going to do to include us. They want to get more clever. They under, they're starting to understand technology isn't the only answer, but let's take technology and start collaborating and figuring out ways that we can do these things better. So it's I see it on both ends. I see some corporations doing a wonderful job, but there's quite a few that are starting to say things like, oh, this woke stuff. And, and we're watching as a community and that's one reason why we're also gathering. We are billion strong. And we the only way that we can support the real change and real inclusion is if we come together. So as as these times dictate that we have to pay attention in a different way, I would say to the corporations, I need to encourage all of the corporate brands to get more involved with our community, which means I want to see you at Zero Project. I want to see what you're doing. I know that Indeed, just give a little shout out for them, they're at Zero Project this year. Really like to see new corporate uh, corporations coming and engaging with our community. Um, but we're seeing corporations actually pull back as well, and we're noticing that as well. Just as a, as a community, we're noticing it. Thank you so much, Deborah. We could, we could, could, could go on for hours. Uh, as you know, but it was a great uh, call to action because our, our next year's topic is employment. Uh, and, uh, and let's hope some of the, of the guys and, uh, and people out there are listening. Uh, always a pleasure. Uh, stay well and uh, hope we see each other soon. Uh, this was a fireside talk with Deborah Rue, uh, the initiator of a Billion Strong, a very important disability movement. And uh, you're watching Fireside Chats from the Zero Project Conference 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Bye bye.
Welcome. My name is Ashley Lance, and you are joining us for Creating Value Through Disability Inclusive Supply Chains in our fireside chat. Again, my name is Ashley Lance. I am a senior policy advisor at the Harkin Institute for Public Policy and Citizen Engagement um, in the United States. I identify as a middle-aged white woman with non-apparent disabilities. I am wearing black rimmed round glasses and a very monochromatic blue outfit. Uh, and I'm also smiling and feeling very excited to be joining you today um, and to our online audience. And I'm going to turn it over to my co-host to introduce himself. Um, great, I am uh, Victor Khaleesi. I am a person in a wheelchair. I have uh, salt and pepper hair with glasses and I'm wearing clothes. Excellent. Mm. So I have to let you all know, Victor's a bit of a celebrity here in this space. Um, everything from, I believe, George Clooney to a spicy New Yorker, uh, Walmart representative, executive, fist bumper, high fiver, and he comes with a lot of social capital, capital and has been providing introductions to everyone around him. So, Wait, well, but you know, let's let's go back to you though. No, 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 no. Okay. We are other than being a celebrity. What else do we need to know about the one and only Victor? Um, that I am highly committed to pushing the voice of the persons with disabilities um, throughout the world and making sure that everything we do, we have a disability lens on. Excellent. And tell us a little bit about your work before working at this small little company called Walmart? Well, besides a small little company, I gotta <laughs> go back, because you yeah. know, you talk about me as a celebrity. Oh. Tell us a little bit about you and, and some of the things that you did prior to here, like Miss uh, TV personality. So I did have a short, tiny little stint in the journalism industry in small town Iowa. So, but I would say back in those days, I really wanted to like co-host the Today Show, and this feels a little bit like Oh. The Today Show. So yeah. I think we have a good co-host. I like that. Yes. Yeah, okay. So Today Show it yes. is. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, or the Victor and Ashley Show. Uh, <laughs> so my disability work has been around disability employment for the last 20 years. In the States, I am often known as M's sister. Uh, my sister M is the owner and operator of a coffee shop that you know of, um, and as well as a lot of people. So she's known from going to sheltered going from sheltered employment to being a successful business owner. And so I would say my self-employment experience often is through the lens of the pathway that my sister has taken. Yeah, so you got your own celebrity-ness too. Sort of, yes, yeah, yeah. M sister. <laughs> so Victor, talk to us about a little bit, like give us some context of Walmart. Like you've dropped some pretty big statistics when we were preparing. Yeah, um, Walmart is a, one of the largest corporations in the world, and we are retail. And basically what we do is we sell things. We sell everything from pajamas to nightgowns to food to clothing to disability-specific uh, uh, needs, such as wheelchairs, he um, over-the-counter hearing aids. You name it, we sell it. And we're an omni-channel retailer, and what does that really mean? That means that you can get to us in many different ways, okay. right? We were online before. There were other or, um, retailers doing online. We, we have in-person um, shopping. We have uh, delivery shopping. And, some, and we're doing delivery with drones. Um, and then we actually go into people's homes and deliver. And we also, which really picked up during the pandemic, is we basically shop for you. You go online. You show us what you want. You pull up to our store. And then we drop it off into your car. So there's many omni-channel uh, retail uh, ways to get to us. That's how we talk about omni-channel. And basically, if you take a dart and you throw it out the United States of America, yeah. you're going to hit a Walmart, right? And, and, and to level set here on what we are, it's not just Walmart. It's also Sam's Club. And Sam's Club is a member-based uh, shopping experience where you get basically wholesale stuff. Sure. And um, some of the numbers here are 4,616 Walmart stores in the U.S. And we're going to be building another 150 on top of that. 599 SAM clubs, which we're going to be building more of that. And that's, um, you know, that's huge. And, and if we think about the people that come and shop with us, in America, that is 140 million people per week Wow, that we that's, touch. 
That's right? just hard to imagine, right? right? Of that amount of people. And, and but it goes even bigger than that, right? We're not just a U.S. company; we're an international company. So we have five thousand two hundred ninety-four stores across the world, and about a hundred million people we touch in those stores. And we're in nineteen countries. We're in Chile, Mexico, Canada, um, Africa, mm -hmm. um, China, India. So we're all over the place. And there's more to that. We employ 2.1 million people throughout the world. And that's 1.6 million people in the United States of America. And we're the biggest employer next to government in the United States. And one of the things that uh, we're really focused on mm -hmm. is how do we, as a company, be able to make things cheaper for our customers. And we're really hyper-focused on our customer. Our customer is number one, always. Um, it's in our Walmart chat that we do all the time. You know, and we really are hyper-focused on what does that experience look like? How do we make sure that when people come into our stores and people that work for our organization belong? Because we got a big belonging strategy that, that, that we talk about. And you know, when we're looking at things, we're taking a multi-local, tailored approach and bringing the right business to the communities that we, that we serve, because I think that's really important. Um, yeah, so, so that's just a little overview. A little, yeah, uh, definitely describe you as little, <laughs> no. Uh, so thinking about Walmart and the impact, talk to us, what's the value proposition of getting a more um, diverse supply chain? Well, you know, there's, there's a lot of things, right? It's so we can bring more customers into our stores and we could reflect about the things that we sell for people with disabilities. Now, uh, and, and, and really, it's, it, and it's also about belonging, right? Because I, I think that's important. But let's go to that, that, that value proposition. I, I did have some notes here. Um, and it's really about, uh, it's really about what we can do to drive inclusion. Um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pivot to something first, and it's really about our um, about supplier diversity um, and, and how we can really drive a couple of different things, right? And selling is one thing, right? That's a value proposition, but belonging is another, which is a, another value proposition. Um, but it's about how do we represent people with disabilities? So let's talk about something we put together, a full representation of persons with disabilities. Before I started working for Walmart, there was um, a bunch of people on our associate resource group. Uh, we call employees associates at Walmart. And um, it really was about uh, what can we do to get people to shop out with us more and have that representation. And this group was working on merchandising for people with disabilities. So we started something called Adaptive at Walmart um, website. And um, I came in and we were able to to, to work across people with disabilities um, throughout the organization. But we know we had to go deeper and find out what we needed to do for the customer. We needed to reach the customer. We needed some customer insight to be able to understand that. So basically, we started something called Adaptive at Walmart. But it really is a category page on our website that sourced all the things that we were already selling for people with disabilities. And it was everything from over-the-counter hearing aids, certain foods, wheelchairs, um, grabbers, you know, um, reachers that some people needed. And then we, we uploaded that to the category page. And what we realized after we did all that is that, you know, this drives revenue, right? We raised millions of dollars just in the first few months that we were able to do that. And we know that people with disabilities existed. And we need, and we need to capitalize on that. Right. I, one of the things when we talk about statistics and numbers, but that the global spending power of people with disabilities is $13 trillion in annual disposable income. And you had talked about like a 5,000% increase. Yeah. So this is good for business. Yeah, it's really good for business. Yeah, and that was it. We, we had certain products that were... Before the website, it wasn't much. After the website, 5,000%. It's extraordinary, right? That, mean, that means people are shopping, people are paying attention. And we didn't even do much of a big push on it yet. We're going to be doing more because we want to gain more customer insight. Um, and that's important, right? Working uh, to understand. Because we, we, 
you know, I think one of the themes that we've heard through this conference was really about making sure that people with disabilities were represented in everything that we do, right? And we want to make sure that the people that we're reaching out to are getting paid for what they, what they need to do, right? Yeah. Because people with disabilities need to get paid for their jobs. Too many times and too often uh, we ask people with disabilities to do it for free. Like, that doesn't happen at Walmart. We want to make sure that we make sure that the people that are working for us and giving us the information are compensated because I think that's all part of uh, making sure um, everyone's represented. Yeah, so really thinking beyond the, like, I think so often, even earlier in my work, you think of Walmart as, oh, Walmart employs people with disabilities, but this is a different take of Walmart is contracting with businesses to help them scale, to grow as business partners. And so talk to us a little bit about how does, how does a business even get connected with Walmart? Yeah, you know, I think uh, one of the couple of important things to do is when, to mention, um, when we started the Adapt Adaptive at Walmart, it, it was also selling products, but we wanted to make sure we had disability representation, right? I mentioned supplier diversity a little bit earlier. So we went out and we got other suppliers that were selling things for and by people with disabilities, such as Limbits and uh, How I Roll, and really driving them onto our website so we, we had that disability representation from disabled-owned businesses. So uh, I think that was important. And I, and I think I missed your question on that because I wanted to get that point across. You, um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That's okay. all right, though. W w w Goes w w with the ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> so when we talk about, so let's take no limits, for example. Yeah. How, what does that process look like? Do I just go to the website and type in no limits if that's the brand that I'm looking for? No, you would go to our Adaptive at Walmart website. You'd be able to see that No Limits is there um, and then be able to click on the, the merchandise that they're selling on, a, uh, on our website. But in order to get to supplier diversity, um, yes, yeah, certainly we talk about supplier diversity. We have mm -hmm. things up on our website that talk about the inclusion of persons, um, uh, all types of um, minority and women-owned businesses and making sure dis disabled's in there. You could sign up to our website, find out all the information, that's one way to get to it. But we're actively searching for um, disabled-owned businesses to get to get into, uh, to, to, to get to us. But the problem is scaling up, right? We're, yes. And you know, how do we provide the things that they need, the people with disabilities, so we can make sure that they're supported um, in, in scaling up to what we sell? Because we sell big, right? And we sell many different ways. You can, you can sell with us at our stores. Mm -hmm. You could sell at a store. And you can sell on our marketplace, which is our website. Which um, and then we can work on figuring out how to sell with you, depending on how big you can scale. So it doesn't just have to be producing that I could sell something at five thousand stores immediately, right? Mm -hmm. So right. thinking about that, how does one how does one get connected? Unless I know Victor, how do right. I? Because it might feel a little overwhelming. Yeah, it's certainly overwhelming. And, and, and Walmart's a big place. Um, and he, here's something that I'm also going to throw out. We, we're committed to making sure that we connect to minority and women-owned businesses. And disability is part of that. And as we think about how much money we've actually spent on attracting disabled-owned businesses, it's $412 million dollars disabled owned businesses. And with that, we created 3,551 jobs through that, and we generated uh, incomes of $132 million for those businesses. Um, and, and that's disabled owned business and disabled veterans owned businesses. Um, but getting to us, um, you know, this is something, some of the work that we did with the Harkin Institute um, on the supplier, uh, supplier summit that we did with you. And one of the things that came out about it is um, connecting, right? Social capital, how do, how, how do people get to Victor? Well, you know, getting to me is certainly one thing, but we're, we're thinking about other ways that uh, people with disabilities can get to us. Um, educating our supplier diversity, making sure that we're reaching out to disabled organizations, uh, making sure that we let those disabled organizations know what they need to do to get to us. One thing that matters to uh, Walmart as a whole is we want a certification. We want an outside certification 
Um, Disability Inn offers that certification, not only in the United States, but around the world. So if you're someone uh, ha can wants to sell at Walmart, that's great. And, and let, me pr let me say this, we don't want to only sell products for and by people with disabilities. If a person's selling tables um, and they're disabled, we want to know who you are. If you're selling cameras, we want to know who you are. Can you scale up? So we, you know, we want to make sure that happens as well. Um, but it, 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 we, we are actively looking um, for that. That's number one. We're trying to build networks, um, let people know, and reach out to organizations we know, like the Harkin Institute, like Disability Inn, um, here at the Zero Project to be saying, hey, we're looking for disabled-owned businesses. Um, and then it, knowing that we're there because people don't know we are, and, or there's been a barrier to it because no one's really done it before um, as aggressively as we plan to do it. I think they certainly maybe know that you're there, but how, how, to, how to get to Walmart, right? Um, where becoming known as, oh, I can be a partner with Walmart and being able to sell my product to scale up on, you know, how does one, if I'm a small business, even just thinking of my sister who has a coffee shop, she's a fairly small business, but how, do, how does one scale up to get to... Well, that's Walmart the level. well. That's the hard part, right? Yeah. Um, and that's where we are working to, again, getting into the community, letting them know what's available. Like some of the things that are available, if you do uh, get into Walmart um, as a supplier, um, as a diverse supplier, is that we can give you early payments, uh, access to early payments. We can give you access to capital, um, and then there's uh, networking events, and and I, and I think that's where we're really going to start people are going to start to get to know us right is those networking events um and they can and again getting out to the community um it, hopefully it happens you know once we get out to some of the big things it happens a little bit more organically but we need to be aggressive in that um and certainly um we're going to be promoting more things on social media and these so the accessibility center of excellence which i'm yeah. i'm part of the belonging team and in the belonging team is the accessibility center of excellence we're about two years into this venture um and it all started because a bunch of associates were like there isn't enough disability representation and as we start to build this out more um and getting to people we're going to do aggressiveness um and and letting organizations know. I, I, that's, some, that's the start of it. And I think companies don't have to be the size of Walmart to diversify their supply chain. So those of us joining who are online or in our audience, how, do, how might they get started to do similar work? How, how might they start that process within their company of diversifying their supply chain? Uh, number one is disability representation, right? Y yeah. You got to have people with disabilities um, running things. And, and, you know, if we're not seen, we're not heard. And if we're not heard, we're not seen. And we need people with disabilities to be everywhere and anywhere. Um, it was our associate resource group, our associates that were starting to push the issues of when we're disability representation and then leaning hard into certain things. In, at Walmart, we've had a, a bunch of wins lately um, on driving disability throughout the enterprise and getting leaders. We set up a, a leadership council. Um, that's, that's one way, right? Getting people that inside your business that are committed to people with disabilities. And our leadership council meets often. Um, where they meet quarterly, and then we just go through what's happening, and then we leverage them it, with inside the business to be able to help us get to the people that w we need. So um, if we're doing employment for persons with disabilities, we, we, we're, we're working with our people team. Um, if we're looking to add different things for the user experience in our store, we're leveraging our leadership council to get to, um, to store experience. Um, and marketing uh, to make sure there's representation across that we're leaning on them. So that is certainly people with disabilities, getting leadership councils together, being relentless in your pursuit for accessibility and not taking no for an answer. Excellent. So it's important to have disability representation from every level of your organization. Um, so if you don't have disability representation in your C-suite, you're missing out missing out and and the return on investment works so he, here's a great example um, about pushing dis, uh, 
disability. We we the we did a back to school initiative last year, and we started something called sensory friendly hours. Uh, we learned from um, Chile was um, um, Ch um, Walmart Chile was. Um, doing sensory friendly hours and we realized that that was somewhat of a success in our back to school we wanted to see if we can do that so every Saturday we set up uh, sensory friendly hours which was great it was from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. on a Saturday and it worked um, and the feedback we got from our customers were like why is this only one day and then we heard back from our associates were turning around and saying this is the first time that somebody, that Walmart did something for me. And let, let's, let's take that in for a second. It was like, yeah. this is a person with a disability working out of that store that needed an accommodation that probably never asked for it, but we just provided it organically. Yeah. Like, that changes the script, right? Mm -hmm. and so we realized these things were happening. So we listened to our customer, we listened to our associate, and every day in every store across the United States of America, we have sensory friendly hours. And what does that sensory friendly hours mean? We lower the lights, we shut off the TV wall, and we ensure um, that the music is shut off. And we're gonna expand on that on our next iteration of sensory friendly hours 2.0. More to come on that. Ooh. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, I, I can't tell you much. Yeah, yeah. I can't tell okay. you much. Okay, <laughs> so more to come. Um, but but, uh, but yeah. what happened there was leadership just got, saw it. And then leadership, it affected leadership in a way that they had family members that needed sensory friendly hours and how important that was. And, and I can't talk about, like once leadership gets a hold of something, how that just moves things up. But you gotta find what that sweet spot is. And so far we've been able to, to find some wins and, we got, and on top of that we got some press. Um, customers are um, expecting more and we wanna be, make that shopping experience and a person that comes into Walmart regardless if you're a customer or an associate, feel like you belong there. Excellent. So talk to us a little bit about, so in partnership with Walmart, the institute we hosted, a Disability Driven Innovation Summit, bringing together the private sector, small business owners. Um, talk to us a little bit about what are some of the recommendations? What do we learn about that culmination um, and how we can do it again? Well, you, I, I think the, the great part about working with Harkin and being at that summit is the white paper you produced on that, you know, and it really talked about a bunch of areas where we can capitalize on things, creating space for, for an opportunity for disability driven innovation. So at Walmart, we have something called Open Call. It's in the United States of America. You're able to sign up for Open Call. And if you have some type of innovation that you're um, interested in coming and you could, you could come and, pr and promote, uh, uh, display it, um, and also pitch it to us. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. So pitch it to us, and then you have an opportunity to get um, to create that opportunity space, right? Um, so that's one way that we're thinking about it, w fostering social capital. I've always talked about social capital for people with disabilities, um, and then really driving that into the space um, uh, of uh, supplier diversity, um, scaling up with us, right? We need to create those networks and, and, and build those networks for people with disabilities. Um, and, and in getting out, like we were talking earlier, through the community, through me, people connecting with me, to be able to get them to our supplier diversity team, to be able to talk to them about how they're gonna scale up and the things that they can offer. So we're not quite there yet. Um, I'm, a business, I'm a disabled owned business. How do we get to scale up? That's not my job. Right, that's our supplier diversity job to be able to do. So upskilling them, making sure that they have and building those networks are important. Um, creating a more inclusive supply chain. Um, that's some of the stuff that we're looking at now and the li no, no limits and how we roll. Um, and then permanently transforming the cycle of innovation. I wanna stop there for a little bit. When we think about innovation, uh, specifically in the disability space, a lot of people are moving to tech or how do we, how to redesign the wheelchair, how do we redesign the white cane, and all those things are relevant, yeah. right? What I wanna talk about is how do we bring innovation? Um, M's Coffee is a great example. Yeah, so in M's Coffee Shop in Independence, Iowa, which is a pretty small rural town, that it wasn't about the tech, for example, but M, when she left the workshop, there, there wasn't a wage, 
competing with a job description would have been hard for M. Um, but not working is also not an option for M. And so M and her team, meaning the people who love her, came around her to support her. And the greatest thing about M's is M doesn't like coffee. Um, we oftentimes think that innovation and business, small businesses or businesses that are owned are started out of this passion for something. M's passion is people, um, and preferably in the morning, because she's at her best in the morning. So it was looking at, you know, what did M need? What did she want to be able to, um, she wanted to be able to work full time, but it was also what could the town of Independence support? And so the innovation there is that M fit a need for her community, but also has been setting the expectation that no matter what a standardized or an IQ test says on paper, or that you don't have to go to business school to be a successful business owner because she's now operating 14 years of successful coffee shop operation. There's coffee shops that have opened up next door and she is still thriving. And that's an innovative way that she um, contributes to the fabric of her community as and well. And there's lots of companies that are out there that can sell with us that can be yeah. able to drive um, that innovation uh, there as well. And and you know, I think it's important for people with dis for us as as Walmart, and uh, and I think for a lot of disability groups, is that this conference here mm -hmm. is a lot of people with disabilities talking about this. I'm learning gr lots of things across it, but we need to start pivoting to places where we're not um, to talk about that innovation in business and how uh, in 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 a business community where disability is not being mentioned, to be able to bring that to to raise those voices up. Um, and be able to drive that because innovation is not just products, it's business. Yeah. I, it, you reminded me of when we were, when we had the summit and that scaling doesn't always have to be a, a large scale. So for example, Pop and Joe, who was part of the summit panel, shared this story that he started selling popcorn in a Walmart parking lot. And so even I think just that's that that start of supporting small businesses to even start out of the parking lot of Walmart and now he is in multiple states shipping popcorn all over the country but it started in your parking lot and, but and 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 that's ways that we can support right in our stores online um and uh, um and, and and any other way that we can get yeah, and across all the, the entire stores right and and you got something, you got a product, is it hyper-local, right? We talk, I talked mm -hmm. a little bit about hyper-local communities, right? Um, we can do that. Excellent. So as we, we start wrapping up a little bit, what, what do you want people to leave with today? Um, the entrepreneurs out there that may want to be, that are thinking about, okay, well, once I go to that website, then what? Or for other companies out there that might now be thinking about, you know, building more diverse pipelines. What do you want people to know and walk away with today? That big business needs to have disability representation. Um, and we need to be able to bring innovation to the businesses and show them that we're, that we're around and that we want to dig into disabled owned businesses and make sure that they are part of our supplier diversity. Uh, I want them to know that. And, and getting to us, you know, start on our website, get to me on LinkedIn, um, connect with me. Let's figure out a way to get you connected to our supplier diversity. And, um, you know, let, let's get um, more disabled owned businesses so then we could scale up, right? Well, let's, let's tell some stories, right? Um, I mean, there's, there's money to be made, both um, not only for us in retail, but those disabled owned businesses to be the entrepreneurs. And that's some of the conversations that we had today. It was like, disability entrepreneurs that um, the Harkin Institute started up today. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing this stage with me today and being my co-host. And uh, thank you to everyone who joined us this afternoon. And this wraps up, I believe, the day at the Zero Project. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>